The Bookstore Mage Following the unfortunate news of his grandfather's passing, Lucian is forced to go back to his old hometown. As the sole living relative, he gets to inherit his old pop's bookstore, a place where he had spent most of his childhood. There, however, he finds an ancient book that ends up shaking his view on the world and raising the curtain over a side he never knew existed, one filled with magic, mythical creatures, and all sorts of dangers. Wait a minute. Are you telling me Grandpa was a wizard? Follow Lucian as he slowly unveils the mysteries of this hidden world, meets new people, saves princesses, befriends dragons, and uncovers the ancient secrets of his bloodline. This is the story of the bookstore mage. This story is set in a modern-day setting. It's not Earth, but a parallel world similar to ours with different countries and all of that. There will be some world-hopping elements down the line. There will be some elements of army building. There will be pets. There will not be any harem. I'm not confident enough to write a realistic one without compromising the relationships. There will be a realistic development of both the MC's powers and his relationships. This will seem like a slow start, but it will hopefully pick up the pace while still being enjoyable. I'm not writing the chapters now. This is an old draft I had for a long time. So the updates will be consistent. Genres are action, adventure, fantasy, mystery, slice of life, tags are, alternate world, gate to another world, magic, wizards, and world hopping. Chapter 1. The Book. The lonely figure of a young man walking through the dark empty streets could be seen. His steps were hurried as he pulled his coat to cover his neck. The chill of the winter day penetrates deep under his skin. After a few quick turns, he comes to a stop in front of a small two-story building. I still can't believe it, he muttered under his breath before he took a step forward. His hand moved to his pockets as he rummaged for the keys before he made his way forward. The bells chimed as he stepped inside the old dark bookstore. The nostalgic smell of books engulfed him, bringing him a sense of solace. The young man's hand subconsciously traced the wall to his right where he found the light switch. A second later, light found its way inside the small bookstore, illuminating the various shelves filled with all sorts of books. Two tall shelves greeted him, one to his right, another to his left, both almost reaching the ceiling. The ground was littered with all sorts of books, some stacked on top of each other, others simply blocking the way. Trying to be extra careful, the young man walked slowly, his right hand touching the various books with a sad expression on his face. At the end of the hallway was the counter, where an old PC rested. Next to it was a picture frame facing downwards, along with a stack of papers spread across the desk. His grief-stricken expression deepened as he grabbed the picture. A young boy with a wide grin on his face greeted him, shaking his head, a sad smile made its way to his face as he mumbled, so you did keep it after all. It has been close to three years since the last time he's been here. Three years since he last saw his grandpa. He knew that his granddad's condition was not the best, but he always managed to convince himself that he would visit soon, that he would take a break and head back to see him. Work had preoccupied his mind, and he ended up pushing it back every time, finding all sorts of excuses not to come. His grandfather was a stubborn man, he never said anything, not told anyone until it was too late. Now all he had left was this rundown building. Struggling to keep the tears at bay, the young man's eyes fell on a certain letter resting at the edge of the desk. His grandfather's familiar handwriting prompted him to grab it almost instantly. To Lucian, if you are reading this, then I am afraid I'm no longer there. It's a shame since this would mean I was unable to teach you. Forgive this old man, I hesitated for far too long and now I ran out of time. I have left you a present in your favorite section. The choice is yours, love grandpa. A frown quickly made its way across Lucian's face. The content of the letter was not what he expected. He stood there motionless for a while, trying to understand what this means. Unable to teach? Teach me what? He muttered to himself before continuing, my favorite section. Saying that Lucian turned towards the left shelf, his eyes scanning it with curiosity. His favorite section had always been fantasy. 
His granddad didn't quite like it, but he still kept a small section at the bottom of the left shelf dedicated to him. Familiar titles greeted him until he came across a strange book, one he had never seen before. What's this? Almost as if by instinct, Lucian pulled the book. A large, complicated magic circle was on its hard brown cover. Its surface was smooth and cold to the touch, giving him a strange feeling. The book was thick, almost twice the size of any he had ever seen. He struggled to move it towards the desk and put it down with a loud thump. A new story? He wondered, yet for some reason, his heart began to throb in excitement. Almost as if he was possessed, Lucian opened the first page. Magic is how the divine come to our rescue, how the devils and monsters reach in and cause harm with their temptations. Be aware, be good, and be very careful what you wish for. There is always a fee. The bold words stunned Lucian for a second before a chuckle escaped his mouth. A novel? Still, the writing style is quite weird. At the bottom of the page was a somewhat familiar name. Oliver Wood. Is this book written by someone in our family? Wondered Lucian, but I don't think I know anyone called Oliver. Glancing at the ancient book, a wild thought ran through his mind. An ancestor? Shaking his head, he turned over the next page. Countless complicated patterns and symbols, weird runes unlike any he had ever seen before, alongside a few messy notes. Simply looking at everything caused his eyes to spin. What the hell is this? He frowned in confusion. Turning over another page, symbols more complicated and complex greeted him, causing his frown to deepen. Was this joke from his old pops? This didn't seem like any sort of novel he had ever read before. If anything, it looked like a creepy old witchcraft book. Still, Lucian kept turning the pages, patiently trying to find something he could understand. After a while, his eyes lit up as he came across what seemed like relatively simple instructions for a spell. Before he tried, hesitation flashed through his eyes as he glanced at the ancient book. What am I even doing? With a self-deprecating laugh, Lucian was about to close the book when he reluctantly paused. I mean one try. It can't hurt. Besides, no one is here to witness my embarrassment. With his mind full of determination, Lucian carefully follows the instructions. He quickly dusted the ground, removed his thick coat, and laid it on the ground, he then removed his cap, causing his messy medium-length dark hair to cascade down on his face before he sat down cross-legged. Closing his eyes, he tried to empty his mind from all stray thoughts, something that surprisingly came easy to him. Breath in, breath out, breath in, breath out. He continued with this set of breathing exercises for a couple of minutes until his mind was as still as a lake. He then recited the incantation. Ackle. Timest adu aman. Akal, timest adu aman. Akal, timest adu aman. Akal, timest adu aman. By the time he finished his chant, a strange, unfamiliar power engulfed him. Panicking, Lucian hurriedly opened his eyes only to find himself in a foreign plane. He was standing in a large space. In front, he could see countless tall mountains ahead. To his left was a vast sea of flames, and to his right tornadoes danced about in the distance. Behind him was a massive sea. What dash, glancing at his surroundings, Lucian found himself standing on top of a tall white pillar, overlooking everything from above. Chapter 2. Settling Down Scanning his surroundings, surprise, excitement, and confusion flashed through Lucian's eyes. Am I dreaming? He muttered hesitantly. The scenery before him seemed too real for a dream. The roar of the ocean behind, the howl of the tornadoes to his right, the crackle of the sea of flames to his left, and the giant mountain formation in the distance. Everything was too real. After a few seconds of hesitation, Lucian walked forward in an attempt to glance down from the tall platform where he stood. It was then that the world around him suddenly collapsed into countless tiny shards. With a gasp, Lucian suddenly woke up finding himself still seated cross-legged on the dirty bookstore floor. His eyes glanced at his surroundings in confusion. A strange power now swirled inside of his body. The world before him changed as well. It became more colorful. The empty bookstore now looked brighter than ever, with countless colorful light particles all around. 
They floated about like dust specks. The only difference was that some were blue, red, and others were green and gray. If he strained his eyes, Lucian could see the faint outline of other different colors. This is ridiculous. He mumbled in shock. Lucian rubbed his eyes once, twice, and three times just for good measure, yet the floating light particles remained. They aimlessly floated about. It worked. Still not quite able to come to terms with what he was seeing, Lucian remained in disbelief before he turned to glance at the ancient book by his side. Wait a minute. Are you telling me Grandpa was a wizard? He hastily stood up and grabbed the letter, reading it once more. Teach me. So he regrets not being able to teach me magic? The absurdity of the situation was too much, yet the results spoke for themselves. The colored light particles were still there, and Lucian doubted he was hallucinating. After a few minutes of silent contemplation, Lucian found himself unable to hold back the wave of excitement in his chest. Magic, real magic. It was not the stuff from a movie or a novel. No, it was real magic. Taking a few deep breaths, Lucian resisted the urge to read through the ancient book again. It was already too late, and although his mind was willing, his body was too tired from the long trip. He cautiously grabbed the book and made his way behind the counter where a closed door was situated. Turning the handle, Lucian was not surprised to find it open. He stepped inside and closed the door behind him. An old wooden staircase that led to the second floor was in front of him. Standing there, the wave of emotions and nostalgic memories overtook him for a second before he shook his head as struggled to take the book upstairs. The second floor was not big, it only had one master bedroom, a tiny living room that opened up to the kitchen and a toilet. Too tired to check on anything, Lucian walked towards the closed bedroom. Opening the door, the smell of his grandfather still lingered around bringing out a smile to his face. The room was clean and tidy. His granddad was always obsessed with cleanness. He hated when things were out of order. So it was not much of a surprise that his bedroom was as clean and tidy as it came. Lucian removed his shoes and left them outside of the bedroom, and then walked and laid the book on one side of the queen-sized bed. Lucian quickly slipped out of his clothes, only leaving his underwear, and forced himself to fold them before putting them on top of the small desk in the corner. He moved the curtains and glanced at the empty dark street below for a few seconds before he quickly jumped on the bed. TSK, I still have to go bring my luggage tomorrow. He muttered in annoyance before slipping under the blankets. The ancient book remained by his side as his eyes grew as heavy as lid. The dream world came shortly after. Waking up in the morning, a yawn escaped from Lucian's mouth. He rubbed his eyes and stayed motionless for a few minutes, trying to motivate himself to get out of bed. After an internal struggle that lasted longer than it should have, he finally stood up. His eyes subconsciously glanced at the thick magic book by his side as a smile stretched across his face. It was not a dream. The colorful light particles were still there, and so was the book. Grabbing his phone, Lucian scanned it for a few minutes checking for messages and emails and finding none. Of course, what was I expecting? He smiled sadly with a shake of his head before making his way to the bathroom, where he washed his face, brushed his teeth, and took a quick shower. Lucky that hot water is still working, he muttered as he walked back to the bedroom. Opening the closet, Lucian rummaged through the clothes searching for something to wear. He and his granddad were about the same build. Since his grandfather liked to work out until his final days, his figure was rather fit for an old man. The only problem was that most of his clothes were suits and formal wear. Reluctant to hop back in his dirty clothes, Lucian carefully picked a black suit with dark blue pants. Staring at his reflection in the mirror, he smiled and nodded approvingly. His grandfather would have been proud, he told himself. Turning around, Lucian grabbed the magic book and strolled downstairs. He settled it on top of the counter and moved to raise the curtains of the window by the door. The sky was gray with the sun hidden behind the clouds. The street looked as empty as always, with few people walking past. Still, Lucian didn't mind. He quite enjoyed this weather, not to mention that he still had no plans for officially opening the bookstore back to business. After gazing through the window for a while, 
Lucian moved back behind the counter, pulled the chair closer, and sat down in anticipation as he opened the magic book again. His excitement overwhelmed his need for breakfast, so he decided to have a late brunch. Glancing at his phone, the screen read 9.30 a.m. An hour, I'll head out in an hour, grab some food, and then bring my clothes in from the hotel. It seemed reasonable considering he had to check out at noon. The hotel wasn't too far, he could just walk there, hence why he still had some time to spare. For a while, the sound of pages turning was the only thing that could be heard throughout the old bookstore. Lucian's eyes were shining as he came across another relatively simple spell called Tadasa. According to the book, this was a spell that healed minor injuries. He only needed to follow certain hand gestures and recite an incantation while gently guiding the mysterious power that was flowing through his body to the injury. Lucian continued reading through the page and then memorized the hand gestures until he was satisfied. It was then that the loud growl of his stomach pulled him back to reality. He lazily reached out for his phone, 10.45 a.m., he raised his brow in surprise at how fast time flew. Closing the book, Lucian carefully placed it under the counter, grabbed his keys and coat, and then made his way to the door. He threw the bookstore one final glance before stepping outside, locking the door behind him. A sudden breeze of wind caused him to tighten his coat around his neck. Lucian raised his head and paused. The outside world was more beautiful than he remembered. The colorful light particles did not interfere with his vision, quite the opposite, they added a charm to everything. He quickly found himself enjoying his new perspective and wondered just how much more mysteries and wondrous things he had yet to uncover. Chapter 3 The Stranger Five minutes into his walk, Lucian was already regretting the fact that he went out without his cap. The cold breeze made his ears throb in pain, causing him to hasten his footsteps. With his hands in his pockets, Lucian cut through the alleys and then found himself walking along the main street. His mind was reminiscing the past. Three years was not a long time, the small town was still the same as he remembered it. The only difference was that he was now alone. Everything had happened too fast, he had barely arrived yesterday and was forced to bury his grandfather, and had to visit the lawyer for the will reading and sign some papers. The whole day was too hectic, he only managed to visit the bookstore when it was already too late. Lucian booked the hotel just in case he was unable to stay the night over at his old pop's place, yet it seemed like his worries were unwarranted. His granddad had left everything spotless. A sigh escaped his mouth as he found himself thinking about the future. The past three years were spent working and gathering money to help out his granddad. Ironically, he was unable to see him because of the same reason. Now that he inherited the bookstore, part of him felt like leaving everything behind and moving back to his old hometown and taking over the business. This feeling was amplified by the fact that his granddad had left him what looked like an old magical book. Lucian was reluctant to go back to the city, not until he got to the bottom of everything. For starters, he doubted he was the only mage out there, that is if he could be considered one with his meager amount of knowledge. Second of all, his granddad never mentioned anything about his parents and Lucian grew out of that phase where he constantly asked about them. Now, however, with this whole magic thingy, the situation seemed to be far more complicated than he initially expected. With such thoughts occupying his mind, Lucian quickly found himself standing in front of the hotel. He wasted no time and hurriedly went inside. A sigh of relief left his mouth as he escaped the bitter cold winds of January. Lucian nodded at the receptionist, who in turn gave him a polite smile. He then made his way to the elevator when suddenly a tan tall man dressed in a thick leather jacket walked out and bumped into him. Ah, uh, sorry. He apologized. No worries. Lucian thought nothing of it and was about to walk inside the elevator when the tall man's hand stopped him. Lucian glanced at the hand on his shoulder and then back at the man's face in apprehension. Yes? Is there a problem? He asked with a frown. The man had a buzz cut and a clean-shaven face. His dark green eyes looked confused as he stared at Lucian for a couple of seconds before hastily retracting his hand. Ah, uh, please forgive me. I must have confused you with someone else. The man apologized once more. I'm Ryan. 
He held his hand to Lucian, who stared at it and then back at him with a weird expression on his face before he reluctantly decided to shake it. Pleasure, I'm Lucian. Lucian, Lucian. The man mumbled under his breath a few times as if he was trying to memorize the name before flashing Lucian a wide smile. Ah, uh, please don't let me hold you any longer. He said, motioning for Lucian to go. Looking at the strange man, Lucian gave an awkward smile and tapped on the fourth floor. The elevator door closed slowly while the man remained there staring at him. It was not until the elevator began to ascend that Lucian released a breath he did not know he was holding. What a creepy dude, he muttered. Back on the first floor, Ryan remained motionless as he watched the elevator stop on the fourth floor. A strange light seemed to flash through his eyes before he turned to walk away. Lucian, Lucian. Interesting, did I see it wrong? He quietly left the hotel with no one noticing his presence. Once outside, he made his way towards a dark alley where his figure seemed to suddenly disappear. Gathering his luggage was not a problem. Lucian didn't even have time to unpack, hence why everything went rather smoothly. He checked out, called for a cab, and headed back to the bookstore. Breakfast had to wait until he brought the luggage back. One look at his two thick bags and then at the cold weather outside was all it took for him to decide on a cab. After he reached the bookstore, Lucian struggled to push his bags behind the counter and checked on the old magic book. Seeing that it was still in its place, Lucian gave a satisfied nod. He'll worry about dragging the bags upstairs when he comes back as that was a problem for future him. With food on his mind, he quickly left the bookstore and made sure he locked the door behind him. On the other side of the street, hidden in a dark alley was a tall tan man. Ryan watched Lucian leave the bookstore with a frown on his face. The young man seemed normal. Perhaps he was wrong after all? No. He quickly shook his head. His eyes had never failed him before. There was something strange about that man. Lucian. I don't think he belongs to any of the families. And he doesn't have the aura of the council, nor that of a rogue. An elemental, maybe? But what would an elemental be doing here? He wondered. Ryan's eyes glanced in the direction where Lucian disappeared before he turned his attention toward the small bookstore. The wooden sign standing on top of the door was no longer legible. After a few minutes of hesitation, he slowly made his way to the front door. He glanced about, making sure that no one was around before his body simply disappeared. When he reappeared, he was already inside the bookstore. His body froze the second he was in. He was unable to sense any magic wards or traps before he leaped. That was the main reason he was so brazen. Yet the second he was inside the bookstore, a heavy feeling pressed on his heart. Ryan felt like he was suffocating by simply standing there. He still did not sense any magical interference or traps, but the aura was enough to almost down him to his knees. He hastily reined in his mana, causing his dark green eyes to dim. It was only then that the aura receded, but not completely. It remained there, almost as if warning him not to try anything stupid. He quickly lowered his head and leaped back. His body reappeared in the dark alley he was standing in across the street. The second he appeared, his knees buckled and he fell to the ground gasping for air. What the hell was that? He shivered before glancing at the old bookstore. Ryan felt like someone or something was watching him, and he did not know what. Should I tell the council? He gulped before disappearing once again. Chapter 4 The Council Walking down the street, Lucian glanced at his phone. It was already noon, and he was still indecisive about where to eat. After walking along the main street for a few more minutes, he finally made up his mind and entered a small coffee shop that offered late breakfast. Lucian chose the seat by the window and ordered. He stared absentmindedly at the people walking outside and at the colorful light particles for a few seconds when he suddenly spotted something strange. In a dark alley a distance across the street, the colorful light particles seemed to gather around a particular area, forming the vague silhouette of a person. Shivers ran down his spine as it looked like that figure was staring at him. He didn't know if it was just a feeling, but he could sense its gaze on him. Just as he was thinking about what to do, the waitress came with his order, distracting him for a split second. When Lucian looked up again, the mysterious figure was no longer there. 
Still, he was not relieved. If anything, Lucien was more anxious than ever. Who was that figure? Why was it looking at him? The way those particles gathered around it indicated that it was not a simple person. Another mage, perhaps? He wondered, but why was it watching me? Could it be they already figured out that I started learning magic? Do they have a way to tell mages and non-mages apart? Countless thoughts swirled through his mind, but the loud rumbling of his stomach forced him to push them all to the back of his head as he began to dig in. Walking back home, Lucian's eyes constantly darted left and right, fearful that someone was watching him. He kept a watchful gaze on the colorful particles. His gut feeling told him that they were his saving grace. It was because of them that he spotted the mysterious figure in the first place. Inside a tall building, a tall man with tan skin and dark green eyes was walking in hurried steps, following behind an equally tall, beautiful, dark-skinned girl. Her ebony hair was cut short reaching her shoulders. She wore a formal dress that complemented her figure perfectly, giving her the impression of a cold, mature business lady. Contrary to her composed appearance, her light brown eyes, however, looked extremely anxious as she passed by the hallways before she came to a stop in front of a large wooden door. It was then that Ryan finally spoke. Uh, the old man will pay me for the information, right, Nia? Clicking her tongue, Nia glared at him before replying in disdain. Don't compare the council to the rest of you rogues. We don't go back on our words. And it's Mr. Chairman for you. Raising his hands in the air, Ryan gave her a wide grin and replied, Right, right, Mr. Chairman, my bad. Ignoring him, Nia proceeded to knock on the door with a respectful expression on her face. A few seconds later, the large wooden door slowly opened by itself. The inside of the room was surprisingly small. It was made in an old Victorian style. A large bookcase took over the entire left wall, on the right were countless portraits of different people, men, and women. Right in front of them was a lone desk with a white-haired, old man behind it. His beard was trimmed short, with his messy long hair reaching past his shoulders. Seeing Nia and Ryan enter, he removed the round-rimmed glasses from his eyes and settled them on the desk. His ocean eyes scanned the duo before he spoke. Nia, what seems to be the problem? Nia first bowed respectfully. Seeing at how Ryan was still standing straight, she glared at him before speaking. Mr. Chairman, Ryan just came to us with the information of a new rogue that seemingly appeared out of nowhere. The chairman nodded and waited for her to continue. I want to check on this person. She hesitated for a second before speaking. The problem is, I was spotted. Hearing that, a frown quickly made its way to the chairman's face. Were you hiding in the elemental plane? Yes. Nodding, the chairman massaged his temples for a few seconds before he asked. Nothing happened when he saw you? No, he didn't seem to have any intentions of attacking. Good, send me all the information you have gathered so far on this person. He paused for a second before continuing, and don't send anyone else to monitor him directly. Keep your distance, and just make sure he doesn't cause any trouble. Nodding, Nia turned for the door, but Ryan remained there. She glared at him and motioned for him to leave. Ryan, go with Nia. You'll get your payment. Only then did he smile and turn to leave. A long sigh escaped the chairman's mouth. The sudden appearance of a potentially dangerous rogue was not something pleasant, especially if he was one of those that liked to dabble in the dark arts. His strength was still a mystery, but the fact that he was able to easily spot Nia from the elemental plane already placed him high on the danger list. Seconds later, a file suddenly appeared on his desk. The chairman wore his glasses and read the first lines. Code name, the bookstore mage. Real name, Lucian Wood. The current owner of the old bookstore on 27th Street. He used to live there with his grandfather, Thomas Wood, before moving out six years ago. Age, 25. Race, unknown. Unable to find further information on the grandfather. Unable to find further information on the parents. Unable to trace Lucian from the time before he came back to the city. Recons noted a strange aura looming inside the bookstore, preventing them from using magic. Proceed with caution. Threat rank? Another sigh escaped his mouth before he removed his glasses and massaged his forehead. Wood, 
that's not part of any of the main families, and if Ryan isn't familiar with him, then that means he isn't part of any old rogue group. No to mention how he completely overlooked his grandfather's presence all this time. Lucian Wood, just who are you? Where did you crawl out from? Meanwhile, back in the bookstore, Lucian was happily reading his magic book. He first revised the healing spell called Tadasa and made sure he completely memorized the hand gestures. After finishing that, he searched the pages for another spell to learn. The countless patterns were slowly making sense. His current best guess was that they showcased the way his mana should flow inside his body. The countless notes, however, were a completely different matter. They were written in a way worse than that of a doctor's handwriting. Still, Lucian was satisfied with his current progress. After a few hours, he finally managed to find another spell that looked promising. It was called Immer, and from what he understood, it seemed like some sort of telekinesis. The hand gestures for this one were non-existent, which excited him the most. The problem was the somewhat complicated patterns. Making up his mind, Lucian vowed to succeed in casting it at least once before going out for lunch. Chapter 5, New Spell and the Call Sweat trickled down Lucian's brow as he attempted to manipulate the mana inside his body. He had severely underestimated the complexity of the spell. A quick glance at his phone showed that it was already 3 p.m. and he did not have lunch yet. The telekinesis spell Immer was harder than he first anticipated. Compared to the minor healing one, Tadasa, the flow of the mana was more difficult to control and extremely hard to follow. This raised a few questions in his mind. Was it related to the absence of hand gestures? What role did they play in the casting process? Lucian had yet to find an answer to his questions, so for now he decided to just stick to the instructions and repeat the technique for as long as it took. After about 30 minutes of him sitting cross-legged trying to direct the flow inside his body, Lucian got bored. He stood up and stretched his legs and arms before grabbing his phone to check for places to eat. The promise he had made to himself of not eating until he had successfully cast the spell at least once was completely forgotten. After another 15 minutes of aimlessly scrolling through the internet, he finally settled for a pizza store. After ordering the food, Lucian turned his gaze toward the book with mixed expressions on his face. After his initial excitement had died down, he quickly realized just how much work it would take for him before he could cast any cool magic spells. Letting out a sigh, Lucian inwardly grumbled under his breath. Tisk, why can't things just be easy? Just read the spell once, and boom, a new spell is acquired. How am I supposed to decipher this? Shaking his head, Lucian forced himself to sit back down and follow the movements of the mana inside his body before he attempted to control the flow. After another fifteen minutes, a sudden knock interrupted his meditation. Lucian hastily jumped and made his way to the door. A teenager with blonde, dirty blonde hair was standing there with his pizza. After paying for it, he cautiously scanned his surroundings for any suspicious people and any strange signs of the colorful light particles. Spotting none, Lucian closed the door and made his way to the counter where he proceeded to eat his lunch all the while forcing himself to read through the book, trying to memorize the flow of mana. 8 p.m. A bloodshot Lucian was staring at an empty cup situated on top of the desk. Veins appeared on his neck and forehead as he tried to move the cup. After what seemed like an eternity, the cup finally moved and was raised a few centimeters above the desk. Lucian was ecstatic and lost focus, causing the cup to fall and roll off the desk to the ground. He stood there with a blank expression staring at the broken glass on the floor before a curse escaped his mouth. F asterisk CK. Grumbling, Lucian grabbed a broom and cleaned the mess before he took the book upstairs. He slipped out of his formal clothes and wore comfortable pajamas before ordering pasta for dinner. Meanwhile, he decided to continue his training, preferably this time on something that wouldn't break. He started with a coin. Lucian committed the shape of the coin into memory. He formed a strong mental image and slowly guided the mana inside his body. Aiming at the coin with his hand was not necessary, but he felt like it helped so he kept it. Soon, the strange force seeped out of his body. He saw the almost transparent particles gather around the coin as it began to gently levitate. Excitement filled Lucian's heart, yet he forced himself to remain focused. 
He willed the coin to fly into his opened hand, and it, slowly but surely. After that, Lucian made it fly around the room, slowly picking up speed. It was then that the loud knocking on the door downstairs interrupted his concentration, sending the coin tumbling under the bed. Lucian didn't mind. If anything, he was quite satisfied with the results of his training. Lucian then enjoyed his dinner while reading the book. He revised the hand gestures and mana flow for the healing spell before he cast Immer on his pasta, making it fly from his plate and into his mouth. This brought a wide smile to his face as he finally began to feel like a real magician. By the time the clock hit 11 p.m., Lucian was already somewhat proficient in his new telekinesis spell. He could barely make the heavy magic book float slowly. Still, progress was progress and Lucian was happy about it. After his success, he made his way to the toilet, opening the doors with the use of magic, the smile never quite leaving his face before he called it a night. The next morning, Lucian was awakened by a phone call. Glancing at the screen, he found himself not recognizing the number. Rubbing his eyes, he contemplated whether or not he should answer, before ultimately forcing himself to. Hello? His morning voice came off deep. Yes, hello, am I speaking to Mr. Lucian Wood, please? A sweet girl's voice replied. Yes, you are. And who am I speaking to? He asked, still a bit dizzy from waking up. My name is Layla, I'm calling you on the behalf of the Hermits Group. We would like to extend our invitation to you, for a chance to join us as a fellow rogue. Uh-huh. A frown made its way to Lucian's face as he closed his eyes, the sleepiness threatening to overtake him. A scam call? He wondered. I just want to confirm if you would be interested in coming over for a visit. We understand that it's difficult to make such a decision, but we assure you that you would not be disappointed. I'll be sending you the details of the meeting place over text. I hope that's okay with you. Uh-huh. Sure. He replied, not caring much. Part of him wanted to just hang up, but he was too lazy to move. He placed the phone on his face and let the lady keep talking. Her voice was strangely soothing, causing him to let out a yawn. Great. Then on the behalf of the Hermits Group, I sincerely hope we will see you soon, Mr. Lucian. Thank you for your time. You too. Bye. He answered, before throwing the phone next to him. The ding sound indicated a new message had arrived, but Lucian was too sleepy to care. A couple of hours later, Lucian lazily stretched to the side and picked up his phone. It was 9 a.m., he saw the notification of a new text message and suddenly remembered the strange phone call he had earlier this morning. Shrugging his shoulders, Lucian opened the text and read for a few seconds before his expression fell. He hastily shot out of bed in shock and cried out, What the heck? Chapter 6. Getting Ready Lucian paced around the bedroom in his underwear. His eyes would occasionally glance at the phone settled on the desk. The call he had this morning. It seemed like it was not a scam call after all. Lucian hesitated for a few seconds before he grabbed his phone and opened the text once again. Dear Mr. Lucian, on behalf of the Hermits Group, we would like to extend our sincere invitation to you and hope you can honor us with your presence today at 8 p.m., Avenue Lancaster, Building 101, where we will be holding our meeting to discuss the current studies at applications of magical spells. Sincerely, the Hermits. The text was short, but it was enough to chase all the sleepiness away. The main glaring point of the text was the fact that these Hermits were mages, and it appears that they already know he is one. Could it be them that were following me yesterday? He muttered while biting his nail. The whole situation had gotten him on edge. Lucian cautiously stepped toward the window and moved the curtains before he peeked into the street below. The light particles showed no strange presence, and he did not see any people lurking about. This, however, did not ease his mind as Lucian began to overthink. Are they spying on me with some weird magical spell? His eyes darted around the room, but the flow of particles remained the same. Yesterday, Lucian linked the floating particles with mana. The reason for that was that when he used magic, they moved. When he cast Immer, the telekinesis spell, they followed his will. So his best guess was that the particles were what was called mana, and each color represented an element. Lucian wasn't sure, and he knew that he could be wrong. Still, it felt right. Now that he saw no disturbance in the mana flow, Lucian forced himself to calm down. 
Panicking isn't going to solve nor change anything. Think, they seemed very respectful when addressing me. That could mean a few things. Either mages are just genuinely nice people. I doubt it. They know I am a mage, but don't know the full extent of my capability. A reasonable guess could explain why they took the respectful approach. Maybe this whole meeting and sharing our ideas on spells and magic is their way of testing me. He muttered while biting his nails. Or this could be a trap? Thinking about that, Lucian quickly shook his head. They already know my name, they have my number, and they probably know where I live. Why go through all of this just to set up a trap instead of magically teleporting here? Scratching his head, Lucian forced himself into the toilet. He washed his face, brushed his teeth, and hopped in the shower. Now that I think about it, why the hell are mages using calls and texts to communicate? It doesn't sound very magical, nor secure at that matter. With such thoughts running through his mind, Lucian made his way out of the shower, got dressed, and grabbed his cap and keys before leaving. Glancing at the magic book on the desk, Lucian decided to be safe and cast Immer to move it under the bed. Satisfied, he closed the door behind him with the same spell and made his way downstairs. Casting magical spells was still as exciting as the first time. Just seeing all the doors open by themselves was enough to put a wide grin on his face. Locking the bookstore behind him, Lucian turned to leave when he was stopped by a blonde high school girl. She was dressed in casual jeans and an oversized yellow hoodie with a thick black jacket. What are you doing here? She asked. Lucian raised his brow at the girl before answering, I live here. What are you doing here? You live here? What about the old man? The girl's light brown eyes looked concerned as she asked. That was my grandfather. He sadly passed away leaving this place to me. Lucian answered with a sad smile. The girl's eyes widened before she lowered her head. I'm sorry for your loss. I used to come and hang around here, but the bookstore wasn't open for a week, so I was afraid something might have happened. Thank you, and I'm happy to hear that Grandpa still had regulars that came so often. The girl nodded before answering. He was a great man with a lot of stories. Smiling, Lucian replied that he was. I didn't quite catch your name. Ah, uh, sorry, of course, I'm Anna. She offered her hand. Lucian shook it and introduced himself. Pleasure to meet you, Anna, I'm Lucian. So, not to rush you or anything. I'm just wondering if you have any plans for opening the bookstore again? It was my little haven, you know. Ah, uh, I understand what you mean. I've spent most of my childhood there, getting lost in the books. Yes, and all those small, it's very cozy. Added Anna with a smile. Oh, damn, I'm going to be late. It was a pleasure meeting you, Lucian, but I'm afraid AI have to go. I hope you'll take over the bookstore. I don't want my cozy place to close down for good. And once again, I'm sorry about your grandpa. It's okay, and I'm definitely thinking about it. Saying that, Lucian waved her goodbye and then made his way toward the coffee shop he went to yesterday for breakfast. It was cheap and tasty, so why look elsewhere? The morning passed uneventfully, with Lucian constantly checking his phone for messages. He then spent the afternoon locked at home studying the magic book while practicing Immer. Lucian also didn't forget to revise the healing spell's mana flow and hand gestures. Lunch was ordered from outside again, and before he knew it, the clock was already pointing at 7 p.m. The nerves came back as he thought of the meeting with the strange hermits. He just hoped nothing bad was going to happen. Pulling the address on his phone, Lucian frowned at the thought of the cab fare as the place was a distance away. Well, nothing ventured, nothing gained, I guess. Trying to think positive, Lucian wore his granddad's favorite black suit with an equally black shirt for good luck. He studied his reflection in the mirror for a few seconds, fixing his messy hair before he nodded in satisfaction. Using Immer, he once again sent the magic book under the bed and grabbed his coat and keys and left with feelings of excitement and nervousness. Chapter 7. The Test? The cab came to a stop on a desolate street. The buildings were sparse and quite old. The taxi driver, a middle-aged brown man, looked at Lucian with concern in his eyes before asking, Are you sure you are going to be okay, kid? Lucian chuckled at being called a child, but he didn't mind. He flashed the taxi driver a bright smile and answered, Yes, don't worry about it. I'm just visiting some old acquaintances. 
he said before handing him the money. Nodding, the taxi driver gave him back the change and replied, If you say so, but I wouldn't linger around here for too long. Leaving those words behind, the man drove off in a hurry. Well, that was reassuring, mumbled Lucian under his breath. His eyes darted about scanning the area when he spotted the building he was looking for. The cab had dropped him off right in front of it. Besides, it was not that hard to find considering a large amount of colorful mana was swirling around it. I guess that confirms it. Slightly relieved, Lucian walked there unhurriedly. Trying his best not to look, intimidated or bothered, Lucian placed his hands in his pockets, his grip over his phone tightened as the distance between him and the building shortened. It was an old four-story house, one built before the war. Few like these remained throughout the city. The ones situated in better neighborhoods were renovated and sold or rented for ridiculous prices. These, however, were ignored. Lucian came to a stop a few steps away from the building. The cluster of mana formed a wall of sorts that surrounded the entire building. He tried not to look concerned as he studied the flow of mana in curiosity. At first, he merely wished to stall for time to see if they would open the door, but he quickly found himself fascinated with the movement of mana. It was strangely familiar. The mana circled the building following a set pattern. It then stopped in a few key areas that seemed to power the whole spell, formation. Lucian wasn't quite sure what the purpose of this magic was, but if he had to guess, it would be something like a barrier. The seconds trickled by with him standing a couple of feet away from the door. His expression was deadpan as he studied the flow of mana, but his heart was full of anxiety. The longer the time passed, the more awkward he felt. He even found himself entertaining the idea of just leaving. No, that would be a sign of weakness. I don't know if this is another test or not. Lucian inwardly noted, forcing himself to stay rooted in place. His eyes kept glancing at the flow of mana and the key areas in the spell when a wild thought ran through his mind. If this was truly a test, then what was he supposed to do to pass it? Remove the barrier? That was his first guess. But how was he supposed to do that? Lucian had a faint idea that he already knew the answer to that question. The flow of mana in the barrier spell was somewhat similar to others he had glanced over in the magic book. The main point of similarity was in the key points where mana gathered around. If he compared it with the spells from the book, that would mean that should the key points of the spell be disturbed, then it would be much easier to interfere with it. Lucian's eyes shined with bright determination. There was no point in just standing there while doing nothing. Besides, it was them that kept the spell around the building. No one even came out to greet him. Yep, it's not my fault. He told himself. On the fourth floor, inside the building, a group of people, men, and women watched Lucian in curiosity and puzzlement as he stood there, unmoving. What is he doing? asked a black-haired lady with a sweet voice. Her dark brown eyes looked at Lucian with interest. I don't know, Layla. He seems a little bit weird, don't you think? Asked a blue-eyed, blonde-haired young man. Layla didn't answer. Instead, she turned her attention to the beautiful, mature, middle-aged lady standing in front of all of them. The leader of the hermits and the organizer of this meeting. My lady, what do you think? Asked Layla. All eyes then turned to the light-haired brunette. Her hazel eyes were sharp as she studied Lucian's figure before she finally spoke. It seems like he is studying the barrier. Her voice was charming as she replied. A few frowns overtook the invitees as they began to whisper amongst themselves. How arrogant. What can he even see anything? The barrier is a spell Lady Estria made herself using old magic. Perhaps he's just fascinated by it. That would make more sense, but the lady said. Their hushed whispering came to an abrupt stop as Estria raised her hand. Her hazel eyes shone brightly for a second as she sensed the mana emitting from the young man's body. He used no incantation, nor hand gestures. Everyone followed her gaze and stared at Lucian in confusion and shock. Although no one could see the mana strands, they could feel them. Impossible, muttered the blonde young man. He's only standing there with his hands in his pockets. How is that even possible? Maybe he is using a medium to help him cast? Do you sense any medium? Quiet, ordered Estria. 
Her eyes were glued to Lucian's figure as she felt his mana strands move towards the barrier. Since she was connected to it, she felt it instantly. Her eyes widened as she sensed his mana moving towards the four major points. The second his mana reached them, the entire barrier began to collapse, causing her to open her mouth slightly in shock. The rest of the people present were no better. Layla kept glancing at Estria and then back at Lucian with bright eyes. With a silent explosion, the barrier collapsed into countless tiny shards. Everyone watched baffled as a small smug smile made its way to Lucian's face. He nodded in satisfaction before he made his way to the door and knocked. The knocking sound resounded throughout the building, causing the hearts of everyone present to thump loudly in their chests. No one moved for a while as the knocking continued. After a few seconds, Estria was the one to react first. She hastily made her way downstairs and took a deep breath before she opened the door. Chapter 8 The Meeting Lucian waited patiently by the door. His heart was beating loudly in his chest with a mixture of excitement and nervousness. This was going to be his first time meeting with actual wizards and to discuss magic and spells nonetheless. He just hoped not to say anything stupid and embarrass himself. Moments later, the closed door slowly creaked open. A beautiful mature brunette with sharp hazel eyes and a curvy figure greeted him. She wore a red dress that further complemented her perfect figure, almost causing his heart to skip a beat. Lucian always had a weakness for older mature ladies. There was just something about them. Still, he tried not to show it on his face. Before she could speak, however, he had already stepped toward her with a gentle smile on his face and offered his hand. Hello, my name is Lucian, and I've been invited. I hope I'm not in the wrong place, he asked with a smile. The beautiful lady shook his head with a small smile before she replied. It's a pleasure to meet you, Mr. Lucian. My name is Estria, and I'm the leader of the Hermits, as well as the host of tonight's gathering. We are honored by your presence. Please, call me Lucian. He answered, his smile not quite leaving his face. Estria nodded gently and replied, Great, then please call me Estria as well. She then motioned for him to enter the house. Lucian did not stand on the ceremony. Once inside, he almost lost his composure when he saw what looked like twelve or so people staring at him with various expressions in their eyes. Lucian was not usually the shy type, but it was not easy to be stared at by so many people at the same time. Luckily, Estria came to his rescue. She clapped her hands loudly, gathering everyone's attention before she spoke. Now that Mr. Lucian has joined us, let us all head upstairs and began the meeting. No one disagreed with her. The twelve people quickly left leaving her and Lucian behind. She motioned at the stairs with a respectful expression on her face, please. Lucian gave her a mischievous smile before replying. Thank you, but did I not say to just call me Lucian? Estria raised her brows at his reminder before she answered with a smile. I'll remember that. Lucian. Lucian's smile widened at that before he followed the group upstairs. The house was surprisingly luxurious on the inside. The floors were covered in red carpets, and the walls were decorated with expensive paintings and artworks. A large fancy chandelier was placed right above the entrance. Lucian leisurely climbed to the fourth floor while making idle chatter with Estria. He occasionally asked about some paintings that he found interesting, while also trying to fish for information from the mature lady. Sadly, he failed to gain any significant information. Once he reached the fourth floor, the first thing that greeted him was a large round table that took almost the entirety of the floor. An even more extravagant chandelier decorated the place, casting a soft glow on the open room. There were no doors nor walls. The entire fourth floor was an open hall. The twelve people were already situated in their respective places, while some seats remained vacant. Estria guided him to his place, which luckily for him was next to hers. Once seated, Estria spoke. As everyone knows, this is Mr. She paused for a second and looked at Lucian, who had a gentle smile on his face. Estria then coughed lightly and corrected herself. This is Lucian. He will be joining us for our discussion today. I'm sure a test to check his knowledge level is unnecessary as you have all seen him disperse my barrier spell. 
Hearing that, Lucien secretly nodded. So it was a test after all. Good thing I learned Immer, otherwise I doubt I would have been able to pass that. He inwardly released a sigh of relief. Estria continued, any objections? As expected, no one said a thing. The group then proceeded with their meeting. They first introduced themselves to Lucien the newcomer, and he greeted them back one by one, though their names quickly left his memory. The only ones he remembered were Estria, for reasons, and Layla since he recognized her voice as the one that called him earlier today. After their quick round of introductions, the meeting officially began. A short old man with balding hair was the first one to speak. I've recently been working on an earth-based spell. Its purpose is to hasten the growth of magical plants while retaining their quality. I used the council's earth blessing spell as the foundation and then tried to further improve it. I've had some minor successes, but I'm stuck with the flow of mana. Does anyone have any similar spells for me to use as inspiration? Preferably unseen ones or from the old era. A few people answered. Some gave their opinions on the matter, others offered certain spells for a price. Lucian watched everything unfold with a hint of a smile. It was not exactly what he expected, but he liked it. Everyone took turns talking, no one interrupted, and they were all very respectful. The one thing he noted, however, and found strange was that every magical spell they talked about or mentioned required an incantation or hand gesture. This confused him because Immer for one didn't need any of those, and Lucian was sure that there were a lot of similar spells in the book that didn't utilize any either. When the turn came to Estria, she turned to glance at Lucian with a curious flash in her eyes. I'd like to ask you, Lucian, the question I believe has been on the minds of everyone present. Just what was that spell you used when you broke down the barrier? How come you didn't use any incantations or hand gestures? You can choose not to answer, of course as expected, so they did find it strange. How should I handle this? If I'm not wrong, then it's not normal that I can see the mana particles. Everyone else just feels it or sense it. I'm not sure how that works, but they're certainly not seeing it. Looking at Estria, Lucian flashed her a mysterious smile and replied vaguely. That's not a hard question to answer. He said, causing her eyes to shine. The spell is simple telekinesis. I used it to manipulate the flow of the mana outside of my body and inside the barrier. Once there, it was simply a matter of pointing it towards the key parts of the formation. A frown quickly made its way to Estria's beautiful face. The way Lucian put it, it did indeed seem quite simple, but the reality was that it was anything but that. First of all, what sort of telekinesis spell allowed one to manipulate one's mana with such accuracy? Secondly, how did he manage to invade the barrier with his mana in the first place? Third of all, how did he know where the key parts of the formation were situated in the first place? Raising her head, Estria found Lucian staring back at her with a mysterious smile on his face. His eyes looked deep as if they held all the secrets of the world. He is extremely dangerous. She thought to herself and mentally noted to treat him with more respect. Chapter 9. Estria Lucian's response didn't seem to satisfy all those present, but no one dared show any dissatisfaction. The meeting continued smoothly with Lucian learning more about the hidden world and its factions. From what he was able to gather, the hermits were part of the rogues. The rogues were what the official organization called the unaffiliated mages. Basically, people that stumbled upon magic one way or another, in a situation somewhat similar to him, or mages that were exiled from the council, or one of the main families. Some mages that preferred not to be tied down to any organization were also referred to as rogues. Then there was the council, the headquarters of the magic world. They had branches all over the continent. They were somewhat of a law enforcement group that nurtured promising mages and maintained the order and secrecy of the hidden world. And then were the main families, or legacies, as some people like to call them. These were the clans and families that had a history dating back hundreds of years. They preferred to call themselves the nobles, and according to the few conversations he heard from the hermits, it was safe to say that they hated the rogues and disdained the council. For main families withstood the testimony of the years and strived. The Gold Hearts, the Yorks, the Sunkist, and the Dragonborn. Each family had a large number of descendants and magical inheritance, that allowed them to survive when others did not. 
Their power was unquestionable, and although they still fell behind the council a bit, they were not to be underestimated. Lucian committed their names to memory while inwardly criticizing their naming sense. Another pleasant surprise was the fact that other races existed. When he heard the hermit group's members talking about the sighting of a rogue vampire, he almost couldn't believe his ears. The council classified the non-humans into different categories. The ones that looked humanoid were intelligent and could be reasoned with. The elves, the druids, the fairies, the vampires, and the werewolves. Some of them worked with the council, others were recruited by the four families. Then some formed their own clans, with power that almost rivaled that of the four families. Lucian still didn't know what those clans were called. The non-humanoid races, that were chaotic or evil, were placed in another category. The flow of the conversation didn't lean much toward the subject, so Lucian was still unfamiliar with them. Then there were the dragons. They held a category of their own and were above the council and families. Luckily, however, they lived in seclusion, and nobody knew where they were at. A member of today's gathering mentioned some rumors about the alleged location of an ancient dragon, but the people present simply scoffed at the rumor and called it ridiculous. After a while, Lucian had the chance to ask a question. Everyone turned toward him with shining eyes as they waited for him to speak. Their gazes made him feel a little bit uncomfortable, but he tried not to show it on his face. Lucian tried to think of something to ask, but quickly found his mind turning blank. He was still not as experienced as some of the people here, but for some reason, they seemed to think of him otherwise. It was hard not to notice when everyone stared at him with eyes full of respect and fear. Even Estria, the hostess of today's meeting, was careful with her words around him. Lucian had no intention of correcting their misunderstanding, he just hoped not to embarrass himself in front of everyone, hence why when they asked if he had a question, he simply shook his head with a smile. Besides, it was not like he was lying. The ancient book seemed to hold everything he needs. When he compared the two spells he learned with those that the hermits were discussing, he was surprised to find that his were much stronger and far more complex. Estria watched as the young man shook his head. She half expected it, after all, with the power he showcased, the spells and magical formations they were discussing were probably like child's play in front of him. It was a lie to say that she was not disappointed, but she was quite excited to have a high-ranking mage attend the meeting. Perhaps she could ask him for help with that ancient spell. He did seem interested in her after all. Estria did not find it strange at all and was quite flattered. A lot of men pursued her, but few had succeeded. She was more interested in the study of magic, after all. Looks like it will be embarrassing to ask to join the hermits. Still, it's good to maintain a good relationship with a high rank mage. She inwardly noted and decisively decided to drop the speech she had prepared earlier. Estria doubted it would work anyways. When the clock reached 9.45, the group began to engage in idle chatter, discussing the local news and politics. Lucian listened in deep interest as he absorbed as much information as possible. By the time it reached ten, the meeting drew to an end. Estria the hostess stood up and thanked everyone for coming before reminding them that the next meeting will be held a week from now, the same day, same time, same place. Everyone then stood up and began to leave, not before they said their goodbyes to both Lucian and Estria. Layla was even bold enough to ask him if it was okay for her to reach out to him, under the pretext of discussing magic and experimenting with spells together. Lucian didn't mind. The girl was pretty and very respectful. Besides, it didn't hurt to have more friends. By the time everyone took their leave, only he and Estria were left behind. He smiled at her and was about to leave as well when she stopped him. Would like to have a cup of tea before leaving? She asked with a mysterious smile. Lucian, who was a bit tired, was about to refuse, but decided otherwise. It has nothing to do with the fact that she's my type. Definitely, nothing to do with it. He repeated in his mind. She guided him to the third floor and into a luxuriously decorated modern room. A queen-sized bed was placed by the large windows and a chic sofa with a classy table in front of it was situated on the other side of the room. Please, don't be shy. She smiled sweetly and guided him to the sofa. Lucian complied and sat down. Now if you'll give me a minute to bring the tea. 
Any preferences? Uh, not really. I'll just take what you will be having. He answered with a smile. Estria nodded and left the room, leaving him behind. Once he was sure that he was alone, Lucian carefully scanned the room for any signs of danger. He followed the flow of mana to see if there was anything strange, yet he found nothing. With his mind finally at ease, Lucian leaned back on the comfortable sofa. Chapter 10. A Lazy Day Estria didn't take long before she came back with the tea. She placed his cup on the table and settled next to him. Lucian thanked her with a smile and took a small sip, his eyes instantly widened in pleasant surprise. The hot mint tea tasted extremely sweet and refreshing. The sweetness might not be for everyone, but he liked it a lot. It's a very nice tea, he commented. I'm happy you liked it. It's the national drink of a certain North Pamelian country. You should visit there if you ever get the chance to. I'd love to, said Lucian before he asked. So, Estria, tell me a little bit more about yourself. How did a beautiful lady like you end up as the leader of the hermits? She smiled sweetly at his compliment and answered. Well, my father founded the group. I took over after he passed away. I see, and is that what you've always wanted to do? Or was there something else? Estria chuckled before she replied, You are the first to ever ask me that, you know? Haha, <laughs> I find that hard to believe. Well, most people find me difficult to approach. Ah, uh, so I take it you don't invite just anyone over for tea? He grinned. Only the ones I like. She answered with a mysterious smile. The mood between the duo was lighthearted as they engaged in idle chatter with the occasional flirty remarks. Estria tried to pray some information from him, but Lucian masterfully evaded the subject without giving out too many details. The hours passed as the duo's laughter resounded throughout the empty bedroom. When the clock hit eleven, Lucian excused himself. He was already quite tired. Estria was the same. She spoke with the same charming smile. You can use my teleportation array. It should be more convenient. Hearing the word teleportation, Lucian's eye gleamed with curiosity. He knew teleportation existed, so the fact that he could try it already made his heart thump in excitement. Lucian nodded and followed Estria to the second floor. A hallway with four closed doors greeted him. She guided him to the first door. The normal-looking wooden door opened revealing a stone-walled room with countless complicated magical ruins on both the floor and walls. The room had no windows and was quite dark. The only source of light was some strange-looking glowing stones in the four corners of the room, bathing it in a gentle blue glint. Estria motioned for him to stand on top of the magic circle in the middle of the floor. Once Lucian was situated on top, Estria gave him a light peck on the cheek, causing him to smile, before he could say anything the mana particles gathered around the circle, and the world suddenly turned hazy. By the time Lucian blinked, he was no longer standing in the stone room and was instead in front of his bookstore. His eyes widened in fascination. Lucian had thought that he would feel dizzy or something, but the teleportation was smooth, it gave him no inconvenience whatsoever. Lucian then moved his hand to touch his cheek where Estria had kissed him, his lips curved upwards in satisfaction. Humming a happy tune, Lucian unlocked the door and made his way upstairs. He used Immer to pull the book from under his bed and placed it next to him. He then slipped out of his clothes folded and put them back in the closet before he wore his pajamas. Still humming his happy tune, Lucian went to the toilet and brushed his teeth, took care of his business, and went to bed. His stomach growled in protest, and it was only then that he recalled he had no dinner. Lazy to order anything since he already brushed his teeth and was under the blankets, Lucian closed his eyes and tried to forget his hunger. Sleep overtook him mere minutes after that. The next day, Lucian woke up rather late at almost eleven. Still, he was in a quite good mood. He got ready, changed his clothes, and made a quick trip to the neighborhood supermarket to buy some groceries. Once back home, he fixed himself some breakfast along with a cup of coffee to start his day. By then, it was already noon. With nothing planned for the day, Lucian started by cleaning the bookstore and dusting the shelves and counter. After that, he wiped the windows from the inside and then the outside. It was then that an acquaintance dropped by. Hey, Lucian. Oh, morning, Anna. He smiled. 
Morning? It's already noon, grinned the blonde girl. I had a rather busy night yesterday, so I was a bit tired. Sounds fun. I just finished my uni classes for the day and decided to drop by. I hope you don't mind. I know you said you still didn't open yet. I just missed the place. Not at all. I was just doing some cleaning. Please, you already know the place, he answered while gesturing for her to step inside. Anna smiled sweetly and nodded before she walked to the bookstore. She took a deep breath before she began to gently touch the books on the left shelf. Lucian moved behind the counter and grabbed a chair and placed it down for her. Oh, thank you, you didn't have to. I usually just sat on the floor. No, it's the least I can do. Saying that Lucian decided not to bother the girl and left her to continue with his cleaning. By the time the hour reached 1 p.m., he was already sweating and quite hungry. He walked behind the counter, passing by Anna who was immersed in a fantasy novel. She didn't seem to notice his presence. Lucian then grabbed his phone and ordered lunch. After the cleaning work, he was too lazy to cook. Anna's phone suddenly rang, making him turn to glance at her. The blonde college student stared at her phone in annoyance before she released a sigh. Standing up, she looked at Lucian and spoke. I'm afraid I have to go. I'll see you soon, Lucian. I hope that you won't be closed by then. Lucian simply nodded with a smile and added, See you, Anna. With her gone, Lucian locked the front door and glanced at his phone to check the ETA for his food. Seeing that he still had some time left, he quickly hopped into the shower. By the time he finished, his delivery was also almost there. Lucian grabbed the book with him and went downstairs. Let's check and see if I can find a new spell today. I'd love a teleportation one. That'd be great. He mumbled. Chapter 11. Moon. Lucian spent the day practicing Immer and revising the hand gestures and mana flow needed for Tadasa. He came across another spell that he thought might come in handy. It was a simple one that created a flame above his hand. The fun part about it, however, was that he was required to add a hand gesture to make it work. The book didn't specify how the hand gesture should be and left that for Lucian to create one. This gave him a bit of freedom to mess about with it. He learned the flow that the mana should take, but did not proceed in trying the spell. Something told him it was not too smart to play with fire indoors, not to mention in such proximity to so many books. I need to find a place to test my spells, otherwise it's going to be a problem down the line. He muttered to himself. Lucian then grabbed his phone and checked on the time. It was already 4 p.m. He used Immer to send the book back under his bed and changed his clothes into something more comfortable before leaving the bookstore. The day was a pleasant one considering it was still the middle of January. The sun shone brightly above, and the sky was a clear blue color. Although it was not warm per se, it was still much better than the past couple of days. Lucian was a bit hungry, so he decided to visit a restaurant he used to frequent with his grandfather back in the day. He didn't have to walk far before he arrived. Thankfully, the diner was still open. He walked inside with conflicted emotions. This was the first time he came without his grandpa, and it made him feel sad. The old waitress recognized him and came to greet him. She gave him her condolences for the passing of his grandfather, and even the chef came out of the back to say hello while telling him to stay strong. His lunch ended up being on the house. Although Lucian insisted on paying, they refused and called it a service. With his mood slightly elevated, Lucian decided to change his usual way back home and instead passed by an empty park. The sound of birds chirping and the smell of trees gave off a serene and pleasant feeling. Lucian's eyes wandered around the park as he gazed at the cluster of green light particles. He guessed the number of certain particles depended on the location. For example, the blue-colored ones would be more prominent. Here in the park, however, the presence of the green ones was more obvious. Lucian found it a bit surprising how deserted the park seemed to be. He seemed like the only person present, not that he minded. Lucian continued his walk when suddenly, a faint whimper made him pause. It sounded like the cry of an injured animal. Lucian glanced about and followed the sound behind a tree off the road. There, he found a small cat with snow-white fur. The cat's bright green eyes gazed back at Lucian with a pitiful expression. It had hurt both of its front limbs and was unable to move. Lucian approached it carefully. Hey, little buddy, 
How did this happen? He called out in a low voice to not startle it. The cat meowed pitifully but was unable to move. Lucian gently patted its head and back trying to calm it down a little bit. A girl, he mumbled. The injury on the little cat's front limbs looked man-made. It was as if someone had deliberately used a sharp object to hurt the poor cat. Seeing that made Lucian feel sick and angry. The poor cat continued to whimper in pain and pushed its head against his hand. That was when the Tadasa spell came to Lucian's mind. It was supposed to be a healing spell for minor injuries. The damage on the cat's front limbs, however, was anything but minor. Lucian could only pray that it was enough to at least ease the cat's suffering. He closed his eyes and recalled how the flow the mana was supposed to move. The light particles began to gather around him as Lucian followed through with the hand gestures. His mana slowly began I condense on top of the Snow White cat's injuries. The cat seemed to sense something as it suddenly went quiet and stayed very still. Lucian opened his eyes and watched in surprise as the wounds closed with a speed visible to the naked eye. After a few seconds, the cat's paws were as good as new. Lucian was shocked at how efficient Tadasa was. The kitty snuggled closer to his hands and meowed in excitement. It then began to rub its head on his legs. Lucian didn't know if it was a side effect of using Tadasa on an animal, but he could feel a bond between appearing between him and the kitty. He couldn't understand what it was saying, but Lucian was able to sense its intention. It was as if the cat was communicating with him through its feelings. After playing with it for a while, Lucian waved goodbye and turned to leave. To his surprise, however, the cat followed behind. It refused to leave and continued next to him till he reached the bookstore. Lucian gazed at it with complicated feelings, and the cat stared back with pitiful eyes. Ah, uh, damn it. Do you want to come in? He asked, and the cat's eyes seemed to shine as it meowed and ran towards the open door. A smile made its way to Lucian's face as he shook his head with a defeated expression. I mean the bookstore was a little lonely, just by myself. He mumbled to himself. Closing the door behind him, Lucian removed his coat and started at the cat that already settled itself comfortably on top of the counter. He approached it and gently rubbed its head causing it to purr in pleasure. But we have to give you a name. Hearing that, the cat's ears perked as it raised its head to stare at him with an expectant gaze. Lucian was momentarily surprised at how a cat's expression could be so human-like. Well, you'll have to excuse me though, I'm not very good with names. Lucian said while rubbing his chin deep in thought. How about Moon? The cat meowed happily and jumped on top of his shoulder. Oh, you like that? Lucian laughed and patted it. Okay then, from now on your Moon. Come on, let's go upstairs. I'll make you something to eat. Chapter 12 The Family The rest of the day was spent with Lucian trying to decipher a new spell. So far, he had learned Tadasa, a minor healing spell that worked surprisingly well. Then there was Immer, a psychic spell that allowed him to move everything with his mind. Lucian had yet to test the limits of Immer, but he had a good feeling about it. Lastly, there was the first mysterious spell that transported him to that strange space. He didn't try it again after that time. Perhaps I should visit again? He mumbled. Moon jumped on top of the desk and laid down on top of the book. That brought a smile to Lucian's face. He gently scratched her head before grabbing his phone to check on the time. 11 p.m. Guess it's about time we call it a night, right? Moon meowed an affirmation. Livin then changed his clothes, brushed his teeth, and quickly jumped on the bed. Moon joined him and settled on top of the book next to him. Turning off the lights, Lucian closed his eyes with a happy sentiment. The next morning, Lucian woke up relaxed for the first time in a long time. Moon was already up and had moved to stand on top of the desk. When she heard Lucian stir in bed, Moon then jumped out and sat next to the door. Morning, sunshine. How did you sleep? He asked with a yawn before making his way to the bathroom for a quick shower. Breakfast today was homemade. He quickly fixed something for Moon as well before he moved to unlock the doors of the bookstore and turn the sign from closed to open. There was no point in leaving it closed when he was sitting here doing nothing, so why not open it? Satisfied, Lucian moved to sit behind the counter and began to study the magic book. The new spell he was trying to decipher was an offensive one that summoned a fireball. A classic spell that every mage should know. 
simple but extremely powerful depending on the amount of mana invested in it. The hand gestures were not too complicated, but the flow of mana inside his body was a little bit tricky, so Lucian was having a hard time memorizing it. It didn't help that he had nowhere to practice. The hours quickly passed by without a single customer. The small bookstore had seen better days. By the time the clock reached noon, Lucian turned the sign to closed and went upstairs to make himself some food. He tried to cook using Immer, while he studied the flow of mana for the new spell, Tajajite at the same time. This way he trained his concentration and bettered his control, while constantly improving his mastery over Immer. After a quick lunch, Lucian came back downstairs and reopened the bookstore. Coincidentally, it was at this time that Anna dropped by once again. She greeted him with a smile and made her way to her favorite section, mystery novels. Moon, on the other hand, remained upstairs lazing on top of his bed, in another unknown location on the other side of town. A young haughty-looking man with flaming red hair and equally red eyes was pacing around inside an extravagant bedroom. His brows were creased as he read the text sent to his phone. Code name, the bookstore mage. Real name, Lucian Wood. The current owner of the old bookstore on 27th Street. He used to live there with his grandfather, Thomas Wood, before moving out six years ago. Age, 25. Race, unknown. Unable to find further information on the grandfather. Unable to find further information on the parents. Unable to trace Lucian from the time before he came back to the city. Recons noted a strange aura looming inside the bookstore, preventing them from using magic. Proceed with caution. Threat rank. Clicking his tongue, the young man threw his phone on the bed and grumbled in annoyance. The council is getting sloppier by the day. What kind of report is this? Could it be that they're withholding information? Ron. Following his call, a middle-aged butler with a well-trimmed mustache came into the room. He gave the young man a deep bow and asked, You called, young master? Did you see the file on that new mage? He asked, to which the butler nodded and answered, Yes, I did, young master. Our man inside managed to get a copy of the file as soon as it came in. Then explain to me, what the hell does this threat rank mean? I'm afraid the council believes that this person might be a dangerous mage. They are still unable to determine his level of power, so it is advised to avoid interacting with him for the time being. Shaking his head, the young man clicked his tongue in annoyance and replied, I don't care about any of that. All I want to know is whether he will be useful to the family or not. The butler seemed to understand his master's wishes. He quickly nodded before answering. What type of approach would like us to take, young master? Rubbing his chin, the young man walked around the room for a few seconds before he raised his head to glance at the butler. Since the council is treating this with caution, then we should do the same. There's no point in antagonizing a high-ranking mage. Send someone to offer him a job, see if he accepts. If he does, then we'll test him with that and see what level he reached. If he doesn't. A dangerous gleam flashed through his eyes. The butler nodded and gave a deep bow before he took his leave. Back in the bookstore, Anna had already left, leaving Lucian behind. He was completely immersed in the new spell. Mana constantly gathered and dispersed around his fingertips as the hint of a spark kept appearing and disappearing. It's not as hard as I expected. The only tricky part is on controlling the size of it. Saying that Lucian carefully snapped his fingers, causing a small flame to appear above his thumb. He smiled in satisfaction, a sense of accomplishment filling him, before he snapped again, causing the flame to disappear. And that's another spell in the bag. He mumbled. A yawn suddenly escaped his lips. Standing up, Lucian stretched his limbs and walked to the window next to the door. The evening sun bathed the street in a golden glow, giving off a pleasant vibe. Standing there while staring at the sky, Lucian found himself hopeful for the future. His heart was finally at ease. Chapter 13 The Nice Butler The next day, early morning, Ron came to a stop in front of the mysterious bookstore. The sky above was gray and gloomy, casting a heavy shadow on his heart. For some reason, the closer he got to the bookstore, the more nervous he found himself getting. Very few people made him feel this way throughout his long life. 
one of them being the head of the family he served, the Gold Hearts. The young master was still immature and too arrogant at times, so the head assigned him to protect and try to guide him. This was the main reason why Ron was the one that came to check on the new mage, to determine his level of danger. The young master was the youngest child of the head, but he was his favorite. Ron didn't approve of the way the head had spoiled him, but he was merely a butler. He had no say in how the head raised his children. Trying to calm his emotions, Ron recalled the council's report. It seemed like there was a strange power interfering with magic surrounding the bookstore. Now that he was feeling it for himself, Ron could tell that this was the abode of a high-ranking mage. He resisted the urge to use magic and stepped into the bookstore. The bells chimed above the door as the interior revealed itself before him. The inside was small, with two shelves on both sides reaching close to the ceiling. At the end of the hallway was a counter with a handsome-looking young man. A snow-white cat was seated next to him, turned to glance at Ron as he walked in with intelligence in its eyes. A summons? That was the first thought that came to Ron's mind. The young man was wearing a black suit and was reading a strange-looking book. He raised his eyes and glanced at Ron with deep, unfathomable eyes. Welcome, he said and then ignored him, turning his attention back to the strange book. Ron found himself strangely fascinated with that book. He felt his consciousness slowly getting drawn into it. His eyes turned glazed as he felt the world turn dim around him. Ron's subconscious screamed danger to him, sending alarm signals throughout his body. Ron felt helpless, but there was nothing he could do. The strange force prevented him from using magic, and the strange dangerous book kept tugging at his soul. Are you okay? Came the young man's voice. It sounded like that of a devil mocking him to Ron. Goosebumps formed on the back of his neck as the hair rose in his arms. He was unable to move. His gaze was still locked on the strange book as if he had glimpsed at something forbidden, something he should have not seen. The young man suddenly stood up causing Ron's heart to skip a beat. He was defenseless. Could it be he already knew we were planning to test him? Is this his warning? With a thud, the young man. No, the devil. Closed the book, pulling Ron back from his dazed state. He felt his soul rush back to his body and suddenly gasped for breath. The devil rushed to his side with an expression full of fake concern. Are you okay? Here, come take a seat. Do you want me to call an ambulance for you? And no, I'm good. I was just out of breath. Ron stuttered in reply. This young man was a monster, a devil. How could they come to test him? The damn council. They should have been clearer on the threat rank. Ron had already forgotten that the question marks on Lucian's file meant danger and was already blaming the council in his heart. He had no thoughts of retaliating against the young man. Not even the head of the Goldhearts family was able to immobilize and subdue him without lifting a finger. Do you want me to grab a cup of water for you? Asked the monster in human skin. Ron hastily shook his head. No, I'm good. Thank you for your concern. He squeezed a smile on his face. Now that he was already here, he should try to at least mend the relationship between the family and this monster. For the first time, small seeds of doubt took root in Ron's heart. He was not sure if even the head could be the monster's opponent. Fear took hold of his heart, causing beads of sweat to trickle down his forehead. The monster went behind the counter and placed his devil book behind it before he brought a chair to Ron, prompting him to sit down. Ron complied and took a few seconds to compose himself before he began to speak. Young master, my name is Ron, and I am the butler of the esteemed Goldhearts family. Lucian's heart skipped a beat when he heard the family's name. It was one of the four main families, the nobles as they liked to call themselves. He did not know why their butler came to his small bookstore, but he maintained his poker face. The fact that he came all the way here meant they already knew he was a mage. Is the magic community in this town so small? How come everyone already seems to know about me? Lucian wondered inwardly before giving a faint smile and replied, It's a pleasure to meet you, Mr. Ron. To what do I owe the pleasure? While inwardly sizing up the old man in front of him, he seemed quite sickly and weak. His face was pale like he was about to pass out at any second. Lucian even feared he might suffer from a sudden heart attack. Please call me Ron. 
The Goal Hearts simply wished to extend our sincere welcome and wish for a possible collaboration in the future, should the chance arise. Lucian nodded while maintaining his polite smile and answered, I'd love to. The pleasure is all mine. His reply seemed to please Ron greatly as his face suddenly lit up with a bright smile. Great. Then as a token of our friendship, I'd like to present you with this small gift. It's nothing much, so I hope Mr. Lucian will accept it. Lucian's eyes lit up as Ron pulled a black ring from his pinky and handed it to him. This is Dash. It's the Goal Hearts famed storage rings. I hope it will come in handy for you, answered Ron in a slight prideful tone. He seemed to value the ring a lot, so Lucian was quite surprised he just handed it to him. His first instinct was to refuse, but it was as if Ron could already read his mind. He hastily replied, It's not much, so I hope Mr. Lucian will give me some face and take it. Saying that the old butler stood up and gave him a deep bow. Now then, I shall take my leave. It was a pleasure to meet you, Mr. Lucian. Huh, dash, Lucian did not have enough time to say anything when the old butler quickly took his leave. What the hell just happened? He mumbled, before turning his gaze to the black ring in his hand. Chapter 14 The Gift With the butler of the Goldhearts family gone, Lucian was left behind with a strange black ring. He fiddled with it for a few seconds, studying its shape while paying close attention to the mysterious runes carved into its surface. But how do I make this thing work? He muttered out loud. Moon, who was seated by his side, meowed in response. What do you think, Moon? He asked with a smile and gently patted her head, making her snuggle closer to his hand. Well, since it's a magical ring, or at least the butler says it is, then would Mana do the trick? Lucian wondered while rubbing his chin, deep in thought. The strange ring had no glowing particles surrounding it, nor did it emit any. This put Lucian's mind a little bit at ease, but he was still confused nonetheless. Why did a family as big and strong as the Gold Hearts approach him? From what he gathered in the last meeting with the hermits, the four families despised the rogue mages. They hardly respected the council. So why was Ron that nice to him? Lucian first thought that maybe it was fake. But who would want to fool him when he just joined the magical circle? And why go through such lengths to do it? Besides, the runes and the small insignia of the sun, carved on its surface, were a little too real for Lucian's liking. He didn't know why, but Lucian had a feeling that they must have misunderstood something. Scratching his head, Lucian places the ring on the counter and grabbed his phone. He hesitated for a second before dialing Estria's number. After a couple of rings, her sweet, charming voice answered. Lucian, and here I thought you'd never call. Her tone was joyful and a little bit flirty. An awkward smile made its way to Lucian's face. He had indeed forgotten about her. He was too immersed in studying the book, and then the butler came, putting her out of his mind. Still, Lucian shamefully lied through his teeth. How could I forget about you, Estria? I was just a bit preoccupied with some matters. I see. She chuckled sweetly. So, how are you doing? Haha, <laughs> I assume you didn't just call me to exchange pleasantries? Ah, uh, well, I called you for two reasons. Oh, pray do tell. First, let me take you out for dinner tomorrow. Mr. Lucian, are you inviting me on a date? She asked in a flirtatious tone. I am indeed inviting you for a date, Ms. Estria. Oh, and what's the second reason for your call? Well, I had an old man that called himself the butler of the Goldhearts family come visit me. Estria turned silent for a few seconds before she answered in a somber tone, surprising Lucian. What did he look like? Middle-aged with a well-trimmed mustache and gray sideburns. Though he did look rather pale when just came into the bookstore. That should be Ron. What did he ask you to do? Ask me to do? Nothing. He was exceedingly nice and even gave me a black ring with what I think is the Goal Hearts insignia and some runes carved onto it. Estria was momentarily stunned and did not know how to reply. After a few seconds of silence, she managed to compose herself. Lucian was after all quite a strong mage. Perhaps the goal hearts have decided on a different type of approach. After all, Ron was known to be quite sly. Usually, when the goal hearts sent someone to visit a rogue, it's either to directly invite them to join the family as servants, or if they are unsure of the mage's capabilities, 
then they would offer them a mission to complete. That way they'd have a general idea of the mage's prowess. If the rogue is a high-ranking mage, then they'd try to entice him to join with family treasures. Similar to your case, it seems like Ron was able to tell that this would not work on you, and they instead came in peace, which is quite shocking if I'm being honest, as the Goalhearts are known for being hard-headed. Estria's explanation momentarily stunned Lucian. He was able to tell it would not work on me. How the hell would it not work on me? I knew something was wrong the second he was being too respectful. Damn it, and what high-ranking mage? I don't even know what the ranks are. Lucian inwardly cried out. Are you still there? Estria asked in concern. Ah, uh, yes, I'm just thinking. Well, it seems like they didn't directly offer you to join the family, which is good. As I said, looks like Ron is aware that your fighting prowess and rank vastly outmatch his own. So, I believe they will be keeping their distance. You don't have to worry too much about it. The new more she talked, the heavier Lucian's felt. His heart tightened in his chest as he thanked her and said his goodbyes. Throwing the phone on the counter, Lucian covered his eyes with his hands and released a long sigh. Moon seemed to sense his anxious mood. She quickly jumped on top of his lap and pushed her head against him affectionately. Lucian subconsciously began stroking her fur, something that seemed to ease his mind by a little bit. What the hell do I do? It seems like everyone is misunderstanding something. I only wanted to learn magic in peace, what high-ranking mages, and what fighting prowess. F asterisk CK, a curse slipped from his lips as he found thinking about the consequences. The goal hearts were not known for being kind, so what would they do when they find out he is in fact quite weak? A shudder ran through his spine. I can't let that happen, he whispered. Although it was their fault for misunderstanding everything, could he count on them being reasonable? Lucian doubted it. The only way he could ensure his safety was by growing stronger. With his mind made, Lucian took a deep breath and grabbed the black ring. Moon jumped from his lap into the counter and watched everything with a curious expression on her face. Wish me luck, he told her before he willed the mana to move towards the ring. After learning a few spells, Lucian's control over the particles increased dramatically. He was now able to make them move with his will, though that was the extent of his abilities so far. He still needed to make them follow a certain pattern to activate certain spells, and for others, he needed to use the appropriate hand gestures. The ring seemed to sense the mana gathering around him, but it did not react. Huh, nothing happened? Lucian paused and studied the ring for any changes, only to find none. Could it be a fake? He mumbled. Scratching his head, Lucian tried again, but to no avail. After a few minutes of silent contemplation, a sudden idea flashed through his mind. Instead of using the mana in the world, he would use the one inside his body. Closing his eyes, Lucian willed a small strand out from the tip of his finger and into the ring when something magical happened. Chapter 15. The Bracelet. Lucian felt a strand of his consciousness get pulled into the ring. The knowledge of what was inside appeared in his head. He felt as if he only needed a tug to pull whatever he wanted from the ring. The feeling was very strange to Lucian, who never experienced anything like that. Pulling himself away from the ring, Lucian glanced at it and then back at Moon who was staring at him with a curious expression on her face. I'm still alive, so I guess that's a win? He chuckled before shaking his head. I need to stop taking so many damn risks. With but a thought, the ring began to glow with a faint tint, not even a second later. A book, a dagger, and a bracelet appeared on the counter. Lucian first grabbed the book with an excited expression. A journey into the past, mythical creatures. Hmm, interesting. He mumbled, scanning the light red cover for a few seconds. His fingers traced its surprisingly sharp edges before he opened the first page. So, it's a study about magical beasts? This could come in handy. Happy with the book, Lucian placed it on the side and grabbed the dark golden dagger with complicated runes and carvings. A small sun was etched into both sides of the handle. The workmanship was extraordinary. Even Lucian, who had no prior knowledge of blades, couldn't help but admire its beauty. But this looks like it's meant to be used as decoration? He wondered out loud. 
Moon, who was sitting by his side, lost interest and jumped off the counter and made her way next to the window by the door, where she lazed about. Turning his attention to the last item, a golden bracelet that looked normal. Lucian was the most excited about this one, as he could see stands of mana seeping into it. A magical item. That was his first thought. He first studied it for a few seconds, before he carefully willed his mana to it, only to be met with resistance from a foreign mana source that nestled inside the bracelet. It pushed back against Lucian in an attempt to stop him from gaining control over the bracelet. A frown made its way to Lucian's face. Faced with the resistance, his fighting spirit ignited as he continued to pour his mana into the bracelet, slowly pushing against the foreign presence. Gradually, the resident mana was pushed back and cleansed, leaving the control of the bracelet to Lucian. On the other side of the city, Ron's car stopped in front of the Goalhearts mansion. He opened the door and stepped out, only to freeze in place. He had felt his connection with the sun bracelet disappear. A bitter expression made its way to his face. He let out a long sigh, shook his head, and began to walk towards the entrance. He knew that Lucian was strong and that he would have no problem wiping out his imprint on the bracelet, but it looks like he had still underestimated him. Ron didn't expect him to be able to do it so fast. With a conflicted gaze, the old butler made his way to the office of the family head. The situation had now escalated above what the young master could handle, not to mention, with his flaring temper, there was a risk he would end up offending the mysterious mage. If that were to happen, then Ron was not sure how he would react. He paid a great price to improve their relationship with Lucian. After walking through the luxurious hallways and making his way to the second floor, Ron came to a stop in front of a black door with a large carving of a gold-winged angel. He knocked and then moved a step back with a respectful expression on his face. The door opened by itself, revealing its interior. It was an impressive office, decorated with cold weapons all over the walls. A single window was situated on the wall in front of Ron, next to which was a dark brown desk. A middle-aged man with fiery red hair and an equally red-trimmed beard was staring at Ron with an inquisitive gaze. H.E. placed the book he was reading back on the desk and asked, Ron, I believe I instructed you to follow my youngest. Why are you here? His tone was neutral, but his gaze was sharp. The old butler lowered his head even further and replied, It's about the mysterious mage in the 27th Street, my lord. Hmm? 27th Street. Scratching his head, the middle-aged man frowned as he tried to remember. The bookstore mage, my lord, Ron added. Ah, uh, yes. I remember hearing something about that. And what does that have to do with me? And why are you here and not with the youngest? It is precisely because of that, that I am here, my lord. It's like this, I went to visit the bookstore today, Dash. Back home, Lucian was fiddling with the golden bracelet with a wide smile on his face. It turned out that this was one of the so-called magical artifacts. Lucian's knowledge was not very high in the subject, but he was sure, nonetheless, that this was a treasure. Equipping the bracelet, the wearer would be able to cast five spells without incantation or hand gestures. He only needed to store the spell within the bracelet beforehand, and then he could activate it whenever he wants. Lucian still did not need the bracelet, M at the moment, but he was sure that it would come in handy in the future. Besides, being able to instantly cast a spell was without a doubt a huge advantage. Happy with his gift. Lucian wore the bracelet on his right hand with a satisfied expression. The smile never quite left his face. He liked its design as well. It looked very stylish. As he was admiring it, Moon jumped to his lap and began to meow. Oh, are you hungry? Let's go. I'll make you something to eat. He said and used Immer to grab his book, alongside the book of mythical creatures and the dagger, before making his way upstairs. My control over Immer is already better than it was before. I can already control this much stuff without a problem. Looks like practice does make perfect. Happy with his progress, Lucian placed everything in his room before he made his way to the kitchen to fix something to eat, for both him and Moon. Chapter 16. The Spell Two weeks have passed since Lucian came back to the bookstore. January left, making way for February. 
The cold weather gradually improved. The chilling winds calmed down. Lucian was seated behind the counter as usual with Moon resting by his side. Anna became a regular. She visited the bookstore whenever she had the chance. The duo slowly grew more comfortable around each other. She was currently resting on the small chair Lucian specifically brought down from upstairs for her. His relationship with Estria remained somewhat the same. She would occasionally call to check on him, and the duo would harmlessly flirt together, yet so far it never got anywhere. The Goal Hearts didn't visit him again after Ron's sudden visit. In the past two weeks, Lucian ended up missing one of the hermit's gatherings and joined one where he learned some interesting pieces of information. The opening of a sudden magical portal. According to what he understood, these portals were usual occurrences. They opened at random times all over the planet. The council was first created to control these, as some of these portals contained monsters that were a threat. It was the council's job to monitor and intervene should they deem the portal dangerous. Some portals were stable and could remain open for years, while others would only appear for a mere instant. According to the hermits, the latest portal was a stable one that opened a short distance from the city. The council had already deemed it no threat to Earth and gave the clearance for the mages to explore it. Some people in the gathering formed a group for exploration and attempted to invite Lucian. He, however, kindly refused. He was not yet confident enough to tackle alternative dimensions. Besides, he had been busy planning for the reopening of the bookstore. Lucian ended up creating an online page for it and did some light marketing in a somewhat vain attempt at gathering traffic. Some visitors stopped by, but few loaned the books, and even fewer ended up buying some. So the problem of restocking his shelves was still out of his mind. Lucian considered ordering some of the newest books to appeal to a new market, yet his budget was a little tight. The money he saved from his last job was still enough to last time for a while, but that did not mean he could recklessly spend it. This meant that Lucian needed a new source of income. Best if it came from the bookstore itself. When it came to magical spells, besides Immer, Tadasa, and Tajajite, the fireball spell, Lucian had ended up learning a couple of useful spells as well. Taffet, a minor spell that summoned a light ball to illuminate his surroundings, he could control its intensity, and was able to make it float and follow him, acting like a flashlight. This one needed no incantation, not hand gestures. Then there was Yuzum, a lightning spell. This one was his latest achievement, enabling him to shoot out a thick bolt of lightning from his fingertips. The spell apparently even had a chance to summon real lighting from the sky if the conditions were appropriate. Yuzum was a little bit more complicated, utilizing a complex chant. Luckily, the hand gesture was one of his creations. Yuzum was currently his strongest spell, and to train it, Lucian had to ask Estria for help. She provided him with an underground training facility built under the hermit's headquarters. When she heard that he was going to be experimenting with some spells, Estria respected his privacy and did not inquire any further. This was something that Lucian liked about her. She respected boundaries. The final spell in Lucian's arsenal was the first one he learned. The mysterious spell that pulled him inside that special place. Ever since that time, Lucian was unable to cast it properly. He had been constantly attempting to, yet to no avail. His mind could never fully concentrate and fall into that meditative state like the first time. Now that he knew magic was real and was excited to unravel its secrets, Lucian could hardly control his passion. This seemed to be a fatal flow as it prevented the spell from being activated. No matter how hard he tried, Lucian always failed. He thought that he was calm enough, yet the reality proved otherwise. This made him wonder, just how did he manage to pull it off the first time? And why was it that this particular spell was so different? These questions plagued him, and Lucian often found himself thinking about them. Anna pulled him out of his train of thought. She suddenly stood up and moved to the counter before placing two thick novels down. I'll be taking these for the week, Lucian, she said with a smile. Lucian glanced at the novels. One a thriller mystery, the second a romance. This slightly surprised him, yet he did not say anything. He smiled and spoke. Already heading for that trip? Yes. I can't wait. I've never been to the Northern Mountains before. I heard it's very pretty this time of the year. 
Lucian nodded and answered while packing her books. Yes, I went there before with my grandpa when I was still young, and it was beautiful. Though you might want to pack some warm clothes, although the weather is pleasant during the day, it can be quite cold during the night. And be careful when you go hiking. I will. I'm just excited. It's my first real trip alone. Her smile was infectious, and Lucian found himself grinning as well. Well, I hope the books will keep you company. Oh, I'm sure they will. She said and signed her name on the paper Lucian presented her. Anyway, I've got to go. I'll see you when I'm back, Lucian. Bye-bye. Lucian sent her off with a smile and placed the money in his newly bought cash register. He then placed the paper that contained the list of books she borrowed in the drawer before he made his way to the door. Lucian turned to check on Moon, who was lazing on the ground next to the counter before he opened the door. The cool breeze calmed his mind. There were not a lot of pedestrians in the streets at this hour. Even Anna had already left by taxi, leaving the street desolate. After checking if there were any potential clients and finding none, Lucian locked the door and pulled down the curtains before making his way upstairs. Moon lazily followed behind him and jumped on top of his bed. You get some rest then. I still want to try that spell, he said before moving to the living room. The light brown carpet was a perfect spot for him to attempt his meditation. Chapter 17 The Unfathomable Attempting his meditation exercises in the living room was a bad decision. The random noises from the kitchen, the sound of the fridge in the middle of the night, and the noises of the occasional car passing by downstairs had never been so loud. It was like the more Lucian attempted to concentrate, the harder it became. Still, he persisted until his legs turned numb, but that familiar feeling of mana inside his body never came. Frustrated, Lucian grabbed his phone and checked the time. It was already close to midnight. He released a sigh and made his way to shower. Bringing a towel with him, Lucian decided to draw a bath. After he made sure the water temperature was perfect, Lucian hopped inside with a smile and released a sigh of satisfaction. Just what I needed. He closed his eyes and leaned his head back. The warm water made him relax. After a few minutes, Lucian subconsciously began to follow the breathing exercises of the first spell. To his surprise, the familiar flow of mana gathered inside his body, close to his heart. Still, almost as if in a trance, Lucian didn't react and continued with the breathing exercises. The mana gathered around him faster than the first time. He did not need to recite the incantation, but was already able to feel the mana follow a strange pattern close to his heart. Lucian tried to trace it, but found it to be too complicated. After a couple more minutes, Lucian began to recite the chant. Akul, timest, adu, aman. Akul, timest, adu, aman. Akul, timest, adu, aman. Akul, timest, adu, aman. By the time he finished, Lucian opened his eyes and was met with a familiar sight. He was once again standing on top of that huge white platform. The mountain range in front, the ocean behind, the sea of flames to his left, and the wind tornadoes to his right. Lucian's lips slowly curved upwards. He came back. His eyes quickly darted around, trying to study all the details he had missed the first time he came here. Raising his head, the sky that greeted him was one filled with stars. The sight captivated him, and Lucian found himself unable to tear his eyes away from it. After a few seconds, he forcefully shook his head and glanced at the platform. It was circular, with some strange magical runes carved into it. Lucian kneeled and tried to study the weird language etched into the platform. A single phrase caught his gaze. Ilid Notchkad, Dilit Ranagal. Lucian frowned. The phrase didn't seem to be an incantation, but more of a statement. He didn't know why, but he felt like he should know what it meant. He repeated the phrase a few times, trying to commit it to memory. The language used was the same one he utilized to cast spells with incantations. I'll have to check and see if I can find any translations when I'm back, Lucian mumbled under his breath before he stood up. The world around him was more corporal this time. It felt more real. Lucian carefully moved to the edge of the platform and peeked downwards. A gasp suddenly escaped his lips. The drop was huge, and the ground was nowhere to be seen. Instead, a huge dark abyss greeted him. 
Lucian did not know why, but the moment he glanced at that darkness below, his heart began to thump loudly in his chest. Shivers ran down his spine, and he found himself unable to move. Lucian felt as if a terrifying gaze locked on him and was studying him. He was unable to move, his heart was beating wildly in his chest. Lucian did not know what he was looking at, but one thing was for sure, it was not something he was meant to see. He didn't want to stay here anymore. The longer he stared at the abyss, the more Lucian felt like he was losing a part of himself. As if sensing his intention, the entire world began to collapse. It was then that Lucian caught a glimpse of an incomprehensible, humongous figure lurking in the depths of the abyss. Lucian felt as if lightning struck his brain before the world disappeared completely. Back in the real world, Lucian awakened with a gasp. He shot out of the water, gasping for air. The cold feeling that filled his heart remained. It took him a few minutes to calm down. Lucian did not even want to think back to what he saw. The mere thought of it made him tremble. What the F asterisk CK was that? He cursed and forced himself out of the shower. Lucian then used the towel to dry himself before he made his way to the sink to brush his teeth. His mind was still a mess as he grabbed his toothbrush. His eyes subconsciously glanced back at his reflection in the mirror when he froze. His reflection was grinning. Lucian's hand moved to his mouth, his figure mimicking his actions, only to find out that he was indeed grinning. His dark brown eyes seemed to be glowing with a faint red gleam. I is this. Me? Lucian mumbled. The person in the mirror looked like a crazy madman. Hell, it was not a stretch to call him a devil. Lucian never thought he was capable of looking so, so evil. The toothbrush slipped from his hand and fell to the sink, pulling him out of his trance. By the time he grabbed it and glanced back at the mirror, his grin was gone and his face now looked normal again. Shaking his head, Lucian brushed his teeth while trying not to look in the mirror. His heart was filled with anxiety, yet he forced himself to calm down, constantly repeating that there was nothing to be afraid of and that nothing was going to hurt him. His self-hypnosis seemed to work somewhat as Lucian quickly left the bathroom and made his way to his room. Moon was sitting on top of the desk by the window. Her green eyes looked concerned as she stared at him. Lucian gave her a forced smile and spoke. Good night, Moon. I don't feel very good tonight, so no study session today. Saying that Lucian jumped under the blankets and turned off the lights. He was afraid that his anxiety would prevent him from sleeping, yet surprisingly, the moment he laid his head on the pillow, Lucian quickly found himself sinking into the dreamland. Moon, who was seated on the desk, hopped down and made her way to the bed. She jumped on top of Lucian's chest and continued to stare at him. Chapter 18 Unexpected Guest The next morning, Lucian woke up feeling that something was different. He didn't know what it was exactly, but he had a distinct feeling that something had changed. Moon was surprisingly up next to him. She was staring at him with a strange expression. Morning, sunshine. Strange how you didn't wake me up. He said and patted her head. Moon meowed in response before she jumped out of bed and made her way out of the room. A yawn escaped Lucian's lips as he turned to grab his phone. The clock read 8 a.m. He lazily got out of bed and dragged himself to the toilet. The second he faced the mirror, however, the events of yesterday came rushing to his mind. Lucian wanted to subconsciously avoid it, yet he hesitantly studied his re-election. After making sure that nothing was wrong, Lucian tried to convince himself that he must have been tired yesterday. Still, that scene in the strange astral world made him shiver. Shaking his head, Lucian hopped in the shower to get ready for his day. What he did not see, however, was Moon who had pushed the bathroom door open and was watching him closely. Her green eyes seemed to shine with intelligence as she stood guard. After Lucian finished getting ready for his day, he made his way back to his room and dressed in another one of his grandpa's favorite suits. A dark blue one. After making sure everything was all right, Lucian placed the gold heart's ring on his pinky, grabbed the ancient book, and the one about the study of magical beings with Immer before he made his way downstairs. Lucian then placed them on the counter and moved to raise the curtains of the windows. He glanced at the street seeing that traffic was still as light as always. 
He then walked back behind the counter and checked if any books were due to be returned today. After finding none, Lucian made his way upstairs and fixed a quick breakfast for both himself and Moon. By the time the clock hit 9 p.m., the old bookstore was open and ready for business. Lucian and his suit made for a strange sight as he used a broom to sweep the floor. After making sure that everything was clean and tidy, Lucian walked back behind the counter and opened the book on magical creatures and leaned back into his chair. Moon, who was seated next to him, jumped into his lap and closed her eyes. Lucian didn't mind. His lips curved upwards as he used one hand to pat her head and the other to hold the book. The Book of Magical Creatures was an extremely precious gift for Lucian. With its help, he managed to learn about the existence of many strange beings. Ones that inhabited foreign dimensions and others that simply lived hidden away from the mundane eye. One of the creatures Lucian felt the most curious about was called a house fairy. It had the appearance of a bald, ash-skinned humanoid child with dark black eyes, no pupils, and no ears. Despite their rather terrifying appearance, house fairies were rather harmless. As implied by their name, house fairies need a home to survive. If you ever managed to contract one, then they would take care of cleaning your house, doing the chores, and even cooking the food for you. All of this in exchange for staying in your house. Most of the time, you wouldn't even know they were there. Lucian leaned back on his chair and imagined how convenient that must be. To have an almost invisible servant, no need for cooking, cleaning, or doing the dreaded laundry. Must be nice. He mumbled before reading the instructions on how to find and contract one. Unsurprisingly, house fairies were hard to find. One's best chance at encountering one would be in an abandoned home. This, however, comes with its own set of risks. When the owner of the house dies, the house fairy that inhabits it tends to turn aggressive and territorial. Their meek and generally harmless personality can take a turn for the worse with the death of their masters. So caution is advised if you encounter one in an abandoned home. Some people, mostly the mundane, tend to confuse house fairies with ghosts, both of which are two very different entities. The way of calming an aggressive house fairy is to use cookies. Reading that line, Lucian couldn't help but burst out laughing. Something about the image of a creepy fairy eating cookies was strangely funny to him. Shaking his head, Lucian put the information to the back of his head and grabbed the magic book instead. He began his training session by training the hand gestures and memorizing the patterns of the spells he already learned. Use them, the lightning spell was avoided as it was too destructive to use inside the bookstore. It was then that the bells above the entrance door chimed, announcing the arrival of a new customer. Lucian placed the book down under the counter and raised his head to gaze at the newcomer. An old man in his mid-sixties, his white hair was still surprisingly thick for his age. His skin was strangely pale, akin to that of a corpse, and his eyes were bright golden. A vampire. Lucian almost blurts out. The man's features screamed that of a vampire. The pale skin, the golden eyes, and most importantly, the bizarre aura surrounding him. Lucian was able to see that the mana particles that gathered around the man were all dark. The rest of the brightly colored elements seemed to avoid his presence, steering away from him. Trying his best to remain calm, Lucian dunned a professional smile and spoke. Welcome, how may I help you? The old man glanced at the bookshelves and then turned towards Lucian. His eyes turned into slits as his lips curved upwards into a wide, unnatural smile. His teeth looked sharp and dangerous, causing Lucian to feel uncomfortable. He raised his guard and waited for the man to speak. Interesting. The old man spoke in a deep voice. Excuse me? Asked Lucian as he prepared himself for anything that could come. Moon, who was seated on his lap, jumped off and bared her teeth at the old man. I smelled the presence of something very interesting, said the old man and raised his finger to point at Lucian before he continued. You. Chapter 19. The Monster. I smelled the presence of something very interesting, said the old man and raised his finger to point at Lucian before he continued. You. Hearing that, goosebumps rose on the back of Lucian's neck. He watched in shock as the almost normal old man morphed into something horrifying. His mouth opened unnaturally wide, revealing the rows of sharp, shark-like teeth. 
His golden eyes began to glow as he stared at Lucian excitedly. A split second later, the vampire lunged toward Lucian. His fingers turned into dangerous black claws, his mouth gaping wide as he aimed for his neck. Lucian, however, was prepared. Surprisingly, at this moment of truth, his mind was calm. He had already been aware that something was wrong with the old man the second he walked in, and he was on his guard the whole time. Before the vampire could reach him, Lucian raised his hand to face him and quickly brought it down. The vampire that was sailing through the air was instantly dropped to the ground, causing a part of it to cave in. Seeing that Immer worked on him, Lucian's eyes shone brightly as he raised his hand, causing the vampire to rise from the ground and hover in the air. His expression was vicious as he tried to break free, but Lucian's control over Immer was already far beyond what any of them could have imagined. Glaring at the vampire that almost gave him a heart attack, Lucian stepped from behind the counter and carefully approached him. He took a glance at the door and used Immer to pull down the curtains and lock it before he turned his attention towards the intruder. What the F asterisk CK was that? Didn't your parents teach you any manners? He scolded in annoyance. The adrenaline was still pumping in his body. The vampire growled in reply as he continued to bare his teeth. Moon, who was sitting on top of the counter, jumped down and made her way toward both of them. She first glanced at Lucian and then hopped on top of the vampire's head. Wait, careful, Lucian warned, yet the cat was already nestled on top of the monster's head. She hissed and began to deliver a series of vicious paw strikes to his face, aiming for his eyes in particular. The proud vampire wanted to roar in anger, yet Lucian quickly used Immer to seal his mouth shut. Although his neighborhood was relatively empty, he did not want anyone calling the police on him, only to find him holding a vampire suspended midair. Still, it was satisfying to watch Moon punish the vampire as he squirmed midair. Cuts began to appear on his face, which in turn began to heal at a speed visible to the naked eye. Interesting, Lucian mumbled. It looked like the vampire's famed regeneration was not a hoax after all. It was even more ridiculous now that he was seeing it live. Still, I have to say, I'm a little bit disappointed. I thought vampires were supposed to be strong. You couldn't even put up much of a fight. Lucian's words caused the vampire to shake in anger, his golden eyes burned with rage. He hadn't expected the young magician to be so proficient in high-ranking spells. He didn't even see him cast it before he was pinned to the ground and was now hopelessly made to float about. The damn cat that continued to blind him wasn't helping. The vampire watched as the young man's eyes turned frosty, as if he was suddenly possessed by someone else. His dark brown eyes began to burn with a red glow causing shivers to run down his spine. A wide grin slowly stretched across his face. Even the cat that was hitting him stopped and jumped off before she ran off on top of the counter. What the hell is that? Inwardly cried the vampire. The young man was not normal. How could a mere human change so fast? The aura that he was leaking was tremendous. As a vampire, he was not very sensitive to mana, his body had a natural degree of immunity to it. So he was unable to sense the pressure emitting out of the bookstore. But when faced with Lucian, the vampire felt like he was staring at a devil. He deeply regretted his rash decision to plunge into this damned bookstore headfirst. He deeply regretted not being able to control his urge. He regretted it all. If only he was able to turn back time. The world suddenly turned clearer in Lucian's eyes. He felt a sense of ease and calm wash over him as if something had clicked in his mind. The bound vampire was no longer as scary as he thought him to be. No, why would he be scared? It was the intruder that was supposed to be afraid. Yes, are you afraid? Asked Lucian as he slowly approached the vampire. His hand moved and lightly patted his head with a chuckle. I think we are going to have so much fun together. The grin on his face extended as he turned to make his way upstairs with the vampire floating behind. Moon on the other hand meowed before she followed behind from a distance. Her green eyes seemed to shine with intelligence and concern. Once upstairs, Lucian placed the vampire on the ground of his bedroom and tapped his chin, deep in thought. I heard that healing spells don't work against vampires. I wonder if that's true. He mumbled. The old vampire overheard him, his eyes widened as he struggled to shake his head. 
Oh, you sound excited. Don't worry, it's just a minor healing spell. It shouldn't do much damage. I think. His words were like a hammer that smashed on the vampire's heart. He was confused. Wasn't the young magician supposed to interrogate him? Ask him what was his reason for attacking him. What brought him to this damned shabby old bookstore? Why did he seem so unconcerned about the answers? After making sure that the vampire was tightly bound in place, Lucian attempted something that he had yet to try, simultaneously casting two different spells. He needed Immer to stay up to keep the vampire from moving. Tadasa was his goal. He wanted to test how effective his healing spell was against a vampire. Bear with me, will you? After all, you were the one that attacked me in my home. Chapter 20. Crazy? The loud grunts of an old vampire reverberated throughout the bedroom as Lucian kept casting Tadasa on him. He first started by applying it to his legs, and to his immediate surprise, it worked rather too well. The vampire's right leg began to disappear, turning into countless specks of ash. The skin disappeared, and then the meat disappeared before finally, even the bone disappeared. The old vampire kept shaking in his place with a savage expression. His face was morphed into an expression of extreme terror and pain. Lucian, however, did not care. It was almost as if he had fallen into a trance. He found it quite fascinating studying the changes that happened to the vampire. With an excited gleam in his eyes and a wide grin, Lucian rushed to grab a notebook where he began to write down the results of his experiment. He had heard that vampires had small resistance against certain spells and were even immune to some others. Still, seeing was believing. And according to what he was seeing, the poor vampire had no resistance whatsoever to the spells he cast. So it seems like the spells recorded in the book are indeed special. He mumbled and stopped casting Tadasa. The vampire's leg quickly began to regenerate at a speed visible to the naked eye. Hmm, so you can still regenerate even after all of that. The speed of your recovery, however, seems to be slowing down. He added and wrote it down in his notebook. Well, now that we know Tadasa is extremely effective, shall we try some other spells? He said, the grin never quite leaving his face. Hearing that, the vampire struggled to shake his head with a pitiful expression. He regretted getting tempted to come to this cursed place. He regretted attacking this damned monster. It was impossible to even communicate with him. His eyes widened in horror as Lucian snapped his finger, causing a small flame to appear over it. The vampire kept shaking his head, trying to speak, yet to no avail. His mouth had been sealed shut. Now then, let's see how you fare against fire, said Lucian with a smile. A few hours later, an exhausted vampire with hollow eyes was staring at the ceiling. His gaze looked like it had lost all hope in life. The humiliation and torture he was subjected to in the past hours was something that never occurred in his past couple hundred years of existence. He had been burned, cut, bruised, bound. His limbs were forcefully torn from his body and made to regenerate. Over and over and over again. All until he could regenerate no more. The devil that captured him kept using his strange spells, ones that the vampire had never encountered before. They seemed like simple spells, but the power output behind them was ridiculous. It had rendered him helpless against them, his resistance toward magic turned useless. The devil only stopped when he saw that he could regenerate no longer. Ah, uh, speaking of which, I forgot to ask. Why did you attack me? I'm sure I never saw you before in my life, and I don't think I offended you or anyone. The vampire wanted to cry out. Weren't you supposed to ask that first? Yet all that came out of his mouth were muffled moans. Hmm. Ah, uh, silly me. I'll remove that for you, but remember if you scream your dad. Lucian's gaze brought shivers down the vampire's spine, making him nod hastily. Good, I ask the questions and you answer. He added, to which the vampire hastily nodded again. Good. Lucian then removed Immer's influence on the vampire's mouth, granting him freedom over it once more. Name? Darius. Answered the vampire, his voice hoarse and tired. Age. Darius raised his brows at the question, yet did not dare dally in his reply. 204. Damn, you're old. 
Lucian subconsciously muttered, causing Darius' eyes to twitch. Ah, uh, sorry. So, why did you come to my place? Darius hesitated for a second before answering. I smelled something very appetizing, something that called me over. Clicking his tongue in annoyance, Lucian raised his hand in a threatening manner, causing the old vampire to flinch before he asked. That makes no damn sense to me. Explain, what the hell do you mean something very appetizing? Darius once again hesitated, his face turned strange as he motioned with his head toward Lucian. Me? Lucian asked with a frown. Darius nodded and explained. There's a strange aura emitting from your body, if it was not for it. Damn it, I would not have been so stupid. A frown made its way to Lucian's face. A strange aura? He did not know why, but his hands immediately went to his face. They hesitantly traced his wide grin before a serious expression overtook him. Leaving the bound vampire on the ground, Lucian rushed out of the room and made his way to the bathroom. The sight that greeted him was that of his smiling face and glowing red eyes. The scene made him pause in shock. It was as if a veil was suddenly lifted from his mind. The gravity of the situation and of what he had just done slowly sunk in. What the F asterisk CK? He mumbled in shock as he raised his hands in front of his face. What the hell just happened? Moon's meow suddenly pulled him out of his trance. Lucian turned to glance at her as she rubbed her head against his legs. A long sigh escaped his lips as he kneeled to scratch her head. Moon, I think I'm going crazy. Meow. Back in an undisclosed location, a short-haired beautiful black lady was racing down the hallways with an anxious expression. Her steps were hurried as she came to a stop in front of a large wooden door. As if waiting for her, the door creaked open. Nia gave a deep bow to the chairman sitting behind the desk before she walked inside. Mr. Chairman, we have a problem. Her voice was anxious as she spoke. The old man released a sigh and pulled his long, messy white hair back before asking, What happened? Our scouts in charge of monitoring the bookstore on 27th Street reported the appearance of a mid-ranked rogue vampire. Who is it? The old man's eyes turned serious as he asked. Darius. Damn it, you handle this, Nia. Try not to antagonize the bookstore owner, and whatever happens, do not fight inside. Yes, sir. Chapter 21 the council's visit. Inside the bedroom, an anxious Lucian was pacing about, his mind still in shock. He would occasionally throw the bound vampire a glance, causing the latter to shiver in fear. According to Darius, the smell he was emitting was too appetizing. It was enough to make him lose his reasoning and dare to attack him in broad daylight. After further explanation, Lucian slowly came to the conclusion that whatever scent he was emitting came after he had visited that altar plane. Could it have something to do with that presence I saw? Goosebumps appeared on the back of his neck as he remembered that incomprehensible figure that lurked deep in the abyss. Maybe that could also explain all of these changes I've been going through? Lucian wondered as he glanced at his hands. The past few hours had not felt like himself. Instead, it was as if he was nothing but a bystander in his own body, watching everything play out with a calm and different attitude. A part of him even enjoyed the sadistic torture he inflicted on the vampire. He had been too rash, too nonchalant, and too ignorant of the risks he was exposing himself to. What would have happened if he did not leave that astral plane in time? What would have happened if that inconceivable figure grabbed a hold of him? And what would have happened if he continued using that spell recklessly? Would he remain as himself? Or would he morph into something else? The scary part of it all was the fact that Lucian truly did not feel anything wrong. It was as if he always had those tendencies. When he was experimenting on Darius, he truly thought it was the normal thing to do. That's what scared him the most. It was then that Lucian remembered the first page of the magical book, the quote written by his ancestor. Magic is how the divine come to our rescue, how the devils and monsters reach in and cause harm with their temptations. Be aware, be good, and be very careful what you wish for. There is always a fee. There is always a fee. Lucian repeated in a daze. Moon's sudden cry broke him out of his trance once again. Lucian gave a weak smile and bent down to grab her. For some reason, her presence helped calm him down. He slowly stroked her soft white fur and turned to gaze at the weak vampire. 
What do I do with him, though? He wondered. Darius seemed to sense something as he hurriedly avoided his gaze. It was then that the sound of knocking came from downstairs. It sounded especially loud in the silent bedroom. Lucian frowned and dragged Darius with him using Immer. Once downstairs, he forced the old vampire to hide behind the counter as moved toward the door. Lucian then cautiously moved the blinds and studied the newcomers. A duo. One was a beautiful dark-skinned lady with short hair, thick brows, and deep eyes, and the other was a young man in his late twenties, estimated Lucian. He had short dark brown hair and a pair of piercing blue eyes. With a frown, Lucian opened the door with a clang and spoke. We're closed for the day. Mr. Lucian, my name is Nia, and this is my partner Patrick. We're here on the behalf of the council. Hearing that, Lucian's heart sank a little. He was well aware of the power and respect the council commanded. His question was, what were they here on his doorstep? And why now? Could it be that aura Darius spoke of? His mind was spinning fast, yet Lucian maintained his poker face. And, to what do I owe the pleasure? He asked. Nia thought that she was prepared for facing the mage. She even brought Patrick, one of the council's top mages with her as backup, yet all of that seemed insignificant once the young-looking mage opened the door. She was able to immediately sense the weak presence of the vampire Darius. It seemed like he was hovering on the verge of death. The main problem, however, was the aura emitting from the bookstore and the one that the young mage himself was leaking. The first suppressed the magic inside her body, making her feel like a giant mountain was pressing on her back. The latter, on the other hand, made Nia feel like she was in the presence of a devil. Still, she maintained a respectful attitude and introduced herself as a representative of the council, hoping that the mage would not do anything rash, for she doubted either her or Patrick were his match. The mage's face retained its indifferent expression, causing her heart to leap in her chest. And, to what do I owe the pleasure? Calming herself, Nia forced herself to speak. The council would like to ask you to hand the criminal Darius the vampire over for justice. You will be handsomely compensated for your troubles. A frown made its way to the mage's face. Nia felt the world spin. Patrick, who was by her side, tensed up and got ready. It's over, Nia thought. To their surprise, however, the young mage simply moved back and further opened the door to the bookstore. Please, come in. His invitation looked like that of a monster inviting them to the jaws of the abyss. Nia hesitated for a second before she stepped inside, followed by Patrick. The tall bookshelves on both sides greeted her, yet she was not in the mood to study them. The pressure multiplied once she was inside. Nia was sure that it would be impossible for her to use magic here. Her mind began to spin as various thoughts ran wild in her head. Did he bring us inside to finish us off? Does he not care about the council? Before she could say anything, however, the young mage waves his hand. The figure of the old vampire Darius floated from behind the counter. He had a bleak look on his face. His pale face looked worse than normal. He dared not gaze at Lucian directly. Chantless casting. And so easily. Just what level did he reach? Nia's eyes widened in shock. I presume it was him you were looking for? Why, yes. Nia stuttered in reply. Well then, he's all yours. Nia gulped nervously. She still couldn't believe how easy it was. She cautiously motioned for Patrick to grab the vampire. To her surprise, Darius couldn't even struggle. He was too weak to move. If anything, he looked relieved looking at them. Just what did he do to him? Chapter 22 Encounter With the council's sudden visit, Lucian's concern turned out to be unwarranted. They ended up taking the old vampire off his hands and did not overstay their welcome. This made Lucian have a somewhat of a not-bad impression of them. Now that he remained alone, Lucian made his way upstairs and changed into some comfortable sports clothes. He did not forget the jacket, since it was still cold out in February. Moon followed behind him through it all, and when it was time to leave, she effortlessly jumped on his shoulders and nestled there. Her presence caused Lucian's lips to curl upwards as he locked the bookstore and left for a walk. The sun set in the sky in fresh colors of orange gold and red, stretching far and wide. Lucian's steps halted as he raised his head to admire the view. 
His heart turned melancholic as memories of his grandpa flashed through his mind. He had thrown himself into studying magic to cope with the loss, and to some extent, it worked. Yet it was still hard waking up to an empty house, a house that lacked his presence. A heavy sigh escaped his lips as Lucian pulled the jacket closer to his neck. He then began to walk with no certain destination in mind. He needed to clear his head. Had this been in the past weeks, Lucian would have used the old magic book to escape the pain, yet after what happened with the vampire, he was unsure. A part of him was afraid. Lucian was afraid that if he continued down this line, he would end up losing himself. He would end up losing that which made him human. Was that something he was ready for? Shaking his head, Lucian's steps subconsciously brought him before a July 11th. He walked inside, causing the bells to jingle. An average-looking young girl greeted him with a cheerful attitude. Welcome. Lucian simply nodded with a forced smile and moved to grab an energy drink. He could feel the young clerk's gaze on him, or more specifically on Moon who was seated on his shoulders. Lucian then moved to check out. The young clerk was unable to hold herself back as she spoke. That's cute, Kitty. Can I pet her, please? Sure, answered Lucian. He then came closer to the young clerk who hesitantly reached out to pet Moon. Through the bond between them, Lucian was able to tell that the cat was displeased by this interaction, so after a few pets and an angry Moon, Lucian excused himself and paid for the drink before he took his leave. Once he stepped out of the store, a series of fast paw attacks assaulted his head. Ouch! Okay, okay. I'm sorry. I should have asked you for permission. He said and grabbed the troublemaker in his arms. Moon still in her bad mood jumped off and began to walk by herself. This caused Lucian's lips to stretch upwards as it made him feel like he was raising a child. Come on, Moon. I'll make you the chicken breasts you like to eat. This made her halt her steps. She slowly turned to look at him, almost as if to make sure he was not lying before she jumped on his shoulders once again. After aimlessly walking for a while, Lucian was ready to head back home when a strange disturbance in mana caught his attention. The glowing mana particles in a certain alley were hectic, causing him to pause. His rational part thought it would be best to ignore it and just go back home. Sadly, his curiosity seemed to overwhelm his sense of judgment. Carefully, Lucian crossed the street and made his way toward the dark alley. The sky had long since turned dark. The lights of the city made it impossible to see any stars in the sky. Yet in this particular alley, the light seemed to be absent. Ah, uh, why the F asterisk CK am I coming here for? This is like the plot of every horror movie that ever existed. Lucian inwardly berated himself. His curiosity, however, was too strong. Moon, who was resting on his shoulder, jumped off and bared her teeth at something. Lucian's eyes took a few seconds to adjust to the dark alley. His ears perked as he caught the sound of an animal growling from behind the dumpster. Moon was on the verge of jumping out and attacking whatever was there. Lucian, on other hand, tried not to be rash. He attempted to calm her down through their bond, but was still nonetheless prepared for anything that might happen. Red piercing eyes that seemed to shine in the darkness greeted him. Lucian's mouth opened in shock at the creature that appeared from behind the dumpster. It was a head. A female head floating in the air with dangling organs. The head had blood splattered all over its mouth. The smell suddenly assaulted Lucian as he took a step back. That was when his eye caught sight of a horrifying scene. A man was collapsed on the ground, his eyes open wide in shock and terror. The man's chest was split open and his organs were spilling out. The scene caused Lucian to take another step back. He staggered, nauseous, and clutched his stomach struggling to keep himself steady. The floating head of terror made its move then, as it launched itself towards him. Before Lucian could do anything, Moon jumped out and slapped it away with a force far beyond her little frame. Lucian had no time to consider what just happened. He instantly used Immer to hold the floating head in place. To his surprise, however, Immer was only able to make it a pause for a second before it launched itself toward him again with a silent cry. Lucian took another step back, his mind panicked as the red eyes locked on his. Just as the head was about to reach him, Moon stepped forward again for the save. This time, she decisively latched onto it and refused to let go. 
The head slammed into the alley wall, sending both of them crashing to the ground. This brought Lucian out of his trance as he saw Moon collapse on the ground. You mother F asterisk cur. He cursed and willed the mana inside his body along with the one in his surroundings before he died snapped his fingers, using Tajajite. A fireball suddenly appeared and shot towards the head that was struggling to fly away. The second the fireball made contact, both it and the head exploded with a bang forcing Lucian to cover his eyes. After a few seconds, he hastily scanned his surroundings, finding no signs of the monster before he rushed toward Moon and used Tadasa. Chapter 23 Questions Thankfully, Moon's injuries were not that serious. After casting Tadasa, she quickly jumped on his shoulders and refused to get down. Lucian didn't mind. A sigh of relief escaped his lips. The floating head was burned with nothing left to show for it. The only indication that remained of its existence was the corpse of the poor man sprawled on the ground with his guts spilling. Lucian subconsciously averted his gaze. He had never seen murder before, and certainly not one as bloody as this. It was completely different than the movies. The smell was overwhelming, and the sight was enough to make his lunch threaten to jump from his stomach. But what should I do? I can't leave the per guy like this. A part of him wanted nothing to do with this whole situation. He was tempted to bolt out of this alley and never look back again. Yet another look at the man's horrified face made him hesitate. It just didn't feel right to leave him like this, behind a dumpster. Lucian didn't know the guy. He didn't know if he was a good or a bad person. He didn't know his name. He knew nothing about him. This, however, did not stop his mind from making up stories and scenarios about how his family must be waiting for him. His wife? His kids? His parents? His dog? The more he thought about this, the worse he felt. Still, his rational side calmed him down. What could he do? Get the authorities, and then what? Explain how a floating head with dangling organs killed the man and attacked him. He'd be lucky to get sent to a psych ward. No matter how Lucian looked at it, the situation was not in his favor. Anyone who stumbled upon this might just suspect him. It's only reasonable to do so. Just as he was thinking about all of this, a change in the mana made him perk up. A mage? Or is it something else? He nervously gulped and got ready to face the newcomer. The sound of steps grew louder, causing Lucian's heart to thump faster in his chest. After a second, a familiar face appeared at the entrance of the dark alley. Mr. Lucian. The dark-skinned lady spoke in a respectful tone. Nia, right? Lucian asked hesitantly. I'm honored you remembered my name. We'll take care of things over here. Please get some rest. She replied. Lucian frowned before nodding. I see, well then, thank you for your help. It's our duty, Nia answered with a bow. Lucian did not dare dally there any longer. Since the council said they'll handle it, then he'd leave it for them to do so. His walk back home was like a dream. Lucian didn't remember much of it until he reached the bookstore. The bell chimed as he entered and locked the door behind him. Moon jumped off his shoulders and ran upstairs. Lucian, on the other hand, fell to the ground with his back leaning on the door. The entire day was a little bit too much for him. An old vampire attacking him during the day and a floating head from hell attacking him at night. Since when had his life been so dangerous? Then there was the council. Why was Nia there? The only plausible conclusion Lucian could come up with was that they were watching him. He was not stupid. First the hermits, then the goal hearts, and now the council. Everyone in the magic world seemed to have some sort of misunderstanding regarding his identity and possibly his magic level. Lucian guessed that was the reason everyone was so respectful when talking to him. Since the stories he heard about the main families and the council depicted them as anything but nice. Another long sigh escaped his lips as Lucian buried his head in his hands. He missed his grandpa. He missed the days when he did not have to worry about being attacked by a random monster or magical creature. After a couple of minutes of trying to calm himself down, Lucian groggily stood up. He moved the window blinds and scanned the street outside. The flow of mana was normal, so he was unable to catch anything strange. Lucian nonetheless was sure that he was being watched. Since the council's job is to maintain order in the magical world, then I suppose I'm considered an unknown element. 
they should be keeping tabs on me. They think I'm a high rank mage, so they didn't want to risk offending me, but they can't just let me be since there's always the danger of me going out of control. Lucian inwardly analyzed his situation while pacing around the bookstore. So what should I do? He suddenly paused. This misunderstanding came with a lot of advantages, but it was also laced with danger. Rubbing his head, Lucian's expression turned worried. He removed his jacket and made his way upstairs. Without changing his clothes, Lucian sat down on the desk by his window and grabbed an empty notebook. From what I understand so far, mages are divided into ranks. Novice, apprentice, journeyman, high mage, sage, archmage. Each rank is further divided into three smaller stages. Bronze, silver, gold. It was a fairly simple grading system. The only problem was that Lucian had no idea how it worked. What rank was he supposed to be at? And what dictated such a thing? Was it the number of spells mastered? Or perhaps their power? Lucian made sure to jot down everything in his notebook. I wonder what rank was that vampire? He suddenly mumbled. With a sigh, Lucian closed the notebook and threw it on the desk. He rubbed his eyes tiredly and used Immer to grab his phone from the bed. After aimlessly scrolling through the internet, Lucian decided on pizza again for dinner and placed his order. Turning around, Lucian glanced at Moon who was seated on the bed with a strange expression. Now you, when did you get so strong? He asked with a faint smile. Moon on the other hand replied with an innocent meow before she jumped off the bed and ran downstairs. Does it have something to do with the bond one feel between us? Lucian wondered out loud. Ever since he saved Moon, brought her home, and named her, a strange bond seemed to have formed between them. They were able to communicate with emotions. Lucian was not quite sure how that worked, but most of the time, he had no problem understanding Moon. Interesting. Chapter 24. Granny Lorini. After a not-so-good night's sleep, Lucian woke up with a determined expression plastered on his face. Yesterday's events were like a heavy reminder that the world he was in was no longer the same. It was a world fraught with danger. Although Lucian would love nothing more than to stay home and study magic, he needed the strength to back him up, the strength to look for answers on his grandpa, and the strength to understand his situation better. He had been reckless in the past month. Lucian knew it. He understood how lucky he had been. That abyssal monster that he encountered in the astral plane was proof enough of what lurks on the other side of things. One wrong move, perhaps one wrong incantation or one wrong spell, and who knows where or how he would end up. Shaking his head, Lucian groggily stood up and made his way to the bathroom. After he finished with his morning routine, Lucian fixed some breakfast for both him and Moon. When he was done eating, Lucian made his way back to his room, changed his clothes, and grabbed the magical book and his notebook using Immer before he made his way downstairs. Lucian settled the books behind the counter, grabbed a broom with Immer, and began to clean the place. He returned some of the books that were laying on the ground to their respective places, others, on the other hand, remained there due to the lack of space. After he finished with everything, Lucian glanced at the bookstore with a satisfied smile. He nodded and moved to open the door and raise the curtains. The day was a little bit chilly. The breeze made him subconsciously take a step back. The location of the bookstore was not the best. He grumbled inwardly before closing the door. His eyes subconsciously stopped over a certain place on the floor. I'm pretty certain there was a small dent here before, Lucian mumbled. The dent appeared after he slammed the vampire Darius to the ground with Immer. Now, however, the imprint was no longer there. This made Lucian feel suspicious as he glanced around the bookstore. I know it was here, I'm not crazy. But now it's gone. Someone or something fixed it. Moon was nowhere to be seen downstairs. Lucian assumed she was lazing around upstairs. He made his way to the chair behind the counter and slumped down with a sigh pushing the matter to the back of his head. Lucian first took a quick scan of his notebook before he grabbed the magical book. He first took the time to revise the spells he already learned, recreating them in his mind and practicing the hand gestures. After he finished, Lucian's eyes eyed the golden bracelet equipped on his right hand. This was the gift the butler Ron had given him. 
it was able to store five spells, enabling him to cast them at any time with no incantation or hand gestures. Lucian had been meaning to store a few Yuzum spells, as that lightning spell was his current strongest one, and at least one or two Tagidite spells. It had proven itself to be useful against the floating head after all. He, however, kept pushing it back since he needed to ask Estria to borrow her training place. Yuzum was too dangerous to summon here after all. Raising his hand, Lucian looked at the black ring on his pinky. The storage ring was not too useful for him as of yet. The main reason was the fact that it couldn't hold the magical book inside. It was as if a force repelled it from doing so. This left Lucian with quite the dilemma. The magical book was too big and too thick to carry around everywhere, and he did not feel very comfortable leaving it around every time he left the bookstore. The chimes of the bell above the door broke him from his thoughts, as they announced the arrival of the first customer of the day. Ah, Madame Larini, welcome. A gentle smile stretched across his face as he greeted the sweet old lady. She was not an unfamiliar face, quite the opposite. Madame Larini was a regular when his grandpa was here. She had lost her husband a long time ago, and Lucian always felt like there was something between her and his old pops. He did see her at the funeral, and she promised to visit him. Although it had been a little over a month since then, Lucian was still happy to see a familiar face. Hello, dear. I see you've taken care of everything quite nicely. And what did I tell you to call me? Madame Lorini's voice was surprisingly strong and deep. It brought Lucian a sense of nostalgia as he recalled scenes of the past, with her and his grandpa sitting behind the counter laughing while he was buried in his fantasy books. Lucian quickly stood up from behind the counter and moved to hug the old lady. She gave a sweet smile in return and gently patted his back. It must have been lonely, staying in this place all by yourself. Lucian answered with a smile. It was not so bad. Besides, I'm not alone. He said and broke the hug to show her Moon who came down at some point and was laying down next to the counter. Madame Lorini's eyes seemed to shine momentarily before she nodded in understanding. That's good, dear. I'm happy to see you are doing well. Please, come take a seat. Lucian offered, yet she promptly shook her head and hand. Oh, no. I only came to check on you as promised. This old lady is still a little bit busy, I'm afraid. What old? You are still very beautiful, Granny. Lucian answered with a smile. I said I'm old, not ugly. Granny Lorini rolled her eyes, causing Lucian to hastily shake his head. Uh, of course. That's not what I meant, Dash. Haha, <laughs> you're still as fun to tease, dear. Her voice always rose several octaves when she was happy and became more girlish and younger. Well, I'm afraid I have to go now that I've made sure you're doing well. Already? At least stay for some tea. Oh, no. I'm afraid I am in a bit of a rush, dear. Lucian's face turned a bit sad as he nodded, all right, but you still need to come visit. Of course, Granny Lorini said and pinched his cheeks like she used to do when he was a child. Now, stay safe, dear. Saying that she quickly turned to leave, not giving Lucian any chance to speak. Once she reached the door, however, she paused and turned toward him. Ah, uh, and dear, leave some cookies on the counter when you go to sleep saying that Granny Lorini left. Cookies? Chapter 25. The Fairy. The day passed uneventfully. A few customers came to return the books they rented, while others stumbled upon the bookstore for the first time. Lucian did not leave the bookstore and instead cooked his and Moon's lunch at home. The rest of his time was spent reading the ancient book and studying the one about magical creatures. For some reason, what Granny Lorini said popped into his mind. Cookies, Lucian mumbled as he stood up to close the bookstore for the day. His mind recalled a certain creature he had read about. Could it be a house fairy? A house fairy, mostly harmless and rarely aggressive unless they lost their master. The best way to calm and approach a house fairy is by giving them cookies. Lucian remembered finding the whole thing quite funny when he read about it. Now, however, Granny Lorini told him to leave cookies out on the counter. Why? Lucian's mind went on overdrive as he came to a sudden conclusion. Maybe Granny Lorini is also a mage. He inwardly noted. It would make sense considering how close she was to his old pops. This could mean she could explain more about this whole situation. 
Lucian's eyes lit up at that thought before he heaved a sigh. He had no way of contacting Lady Lorini. Although she had been a regular for years, Lucian had never figured out where she lived. I guess I just have to wait and hope she'll come back soon. He mumbled. Standing up from the chair, Lucian lazily stretched and pulled his phone towards him using Immer. The clock pointed to 9.30 p.m. It was already quite late and he had yet to have dinner. A yawn escaped his lips as he made his way to the door. Lucian first glanced at the already deserted street. After making sure that everything seemed all right, he locked the door and pulled down the curtains before making his way upstairs. Lucian contemplated whether or not to order food. Eh, I'm too lazy to cook. Pizza, it is then. He mumbled. After placing the order, Lucian changed his clothes into his nightwear and moved to the kitchen to search for cookies. I'm pretty sure I bought some. Let's home house fairies like cookies from the store. He chuckled. His search finally yielded results when he found the bag of cookies hidden away above the fridge. There we go. He then grabbed a plate and placed a few cookies there. Lucian was about to go down when he paused, deep in thought. It's missing something. Moon meowed by his side in reply. You think so too, right? He nodded and scratched his head. Ah, of course. How could I forget that? Lucian smiled and bent down to pet Moon's head before he opened the fridge and grabbed the milk. Cookies should go with milk. He nodded in satisfaction. It was then that his phone suddenly rang. Lucian made it fly to his hand and glanced at the unfamiliar number. Hello? Hello? It's your pizza. I've been knocking on the door for a while. Ah, uh, sorry. I'll be right there. After dinner, Lucian brushed his teeth and grabbed the plate of cookies and glass of milk before he made his way downstairs and placed them on the counter. His eyes scanned the empty bookstore with a mixture of excitement and concern. After a few uneventful minutes, Lucian sighed and turned around to leave. I guess you are still shy. I hope you like the cookies, though, he said before making his way through the door behind the counter and closing it as he passed. Lucian's steps immediately halted. He carefully placed his ears on the door and waited. Nothing. He clicked his tongue and walked upstairs with another yawn. The next morning, Lucian woke up at eight. By the time he got himself ready and made breakfast for both him and Moon, the clock already reached nine. He lazily made his way downstairs, still feeling a little bit sleepy. The second he opened the door, however, his steps stopped abruptly. The scene before him dispelled all of his drowsiness. Lucian regularly cleaned the bookstore, even more so since he learned Immer. Still, it was never to this degree. The floor was almost shining. The books that usually littered the floor were neatly arranged to the sides in a way that did not take up any space, if anything they added to the charm of the bookstore. The windows that had some old spots were cleaned. Heck, Lucian was unable to find a speck of dust in the whole place. His eyes were subconsciously drawn to the empty and cleaned glass of milk and plate of cookies. They were placed on the counter, where all of the paperwork Lucian had was neatly arranged. A wide smile overtook his face as he kept scanning the whole place. His fingers traced the shelves with a look of admiration as he continually nodded in satisfaction. Amazing! Lucian muttered. He had his doubts and suspected that a house fairy did indeed live here. His old pop was a mysterious old mage after all, so it was not that shocking. What he did not expect was the efficiency of it all. Lucian did not hear a single thing. He wasn't a heavy sleeper, yet the house fairy did not seem to make a sound. Amazing! He couldn't help but blurt out again, his eyes shining in excitement. This changed everything, he thought. No more dishes. No more laundry. And no more cleaning. He almost shouted, yet restrained himself. Ahem, dear house fairy, are you there? He called out in a gentle tone, yet got no response. Ah, uh, give me a second. Lucian called out before he grabbed the empty glass and plate and ran upstairs. Moments later, he was back with a full glass of milk and the now full plate of cookies. Moon was following behind him with a strange expression on her face. After observing him for a few seconds, she turned her attention toward a particular spot before she quickly lost interest and made her way back upstairs. Lucian, on the other hand, 
carefully placed the plate and glass on the counter, his eyes continued to scan his surroundings in excitement as he spoke. Please consider this a thank you for the amazing job you've done. Lucien then slowly sat down behind the counter and patiently waited. House Fairy seemed to be masters at hiding. Even with the help of his eyes that were able to see the mana particles, Lucien could not figure out where the fairy was at. Come on, don't be shy. Chapter 26 Another Meeting The day passed by normally with no signs of the house fairy. Lucian would have been lying if he said he was not disappointed. A sigh escaped his lips as he glanced at the untouched glass of milk and plate of cookies. It was already close to closing time, and tonight was special. He had promised to go visit the hermits for their weekly meetups. Lucian unhurriedly stood out up and stretched. Moon, who was seated next to him on the floor, pushed her head against his leg. Lucian obliged and scratched her back and head. After doing that, Lucian closed the bookstore a little bit early for the day. The meetup would take place at 8 p.m., and it was already 7. He made his way upstairs and changed into his grandpa's favorite dark suit before he studied his reflection and nodded in satisfaction. Lucian left the door to the house on the second floor open. He glanced at Moon, who was following him, and spoke. Can I count on you to watch the house while I'm out? Meow. Her reply prompted a smile to stretch across Lucian's face, and he was unable to hold himself from patting her again. Once he reached downstairs, his eyes subconsciously glanced at the glass of milk and plate of cookies. I guess he's still shy. Or is it a she? With such thoughts swirling through his mind, Lucian took his leave and closed the door behind him. The bookstore turned silent. Moon, who was left alone, jumped on top of the counter and glanced at the milk and cookies with clear desire in her eyes, yet she forced herself not to touch them. A cry escaped her mouth following, which a small hand materialized out of thin air. The hand was as pale as a corpse. It reached out for the cookies first, making them disappear one after another. After the cookies were gone, the stranger finally appeared. If Lucian was still here, he would be surprised to see that the stand house fairy was different from the ones he read about. This one had long white hair reaching its back, pale white skin, and piercing gray eyes. It was difficult to ascertain the gender of the house fairy, as it wore a suit that typically belonged to butlers, but its features looked feminine. The house fairy quickly reached out for the milk and drank it in one gulp. It left a tiny bit and passed it to Moon, who was watching the whole ordeal with shining eyes. Moon, seemingly happy with the house fairy, moved to the glass and finished the milk with a satisfied expression on her face. Soon after, the house fairy disappeared and the glass and plate began to float in the air. As always, Lucian found it hard to catch a cab that was willing to drive him to Avenue Lancaster. He didn't blame them either. That street was not known for its safety. After a while, an old driver finally agreed. The ride was mostly spent in silence. Once they reached in front of Building 101, the old driver finally spoke for the first time. I don't know what you're doing here, son, but you'd best not linger for long. This place is not for people like you. There's evil lurking around here, said the old driver. Lucian thanked him for his advice and handed him his fare before he got off. The old taxi driver spoke no further and hastily left. Lucian first scanned his surroundings. After making sure that no one was following him, he quickly approached the invisible barrier surrounding the building. As soon as he reached it, however, the barrier made way and allowed him to enter. This was the work of Astria after Lucian was accepted as an unofficial member of the Hermits. He didn't need to knock when the door suddenly opened. A pretty young girl with dark hair and brown eyes greeted him with a smile. Mr. Lucian, I was thinking about when you'll finally visit again. Hello, Layla. I apologize, I've been rather busy lately. Lucian answered with a smile as Layla made way for him to enter. The duo chatted amicably as they made their way to the fourth floor. The design of the house was once again different, which made Lucian inwardly sigh in wonder. The whole house was an old magical item according to Estria. Except for the master bedroom and the teleportation room, the inside would constantly change every three days, sometimes even daily. It was interesting to see and it reminded Lucian of the many applications of magic he had yet to unveil. The fourth floor of this time was akin to a hotel lounge. 
The mages were all situated on the chairs and couches, talking to each other in small groups. Lucian's eyes, however, were instantly drawn to the figure standing by the window. The second he appeared, all mages stopped what they were doing and stood up respectfully to greet him. Lucian still found it a bit hard to get used to the treatment, yet he maintained his smile and greeted everyone before he made his way toward Estria, who was smiling at him. Well, look who finally decided to join us, said Estria with a smile. What can I say? I've been a bit busy with some unwelcomed guests, Lucian answered and kissed Estria's cheek in greeting. She didn't mind and instead frowned and asked, Unwelcomed guests? Lucian nodded and continued. An old vampire, Darius I believe was his name. Estria's eyes widened slightly before her frown resurfaced. You know him? Lucian asked. Not personally, but I've heard about him before. Hard not to when he's been around for a couple of centuries. He's also a rogue, but the difference is he is one of the most wanted ones by the council. Hmm. Well, let's talk more about it after the meeting, Estria added with a smile. Lucian nodded and replied with a smile. After you, ladies, gentlemen, let the meeting begin. Estria's voice silenced the entire floor. Lucian's eyes shone as strands of mana began to move across the entire fourth floor. As if on cue, all of the mages present stood up and made their way to the center of the floor in a circle. The furniture slowly came to life and made its way to the center as well, forming a large circle behind the mages. A tall, comfortable chair appeared behind Lucian where he promptly sat down. Estria was to his right and Layla was to his left. Chapter 27 Ian The meeting proceeded as usual. A few debates over a couple of spells. Lucian refrained from participating in such topics and instead chose to listen carefully. His knowledge was still quite insignificant, so the less he talked, the fewer mistakes he would make. Estria, on the other hand, was quite active in joining the conversations. Layla, who was seated by his side, remained relatively silent as well. Lucian caught her sneaking a few peeks at his face, but thought nothing of it. The meeting continued with nothing catching his interest, until a young blonde-haired man, with bright blue eyes, stood up and spoke. I've come across a strange spell, but I don't know what it is. It's written in a strange language I've never seen before. Lucian's ears perked up at that, and he turned his attention towards the young man. The group of mages present, however, sighed and shook their heads while muttering to each other. It's Ian again. He should really let go of those childish fantasies. I don't understand why he insists that it's an actual ancient magical language. He's just desperate. Don't you know that he has been stuck at the bronze novice rank ever since he started? Although the conversations between the mages were quiet, they still managed to make their way to Lucian's ears. He scanned the young man's face with interest. The young mage did not seem to care much about what others said about him. He carefully reached out to his bag and grabbed an ancient piece of yellowish paper before he gently placed it on the round table that had materialized in the middle. Lucian's eyes were subconsciously drawn to the piece of paper when his heart suddenly skipped a beat. The language used was one that he was familiar with. It was the same as the one in the magic book his old pops left him. He tried to control his expression to not betray his emotions. The young mage pointed at the crude drawing of shining lights that seemed to follow a certain pattern before he spoke. I believe this should be a guide to learning the spell. Lucian inwardly nodded. The shining lights represented the floating mana particles, and the pattern should be the one to follow to activate the spell. Although Lucian wasn't completely sure, he was still convinced that the spell was indeed legit. The rest of the mages present, however, thought otherwise. As far as he knew, nobody was able to see mana. The most they could do was feel it, and even that was not accurate enough. Hence why it was hard for these mages to assume that the shining lights were in fact mana particles. Boy, I know it's hard to progress to the next rank. But you are still young and still have potential. Don't waste your time with these baseless superstitions. An old lady who was seated opposite to Lucian spoke in a kind tone. Before the young mage could reply, a middle-aged man with a well-trimmed beard spoke impatiently. This is not wasting your time, but ours as well. Do you think it's easy to discover a new spell? Not to mention an ancient magical language? Stop wasting our time on this. 
I think I speak for everyone when I say we are tired of this bullshit. Lucian was surprised at the strong reaction everyone was showing. The young blonde mage frowned and gritted his teeth before he sat back down and gently grabbed the old piece of paper before he placed it in his bag. Estria waved her hand silencing everyone before she spoke. Enough. Who's next? The meeting proceeded with no problems or unexpected interruptions. It continued that way until it was close to midnight. Estria stood up and announced the end of the discussion. Everyone stood up and began to take their leave. Lucian, on the other hand, remained seated. His eyes were glued on the young blonde mage who had a downcast expression on his face. Goodbye, Mr. Lucian. Layla waved at him as she turned to leave. Lucian smiled and waved back. A few mages he did not recall the names of came to ask him a few questions, to which Lucian answered vaguely. His eyes never quite left Ian, the young mage, throughout the whole time. Estria was busy sending everyone home when Ian stood up with a sigh. He grabbed his bag and got ready to leave. It was then that Lucian excused himself from the group and made his way to the young mage. Excuse me, Ian who didn't expect to be stopped turned around with a puzzled face. His eyes widened in shock as he realized who called him. Mr. Lucian. Lucian nodded with a smile and spoke. I'm a little bit curious about your research. If you don't mind, please come and visit me sometime. Ian, still in shock, hurriedly nodded his head repeatedly and replied, It would be an honor, sir. Would it be all right if we exchanged contacts? Of course, Lucian answered and gave the man his number, along with the address of his bookstore. Thank you, Mr. Lucian. I'll definitely visit you as soon as possible. Good. Now if you'll excuse me, I still have some matters to discuss with Estria. Why, yes. Please take care. Ian responded excitedly with a bow. The few mages that stayed behind watched the entire ordeal in confusion and began to whisper amongst themselves. Tisk, he's going to end up wasting the high mages' time as well. Mr. Lucian is too nice. Another mage sighed in reply. Lucian didn't care about their opinion, he instead made his way to the window on the other side of the floor. He watched the various mages slowly take their leave in groups of two and three, with a few minutes in between each exit. After the final group left, Estria, who was the organizer of the meeting, came back. She glanced at Lucian with a sweet smile, her hazel eyes seemed to shine as she looked at him. Well then, Mr. Lucian, please follow me. Lucian shook his head and replied, I thought I told you to call me Lucian. You did? Estria answered with feigned ignorance. She then led him to her bedroom, which was surprisingly the same as last time. So the whole house changes, except for the master bedroom? Estria gave him a mysterious smile and replied, Something like that. Hmm. Lucian nodded and settled down on the couch. T. I'd like that, thank you. Chapter 28 a good night. Estria came back with the tea and placed it on the table before Lucian. He glanced at it and asked, Green tea. Yes, same as last time. I hope you don't mind. Not at all. Besides, anything is bound to taste better with a pleasant company. Lucian answered with a smile. Estria covered her mouth and chuckled. That was very cheesy. Lucian shrugged in reply. I'm only saying the truth. I'm sure you are. I suppose you only tell the truth to all the girls you meet. What can I say? I'm an honest man, Lucian answered and took a sip of his tea. The sweetness lingered in his mouth for a few seconds as he savored the taste. The duo continued with their lighthearted flirting for a while before Estria steered the conversation toward the main topic. So, Darius? She asked before gently placing the empty teacup on the table. Yes, not a very pleasant visit. Quite the rude customer, I must say. Lucian joked, to which Estria laughed and shook her head. I wouldn't expect anything less. He's not very famed for his manners. Yes, I figured. You mentioned something about him being on the wanted list of the council. Estria leaned back on the couch and crossed her legs, assuming a more comfortable position before she spoke. That's what I know. I'm not very familiar with the details, but if I'm not mistaken, it had something to do with him attacking a small mountain village up north. Oh! Lucian frowned. He had a group of like-minded vampires that followed him. 
They preach something about the New World Order and how the fantastical side of the world should be the one to rule publicly. So basically, the opposite of everything that the Council is working for? Yes, Darius and his little group were notorious a few years back. They crossed the line, however, with the Mountain Village incident. That's when the Council increased the resources spent on hunting them. Eventually, only Darius was left, and not much was heard about him until now, that is. I see. Lucian nodded and refrained from asking more about the Mountain Village attack. He had a feeling he would not like to know the exact details. Still, it is quite strange how he managed to go unnoticed for all these years right under their noses, Estria mumbled out loud. Perhaps he wasn't hiding here in Holden? That's a possibility, but I doubt it. Intrigued, Lucian couldn't help but ask, Oh, why do you think so? Well, Holden is a special place. Even with its relatively small size, the number of mages and magical beings that exist here is far larger than normal. This wasn't always the case, though. Hmm, and what does that have to do with Darius? Simple, it's easier for him to hide here rather than elsewhere. There are a lot of unknown things lurking beneath Holden's surface. Lucian frowned at her reply, but did not interrupt, and instead waited for her to continue. There's a reason why the Council's branch here doesn't care much about us rogues. They have bigger things to worry about. Some of the older mages say that an ancient devil was sealed under the city, while others believe it's been blessed. Some even think that there's a treasure to be found. And what do you believe? Lucian asked. Estria fell silent for a few seconds as she raised her head and glanced at the ceiling. What do I believe? That's hard to say. I do think that things are not as simple as they seem. They seldom are. Estria then turned her gaze toward Lucian. Her sharp hazel eyes seemed to be able to look right through him. The density of mana in Holden has also been steadily increasing for the past couple of decades. So who knows? Perhaps there really is a treasure waiting to be found. Lucian tried to maintain an unconcerned expression on his face. He shrugged and replied, Maybe? Inwardly, however, his mind was in turmoil. Lucian did not know why he instantly thought of that terrifying entity in the astral plane when Estria talked about an ancient devil being sealed below the city. Trying not to sound too ignorant, Lucian asked carefully, When exactly did you say the mana density started to grow? Shaking her head, Estria answered, I'm not sure. I only heard about it from my father. Bless his soul. Something about a change 20-something years ago that made the mana grow. Most of the mages don't care much for that, calling it a happy side effect. Still, the question remains, a side effect of what? Lucian nodded his head to indicate his understanding. Inside, though his heart skipped a beat. He didn't know if he was reading too much into it, but his grandpa came to Holden 23 years ago to be exact. The coincidences just seemed to continue. The increase in mana density when he came, the mysterious entity sealed underneath the astral plane, and then there was the book he left him in the center of it all. Just what did you hide from me, Grandpa? Are you all right? Estria's voice broke him from his chain of thoughts. Ah, uh, yes. I just have a lot on my mind. Lucian responded with a smile. Well, it is getting late. Taking the hint, Lucian stood up to take his leave. Indeed, I'll be on my way then. Please, let me send you off again, Estria spoke. I'm not sure I'll find any cabs at this hour, so I'll be grateful if you do. Oh, it's my pleasure. Estria then led Lucian to the teleportation room and motioned for him to get inside. He instead turned to face her. Lucian was a little bit taller than the mature lady, forcing her to slightly raise her head to look at him. I forgot to ask, I still need to use your training ground if that's all right? No problem. I'll be a bit busy tomorrow, so I won't be here, but the day after tomorrow should be all right. Nodding, Lucian thanked her and added, Well? Confused, Estria tilted her head in confusion. Well, what? Where's my kiss goodbye? He asked with a mischievous grin. Estria rolled her eyes and chuckled. You're going to need to make some more effort than that, Mr. Lucian. She said while sarcastically adding the Mr. part. Still, Estria moved closer to him and gently cupped his face between her hands. She closed her eyes and angled her face to his. Lucian met her halfway through until their lips locked. The kiss was small, gentle, and very meaningful. 
Before it could escalate to anything further, Estria quickly broke away and pushed Lucian to the middle of the teleportation circle. A faint blush was visible on her face as she spoke. Goodbye, Mr. Lucian. And with those final words, Lucian disappeared only to find himself standing next to his bookstore door. His lips curved upwards into a wide grin as he fumbled for his keys. The sweet smell of her perfume still lingered in his nose as his hand subconsciously reached out for the light switch to his right. Tonight is a good night. Chapter 29. Acting the Part The next day was spent as usual. A few regular customers dropped by, with a couple of new ones who stumbled upon the bookstore by chance. Slowly but surely, Lucian's old bookstore was gaining traffic. Although it was still nowhere near enough to pay for his living expenses, Lucian was getting there. He decided to take a break from studying magic and clear his mind with some of his old favorite fantasy novels. Lucian continued like that all the way until evening. He even forced himself to cook lunch, an achievement he was quite proud of. Moon also got to enjoy a lavish meal with chicken and tuna. The evening hue of the sun painted the old bookstore floor orange. Lucian placed the novel in his hands on the counter and raised his eyes to look at his surroundings. The floating mana particles still looked as pretty as always. They glimmered like ethereal gems in the air, giving off a mystical vibe. A comfortable smile slowly drew across his face as he lost himself in the serene scene. Memories of the past flashed through his mind. Every corner of the bookstore had a history. His grandpa wasn't a big fan of calling for help. Whenever something broke down, he would grab his tools and fix it, all the while lecturing him about how a man should know how to work with his hands. It builds character, Lucian muttered his old pop's favorite phrase with a chuckle. A long sigh quickly followed. The past month was not easy. Although Lucian tried to move on and buried himself in studying magic, it was mostly an escape from the reality that he tried to avoid. His old pop was gone. Lucian slowly lowered his head to the counter and closed his eyes. It was one of those days. As if sensing his mood, Moon, who was seated by the entrance, ran up to him and tried to snuggle close to his face. Another sigh escaped Lucian's lips as he forced his head up. His hand subconsciously reached out to stroke Moon's soft fur. It's just too lonely without him, you know? He said to Moon, who titled her head puzzledly. Lucian didn't mind the confused expression on her face since he mostly wanted to clear out his chest and continued. I still feel like I'll see him behind the counter whenever I open the door. Or he'll be sitting in the living room reading the paper and complaining about the state of the world. Lucian shook his head and placed Moon on his lap. But he's not. He's gone, and this place is all I have left. The entrance bells chimed and pulled him out of his nostalgic mood. Lucian quickly donned a professional smile and welcomed his new customers. Welcome. Night came. Lucian was getting ready to close the shop when a special guest came to visit. He saw the tiny floating mana strands react to the newcomer, which foretold of his identity as a mage. Lucian had a general idea of who it was. He waved his hand and used Immer to open the bookstore door. Ian's figure was seen standing outside with a surprised expression. He hastily gave a deep bow to Lucian, who in turn invited him in. Come on in. The day passed painfully slow for Ian. Ever since he got the invitation to visit the mysterious high mage yesterday, his mind was not able to calm down. Ian kept thinking of various possibilities and dangers he could face, yet his curiosity won over. He didn't care, as long as he found his answers. Everyone called him crazy, but he knew that the strange language was magical. And if proving that meant heading into the devil's jaw, then that's exactly what he will do. It took Ian the entire day mostly mentally preparing himself. All of that, however, proved to be useless once he found himself standing before the old bookstore. His heart thumped loudly in his chest. He quickly took a few deep breaths and prepared himself when the door suddenly opened. Ian froze for a second before he quickly bowed. The mysterious mage spoke in an inviting tone. Come on in. The second Ian took his first step inside the bookstore, he felt an unknown force hindering his ability to use mana. It was as if a giant mountain was bearing down on his back. It felt suffocating almost. Ian quickly released his control over the mana, which alleviated the feeling slightly, making it a bit more bearable. 
He slowly walked inside. The door closed behind him. Ian's eyes curiously glanced at the bookshelves to his left and right as he made his way toward the counter. It looks like a normal bookstore, but I can't be fooled. Just that oppressive aura is proof enough that it's anything but normal. Please sit down. The mysterious mage waved his hand again, dragging a small chair from near one of the shelves behind Ian. Thank you. Ian, was it? The enigmatic mage asked, to which he hurriedly nodded. Yes, it's a pleasure to officially meet you, Sir Wood. Oh, please. Lucian is fine. Ian hesitated before he ultimately answered with a nod. The mysterious mage seemed pleased with his response as his lips curved slightly upwards into a small smile. A eh, about the paper. Ian was almost unable to contain his excitement. He stuttered as he spoke. Lucian chuckled in reply and answered. Calm down. Isn't a mage supposed to keep his calm at all times? Embarrassed, Ian hurriedly lowered his head in shame. I'm sorry. I let my curiosity get the best of me. Lucian waved his hand dismissively and continued. It's all right, I don't mind. If anything, your dedication to unraveling the unknown is commendable. Ian's eyes lit up at the sudden praise. Everyone mocked him for not following the already paved way of magic. They ridiculed him saying he was just wasting his time and that he would never find anything, yet the mysterious mage in front of him seemed to think otherwise. His heart felt warm as he hurriedly lowered his head to express his gratitude. It may have been a simple praise, but to Ian, it meant the world. Thank you. Lucian smiled in satisfaction and added, While it's good striving for the unknown, one must not let his emotions cloud his judgment. A mage must always remain rational. Ian quickly nodded and replied, Yes, thank you for your teachings. I think that should be enough to build an image of a mysterious mage in his eyes. Lucian inwardly mumbled. He had no intentions of clearing the misunderstanding regarding his identity. For now, that acted as a shield almost against all of the big factions. That was something Lucian did not want to lose. And so, the first step in maintaining his mysterious identity was to act the part. Something Lucian was trying to do with Ian. Now, though... How do I handle the situation with the spell? He contemplated inwardly. Chapter 30. An Old Spell Would you like to drink something? Tea or perhaps coffee? Tea would be lovely, thank you. Ian answered with a smile. Lucian nodded and was about to stand up when a sudden breeze made him halt. His eyes widened ever so slightly as a hand as pale as a corpse appeared out of thin air. The hand placed an empty plate before him and Ian before it disappeared once again. The young mage was so shocked he almost tumbled to the floor, yet he quickly tried to maintain his calm once he saw that the high mage was not alarmed. Lucian, on the other hand, was anything but calm. His mind was swirling in shock. That hand must have been the fairy, he inwardly noted. Various thoughts ran through his head as the fairy looked different from what he read. Although he only managed to see the fairy's hand, that was enough to overturn the image that formed in his mind. The hand was too pale, and the most ridiculous fact was that the fairy seemed to be wearing a suit. Is it your house fairy, Sir Lucian? Ian asked hesitantly. He even reverted to using honorifics. Lucian didn't mind and instead gave him an enigmatic smile. In truth, even he was not sure if the fairy could be considered his, which was why he did not give a direct reply. To Ian, however, Lucian's smile was one of confirmation. This served to further solidify the image he had of Lucian as that of a mysterious high mage in his heart. A few seconds later, the fairy reappeared. This time the duo were both able to see it clearly as it did not hide, a short pale fairy with long white hair and piercing gray eyes. The little fairy donned a butler suit. In its hands were two cups of tea. It gently placed them on the empty plates before Lucian and Ian before it gave them a flawless bow and disappeared. Ian's eyes were wide in shock. That fairy was nothing like the ones he learned about. Lucian tried to maintain his indifferent attitude, yet he couldn't help himself and thanked the fairy. Thank you. Ian, who was still surprised by its appearance, hurriedly thanked the fairy as well. Tea, thank you. Lucian glanced at the tea before him and slowly brought it to his mouth. His eyes, on the other hand, were carefully studying Ian, who took a sip from his cup. Great tea. 
Lucian smiled and tried it himself. The green tea was hot and extremely sweet. It caused him to raise his brows in surprise. Isn't this the tea Astria likes to serve me? Lucian inwardly wondered how the fairy was able to tell that he liked it. His eyes subconsciously glanced in the direction where it disappeared before he turned his attention back to Ian. Now was not the time. The duo engaged in light chatter, with Ian doing most of the talking. He was a surprisingly easygoing young man. Once he felt comfortable enough, Ian began to overshare, something Lucian didn't mind at all and was instead quite grateful for. Thanks to that, Lucian was able to understand a few things that were confusing him. The main one was how mages were classified. According to Ian, one was considered a novice mage of the bronze rank when they managed to sense the presence of mana and learned their first spell to control it. This was Ian's rank. To upgrade to the silver rank, a mage must learn a total of two beginner spells, and to go from silver to the gold rank, they must earn a total of three. It was fairly simple for the novice rank, as beginner spells were not considered very hard, nor were they very useful. To upgrade, to the apprentice level, on the other hand, a mage must master one apprentice level spell for the bronze rank, two for silver, and three for gold. Now the thing with the system was that it was the council and the main families that classified the spells. These two forces held a monopoly over almost all known spells and the methods of learning them. This made it hard for the rogues to grow, which was one of the main reasons a lot of groups held periodic meetings where they shared their learnings. All of the spells, the council and main families approved of were considered orthodox and anything they didn't was unorthodox and deemed evil. It was a simple system where they controlled what was considered normal and what was not. Now, if that was the truth, and if the unorthodox spells were actually dangerous was something Lucian did not know yet. And so, with the pressure of the council and the main families, not many people dared pursue the unorthodox spells fearing the unknown dangers they held. As for the ranks above Apprentice, Ian had no idea about them. Mr. Lucian, about this spell. Ian suddenly spoke as he brought out the old paper from his bag and gently placed it on the counter. Lucian carefully used Immer to bring the paper closer to him. A frown quickly made its way across his face as he asked, Where did you find this? Ian lowered his gaze and scratched the back of his head before he hesitantly replied, I bought it from the Mage Market down in Bronx Street. Mage Market? Lucian subconsciously asked, to which Ian answered, Ah, uh, yes. I forgot that you just came to Holden not long ago. Below Bronx Street is where the Mage Market is situated. If you'd like, I can take you there. Sure, I'll let you know when I'm free. Ian happily nodded before he once again motioned at the yellowish paper. W as I actually scammed Mr. Lucian. Lucian hesitated for a second. A part of him wanted to lie to keep the spell for himself. The magical book was the last and most important thing his grandfather left him. Lucian was sure that the spell on that paper was somewhat related to it. Yet one look at the poor young man seated across from him made him sigh inwardly. The first words he stumbled across when he found the magical book flashed through his mind. Be aware, be good. I believe it is indeed an old spell, though I myself am not sure what type of spell it is exactly. Lucian decided to answer honestly. Ian's eyes lit up at the revelation. I was right. A small smile drew across Lucian's face as he nodded. Yes, but I would very careful if I was you. Ian hastily nodded in understanding. Yes, if the council was to get wind of this, I'm not sure if they would simply remain idle. Lucian nodded before adding, which is why it's best if you keep the knowledge of this being an ancient spell hidden. Ian frowned for a second his eyes darted between the old yellowish paper and Lucian's face for a few seconds before he hesitantly asked, Can I ask you, Mr. Lucian, to help me keep it safe? Ah. Uh. Chapter 31. The Naive Mage. Surprised at the sudden request, Lucian couldn't help but blurt out, Ah. Uh. Ian scratched his head in embarrassment before he replied, now that I am sure of the value of the paper, I'm afraid I don't have the capabilities to protect it and protect myself from the harm it may bring. Lucian mentally retorted, weren't you going about in the meetings, saying how it must be an ancient spell? Now that it's confirmed you throw it at me. Lucian was very confused by Ian's change in attitude. 
I am ashamed to admit that I don't have any close friends, not to mention mages that I could confide in the secret. Although there's nothing I'd love more than to study that spell, I'm afraid my current level is too lacking for that. So, Mr. Lucian, please hold on to it for me. Ian shamelessly asked with his head bowed and continued. With Mr. Lucian's level, I'm sure that spells like these are not that rare to you. But for me, it represents a shining beacon of hope. Frowning Lucian stared at the young, but very naive mage and spoke. Ian, although we've seen each other a few times in the past hermit meetings, we were still practically strangers. What you are doing now is entrusting me, someone, you barely know with your shining beacon of hope. Don't you think that's quite naive of you? Although Lucian wanted to keep the spell, he still felt the need to teach this young mage a lesson. He still didn't know what sort of society the magic world was, but Lucian doubted it was a place for the gullible and trusting. Then again, Lucian found himself growing fond of the young mage. In just the past couple of hours, they've been talking, he enjoyed his company. His innocent way of thinking and his oversharing made Lucian feel almost like an older brother. I know it sounds strange, but I believe this is my best bet. Although I can keep the paper as I've been doing before, I do not want to risk it now that I know of its value. Besides, I trust you, Mr. Lucian. A chuckle escaped Lucian's lips as he shook his head. Again, you're too trusting. Just because we've talked for a little bit, shared some tea, and you already trust me. Embarrassed, Ian scratched the back of his head while Lucian continued with his lecture. As I said, as a mage, you should always be rational. While it's good to follow your emotions on certain matters, but when it comes to things like this. Lucian paused and motioned for the floating paper before he continued. It's best to be smart about it. I understand. Thank you for your teachings, Mr. Lucian. And stop calling me Mr. Just Lucian is fine. A small smile drew across Ian's face as he nodded in understanding. Then, Lucian. About the spell. Lucian rolled his eyes and let out a sigh before he answered. I'll hold on to it for you this time. Thank you. Ian replied with a beaming smile. Why is this kid so happy? If anything, it's you who is doing me a favor. Lucian sighed inwardly. Still, he couldn't help but get infected by Ian's cheerful mood as a smile subconsciously stretched across his face. Well, it's getting late and I should probably head back home, Ian said and suddenly stood up. Lucian nodded and walked him to the entrance. Be careful on your way back. And remember what I've told you. Yes, a mage must always be rational. Lucian chuckled and sent the young mage away. With Ian gone, he quickly closed the bookstore for the day as it was already quite late. His eyes subconsciously glanced in the direction where the fairy had appeared earlier. The two cups of tea, along with the plates, were already cleared from the counter. How convenient. Lucian mumbled before he made his way to the kitchen upstairs where he filled a plate full of cookies and added a big glass of milk. Moon was lazing around in the living room and glanced at him for a second before she turned away and continued ignoring him. Once downstairs, Lucian placed the plate of cookies and the glass of milk on the counter. He then turned his gaze around the bookstore in an attempt to spot the fairy, yet to no avail. As always, thank you for your hard work. I hope you enjoy the cookies. Lucian spoke and grabbed the old yellowish paper that Ian left before he retired upstairs for the night. As soon as he left, a small figure wearing a butler suit appeared before the counter. It glanced at the cookies and milk before it turned its head in the direction of the stairs. A faint, almost unnoticeable smile drew across its face. Upstairs, Lucian got ready for bed. He first changed out of his clothes and donned his pajamas. After brushing his teeth, Lucian walked back to his room. He first moved the window blinds ever so slightly as he scanned the street below and made sure nothing seemed out of the ordinary. After that, Lucian grabbed the old spell that Ian left and used Immer to bring the magical book next to him. He first studied the flow of mana, which was surprisingly more complicated than he expected. Lucian spent a few minutes trying to understand it, but something felt wrong. It was almost as if a part of the spell was missing, this made it significantly harder to learn or master it. A frown overtook his face as he realized that with just the paper, it would be nigh impossible to learn the spell. Letting out a sigh, 
Lucian opened the mysterious book his grandpa left him and gently placed the old spell inside. No matter, I'll start looking for it tomorrow. Maybe I'll even find the full version inside, Lucian mumbled to himself with a sigh. It was already too late, and he was feeling quite sleepy, so he carefully placed the magical book next to him on one side of the bed before he snuggled under the blankets. Just as he got comfortable in his position and was ready to sleep, the sounds of Moon scratching the door in an attempt to enter the bedroom made him sigh. He used Immer to open the door and glanced at the cat that remained standing there staring at him. Well, aren't you coming? To his surprise, Moon turned around to the living room, completely ignoring him. Huh. With another sigh, Lucian shook his head and turned off the lights. Chapter 32 The Trace the next morning, Lucian went about his business as usual. He didn't forget to thank the Invisible Fairy for its hard work as it even managed to clean and iron his laundry, something he was still amazed about. Lucian didn't consider himself to be a heavy sleeper, but even so, he failed to catch a glimpse of the fairy. Still, considering it refused to show itself before him, Lucian decided to leave the matter to rest for now. After eating breakfast, Lucian changed his clothes to leave the bookstore a bit earlier in the morning. He was running low on groceries, and so a trip to the local supermarket was required. The weather outside looked cloudy and quite gloomy, so Lucian donned his heavy coat and top hat to cover his head. Before leaving, he turned to glance at Moon who was lazing on top of the counter and spoke. Behave. I'll be right back and I'll bring you back some snacks. Moon's ears perked up at the mention of snacks, but she still tried to maintain her indifferent attitude. Lucian chuckled at that and locked the door behind him. The sudden cold breeze made him shiver. Damn it, why is it so cold? He grumbled and quickly made his way to the supermarket. Inside a certain forest was an old rundown mansion. The old weathered manor looked to be abandoned from the outside. After so much time, the home had discovered the company of weeds, trees, and flora. The interior, however, was well-maintained. Long red carpets were placed along the hallways, with expensive-looking furniture decorating the entire place. Still, even with the well-designed interior, a solemn, heavy mood seemed to be looming in the old manor. Two pale, lanky figures could be seen hurrying down one of the many hallways. The creatures lacked a head, and their facial features were instead on their chest. They wore no clothing and had no distinctive private parts. The figures quickly stopped when they reached an open living room with a grand piano in the middle. A strange and equally pale creature was seated there, its thin long fingers caressed the piano keys ever so gently. The bizarre creature had no eyes and no hair. Two large goat horns with strange carvings curved backward from its temples. It was dressed in an old Victorian suit, looking almost comical. The two headless monsters approached it and bowed. The creature seemed to pay them no heed as it continued to stroke the piano keys. We have picked a trace. One of the headless monsters spoke in a shrill voice. The creature's hand paused as it turned its head to the monsters, almost as if it could see them before it asked in a deep voice. Are you sure? Yes, we would never mistake the Lord's aura. The second monster was the one to reply, its voice identical to the other. Ah, uh, how long has it been? Is it truly you, my lord? The creature's voice softened as an unnatural smile stretched across its face, revealing rows of sharp obsidian teeth. A dangerous aura gathered around the creature as it covered its face. After a few seconds, the strange demon-like creature turned its head to the monsters and asked, Where was the trace from? Both monsters answered simultaneously. Holden. Meanwhile, back in Holden, Lucian was leisurely making his way back to the bookstore. The weather cleared out a bit which confused him since it was so gloomy just a couple of hours ago. Still, he wasn't complaining. With his groceries in one hand, Lucian used the other to grab his phone and dial Estria's number. After a few rings, her charming voice finally replied. Good morning. Morning, Estria. I hope I didn't wake you up. She chuckled and answered. Oh, I wish. It's been a while since I've last slept in. Busy schedule, I reckon? Yes. There have been a few disappearances on the outskirts, and so the council is cracking down on most of the unorthodox rogue groups. I see. That doesn't sound good. It isn't. But hey, 
The hermits survived two council purges, will be fine. I hope so. Well, if push comes to shove, you can always come crash in place, you know, to lay low. Lucian joked. Estria laughed and asked, Oh, and I guess you will be doing this out of the goodness of your heart, Mr. Lucian? No ulterior motives. Of course. What do you think I am, some sort of monster? Lucian answered with a feigned hurt tone. Haha, <laughs> maybe you are and this is your master plan in luring Permi into your evil lair. That sounds ridiculous, but if it'll get you to come then I'll take it. Lucian shook his head with a smile. We'll see. Well, since you are still not keen on visiting me, do you think I can drop by your training ground soon? Uh, of course. Like I told you before, you're always welcome. Will 8 p.m. tonight work for you? Can we do 9? I still have the bookstore to attend to. Sure, then I'll see you later, Mr. Lucian. Bye. Back in the bookstore, Lucian moved directly to the kitchen and placed his groceries down on the small kitchen table and was about to start putting everything in its place when a pack of cookies slipped and fell under the table. Lucian kneeled to get it when a pale hand appeared abruptly. It grabbed the pack of cookies and handed it to him. Lucian caught it and thanked the fairy subconsciously before the realization set in. He tried to stand up, only to hit his head on the table causing him to hiss in pain. Ouch! Damn it! Once he stood up, Lucian scanned his surroundings only to find no signs of the fairy. He gently patted his hand, his face wincing in pain before a sigh escaped his lips. This is not good for my heart. Lucian inwardly mumbled. He was about to resume setting his groceries only to pause in shock. They were not there anymore. His eyes darted about and he quickly moved to open the fridge door. There most of the groceries were neatly placed inside. Lucian then moved to open another cabinet where everything was already settled. But how? He couldn't help but ask. His eyes glanced at the pack of cookies in his hands before he sighed once again. Okay then, I guess more cookies for you. Chapter 33 Lightning. Later that night, Lucian closed the bookstore and made his way to Estria's place. He was lucky to stumble upon a cab driver that didn't mind driving him to that part of town. By the time he reached her house, it was already 9.10 p.m. Lucian thanked the driver and handed him his fare before he stepped out of the car and adjusted his clothes. After making sure everything was all right, Lucian straightened his back almost subconsciously and walked to the door. He didn't need to wait long before Estria opened it and greeted him with a smile and a kiss on the cheek. Lucian grinned mischievously and asked, I thought we moved on from the cheek kisses? Estria, who wore a light blue winter dress, lightly slapped his hand and answered, Oh, I guess that means no more kisses for you. She smiled and closed the door behind them. Lucian shook his head and replied, No, that's not what I meant. He then held her by one hand, the other gently caressed her face as he planted a soft kiss on her lips. Estria didn't move away and returned his kiss before she asked with a teasing smile. And who told you, you can do that? Lucian raised his brows, his lips lightly curved upwards, and replied, I don't see you moving away, Ms. Estria. Estria rolled her eyes, her smile not quite leaving her face. Well, come along then, Mr. Lucian. As much as I'd love to keep you company, I'm afraid I still have a few matters to attend to. That's a bummer. Indeed, it is. Then again, if you wanted to see me, you could have taken me out on that date you promised but forgot about. Estria casually added, causing Lucian to shift his gaze away awkwardly. Ah, uh, I didn't forget. I'm just trying to plan something special. Can't have anything less for a special lady such as yourself. His attempt at salvaging the situation seemed to work slightly as Estria rolled her eyes once again with a faint smile before she replied. Sure. Something special you say? I'll look forward to it then. The duo continued with their light-hearted conversation as Estria led Lucian to the underground training area. After going down a long flight of stairs, the duo finally reached a large open area with an elevated arena right in the middle. To the sides, a few old-school weapons were placed. Swords, axes, maces, and spears. Lucian even spotted a few bows. He turned to glance at Estria and asked, I don't recall those being there last time. Estria shook her head and answered with a shrug. They weren't. I don't pick the changes, the house spirit does. 
The house spirit, as Lucian came to understand, was what Estria called the entity that controlled the house. It was different than a house fairy, as a house spirit was in a sense the house itself, and not an independent living creature. Well, it does have an interesting case, that's for sure. Yes, tell me about it. At least it doesn't change my room, so that's good. Estria paused for a second as she scanned the training area before she added, Well, I guess I'll just leave you to it. Lucian nodded. Thank you, Estria. Don't mention it. She waved him off and then made her way upstairs. With her gone, Lucian first made his way to the weapons area. His curiosity got the best of him as he grabbed a long sword, only to be surprised by its heavy weight. He used both hands to hold the blade and carefully studied the exquisitely made runes on its hilt. Pretty, Lucian remarked before he gently placed the sword back in its place. He then moved to study the axes and then the maces and then the spears before finally the bows. All the weapons had a few things in common. Firstly, their extraordinary workmanship and the runes on their hilts. None of them, however, felt quite right in his hand so Lucian ended up putting them all back in their place. He quickly glanced at the stairs where Estria disappeared off before he moved to the middle of the arena and sat down on the ground. Lucian then carefully removed the bracelet from his hand and held it in his palms. He took a deep breath, closed his eyes, and steadied his breathing. The mana strands were almost visible to him even with his eyes closed. Lucian sensed the various location of the mana strands, which gave him a weird but interesting feeling. Lucian first started by storing two Tajajite, since the fireball spell proved itself to be quite useful once. Then he cast one Tadasa spell on the spell, which effectively stored it as well. Lucian still needed some time to cast the healing spell, so having the advantage of an instantaneous health spell in the middle of a battle was sure to be useful. This left him with two spell slots, both of which Lucian used to store Yuzum, the Lightning Bolt spell. This one was his most dangerous and unstable spell, but it was also his trump card. Its downside, however, was the long chant time and the complicated hand gestures. As he used Yuzum, the air in the underground training area turned heavy. Strands of Lucian's hair suddenly stood up as his eyes turned serious. The moment the spell was cast, he instantly closed his eyes as a bright flash of lightning flickered in the arena, momentarily dyeing the entire place in bright white light. An ear-deafening thunderclap quickly followed, yet Lucian as the caster was still somewhat protected so it did not affect him as much. He felt as if the entire underground area was shaking. Lucian then hastily glanced at his bracelet, only to pause in shock. A small crack was now clearly visible on its surface. It's damaged. He mumbled with a dumbfounded expression. Lucian was sure that if he was to add another Yuzum spell, the bracelet would simply break. What the F asterisk CK? Isn't this supposed to be a treasure? Did he scam me? In his surprise, Lucian could not help but curse as he stared at the now cracked golden bracelet. At least it's not that obvious. He muttered in an attempt to console himself. With a sigh, Lucian slowly stood up and dusted himself before he made his way upstairs. His initial excitement turned into disappointment. Chapter 34 Guests After finishing what he had initially come for, and with nothing much to do, Lucian decided to look for Estria. He made his way upstairs while humming a cheerful tone in an attempt to clear his mind from the disappointment that the bracelet gave him. His eyes would occasionally glance down at the small crack causing him to resist the urge to sigh. Once Lucian made it to the first floor, he was surprised to find Estria already there waiting for him. She held a stack of papers in her hands with a frown. Seeing that he arrived, she briefly raised her head and asked, Did you forget anything? No, I already finished what I came for, Lucian answered with a shrug. Estria nodded and replied with a chuckle. You are lucky that the basement is soundproof. I don't know what you have been doing there, but whatever it was, it certainly shook the whole house. You even got the house spirit complaining. An awkward smile hung on his face as he spoke. Ah, uh, sorry about that. I may have gone a little bit overboard. Estria waved her free hand and continued. No, no, it's fine. I only came down to see you since the house spirit informed me that you've left the basement. She then pointed at the papers in her hands and continued, 
I'm afraid our little date will have to wait. I'd offer you some tea again, but dash. Taking the hint, Lucian quickly shook his head and replied, That's all right, we'll leave it for next time. I'd like that, Estria answered with a smile. Would you mind sending me off? Please, Estria nodded and motioned for him to follow her to the teleportation room. Along the way, Lucian studied the house theme for the day. The style reminded him of that North Pamelian country Estria mentioned before. The designs on the tiles were colorful, with a combination of blue and white that complemented each other perfectly. The walls had a curved shape drawn into them, akin to that of a crescent moon that glowed with a faint golden hue. It was incredibly beautiful, and Lucian was unable to hold himself from asking. What was the name of that North Pamelian country again? Estria turned around to him with a surprised expression and spoke. You have a good eye. I didn't expect you to know where the style was from. I heard about it before, but I can't remember the name. Lucian shook his head with a smile. Merrick, that's the name. Lucian nodded and repeated the name to himself, committing it to memory. Merrick. The duo quickly reached the teleportation room. Without asking, Estria planted a sweet kiss on Lucian's lips and waved him off with a smile. I'll be seeing you, Mr. Lucian. I hope so, Lucian answered with a smile as the light overtook him for a second. The next he was already standing by the bookstore entrance. His eyes quickly scanned his surroundings to see if anyone saw him. Luckily, the street was deserted, especially this late in the night. Lucian began humming the same cheerful tone, his mood turned for the better after his brief encounter with Estria. He rummaged for his keys in his pockets and opened the door. The light was automatically switched on before he could reach out for the light switch, causing him to quickly turn his gaze to that direction in surprise. He barely managed to make out the vague outline of a pale arm before it disappeared completely. That's not good for my heart, Lucian inwardly sighed. Good evening. He called out to the house fairy, not expecting a reply. Moon was nowhere to be seen, so he assumed she was lazing about upstairs. Lucian took off his coat and made his way upstairs. The light turned off on the first floor once he left. Although scary, that's still very handy. On the second floor, Moon greeted him with a meow as she rubbed her head on his leg. Well, someone's in a good mood. Lucian smiled and scratched her head and back before he opened the door to his bedroom with Immer. Moon quickly followed after him and took her place on the bed. Lucian didn't mind and quickly changed his clothes. He then moved to brush his teeth and came back to slip under the blankets. The magical book floated from under the bed into his hand as Lucian began to review the spells he had learned. After doing that, he spent the next hour trying to find a match for the spell Ian left him, yet to no avail. A yawn escaped his mouth as he grabbed his phone to check the time. It's ten already. I'll just continue tomorrow. He used Immer to send the book over to the desk by the window and turned off the lights. Moon moved over to snuggle closer to him, which caused his lips to curve upwards. Good night, Moon. Good night, Fairy Butler. At 2 a.m., two headless lanky figures emerged out of the shadows in a dark alley. Their eyes were located where their nipples were supposed to be. The strange creatures walked out of the alley and glanced at the dark bookstore across the street. It's there. It's there. They both spoke simultaneously. The Trace. The Lord. The monster to the left spoke. Let's go greet the Lord. The other hesitated and replied, but our orders were to scout the area first and report back. What are you afraid of? We don't need to follow the orders of the bishop. The only one that can command us is the Lord. The bishop will be angry. Oomph. The monster ignored its companion and made his way to the bookstore. After a brief moment of hesitation, the second monster chose to follow as well. The duo moved swiftly and in but a second they were already standing in front of the bookstore. It is the Lord's aura. We found him. The monsters were unable to control their expression. Their faces morphed into ones full of excitement and devotion. They were about to take a step forward when the bookstore door silently opened, revealing abyssal darkness inside. The two monsters took that as an invitation and quickly walked in. The door closed behind them with a thud. A distance away from the bookstore, two masked figures were standing on top of a rooftop keeping watch. Did you see that? One of the figures suddenly asked, See what? The door, 
It suddenly opened by itself. Are you sure? Yes, but nothing was there. It only opened for a couple of seconds and then closed. I don't know why, but it gave me goosebumps. Continue monitoring it and see if anything shows up. The second masked individual ordered. Yes, sir. Chapter 35, The Little Butler. Inside the bookstore, two strange headless monsters squeezed in between the shelves. The faces on their chests were morphed into ones full of crazed devotion as they sensed the heavy aura looming inside. They only took a few steps before a short pale fairy, dressed in a butler's suit, appeared before them. The monsters paused and glanced at the small fairy in confusion. The Lord? One of them asked. The other quickly replied. No, it's missing the Lord's aura. Kill? Kill. Their expressions quickly turned ferocious as both monsters disappeared from their place and reappeared behind and in front of the fairy respectively. Obsidian sharp claws extended from the monster's fingers as they aimed to maim the butler fairy. Before their attacks could reach it, however, a strange force extended out from the fairy's body paralyzing the monsters in their place. Their claws stopped mere millimeters away from the fairy's face and neck. The small butler's sharp gray eyes seemed to shine momentarily, causing an inconceivable pressure to descend on the monsters. Their bodies planted to the ground with a loud thud, yet surprisingly the noise didn't seem to go far as an invisible shield appeared and surrounded the trio. The fairy snapped its fingers and the two creatures teleported closer to the door. It slowly approached them, causing the monsters to shiver subconsciously. An emotion they had long since forgotten resurfaced. Fear. The fairy paused a step before them. Its gray eyes looked especially sharp in the darkness. It opened its mouth and spoke in a gentle voice, akin to that of a gentle summer breeze. The Lord is resting. If you interrupt his sleep, you die. The two monsters dared not rebuke the fairy's words. They simply lay there in silence waiting for it to continue speaking. Did the Lord summon you? The fairy asked in a tone that demanded an answer. One of the monsters shivered and replied, The Bishop Dash. Before he could finish, the small fairy snapped its fingers, causing the monster's arm to be ripped off its body. Dark red blood spurted out, only to be stopped by the fairy as it gathered it all into a floating sphere. The monster tried to scream in pain, only to find its voice gone. I said, Did the Lord summon you? The fairy asked again. This time its cold gaze fell on the second monster. It quickly replied, No, we came looking for the Lord. As soon as he finished, both of his arms were forcefully ripped off its body. The floating sphere of blood grew in size as the fairy gathered every drop. The monster was unable to cry out in pain, either. The Lord didn't summon you, and yet you still came to look for him. Leave one leg behind and disappear from my sight. The fairy ordered. The monster with only one arm left only hesitated for a split second before it decisively tore off one of his legs. The second one used some sort of magic as a dark shadowy blade materialized out of thin air and cut his leg clean off. The two monsters dared not linger any longer. The second their bodies regained strength, the duo teleported out of the bookstore. The fairy then blasted both of their legs in a puff of red blood, which further grew the blood sphere. The sphere began to rotate in midair as the fairy glanced at it with hunger in its eyes. Meow. Moon's sudden call caused the fairy to roll its eyes as it turned to glance at the cat that was sitting on top of the counter. Moon's piercing green eyes locked on the fairy as lazily licked its paws. The fairy hesitated for a second. It then waved its hand causing a small part of the sphere to detach and fly over to Moon, who greedily opened her mouth and swallowed it whole. The fairy shook its head and turned to what was left. Its mouth opened unnaturally wide, causing the sphere to fly straight into it. A satisfied expression hung on its face before it disappeared as silence once again reigned in the old bookstore. Outside, the two monsters reappeared in a distant dark alley. Their bodies were visibly paler and their auras weaker, yet surprisingly all of their limbs were intact. One of the monsters asked, Who was that? Too strong, I don't know. The Lord's servant? Maybe. The Lord did not summon us. Are we no longer needed? No longer useful? What to do? The second monster asked. Prove our worth to the Lord. The first monster answered. How? Kill the bugs spying on the Lord. 
The second monster hesitated before it replied. The bishop will be angry. The first monster harumphed and was about to ignore his companion. The Lord might get angry. This caused him to pause as he slowly turned to glance at the second monster with an inquiring look. What do you mean? The Lord must surely know they are there, yet he left them unharmed. After a few seconds of silent contemplation, the first monster silently replied, Hmm, let's go back. The next morning, Lucian woke up in a good mood. He took a quick shower, brushed his teeth, and made some breakfast for both himself and Moon. He also did not forget to take the plate of cookies and glass of milk downstairs for the fairy. This time, he didn't wait to see if the fairy will appear and instead left directly for the second floor. After eating his breakfast, he donned a cream-colored suit and made his way downstairs to open the bookstore for business. The glass of milk and plate of cookies had already disappeared, which brought a smile to Lucian's face. The day proceeded smoothly. It was a surprisingly busy one as well. Quite a few customers ended up buying the books, and a few regulars brought back the ones they loaned. I need to restock soon, Lucian inwardly mumbled. He turned his old PC on and was checking through the store emails when the bells chimed making him raise his head. Welcome, uh, Anna. Welcome back. The lively young girl walked in with a smile. The second she did, however, the smile quickly fell off her face as she turned pale. The sudden change surprised Lucian. His eyes were subconsciously drawn to the tiny mana particles that surrounded Anna. He was about to ask when the particles stopped moving and continued floating about aimlessly. Anna, you. The young girl raised her head to glance at him in a mixture of shock and awe. Mr. Lucian, you're a mage? Chapter 36, A New Mage Lucian moved to the door and locked it. He then proceeded to lower the window blinds before he made his way behind the counter. He glanced at Anna who was seated on a small chair in front of it and asked, Would you like to drink something? Tea, coffee? Just water, please. Lucian nodded and was about to head upstairs when the butler fairy appeared by the side with two glasses of water. It then gently placed them before the duo and gave a deep bow before it disappeared. Lucian, who started to get used to the fairy's sudden entrances, was not alarmed. Anna, on the other hand, gasped loudly and quickly placed her hand over her mouth. Thank you, said Lucian. T, thank you. Anna quickly followed after him. The entire scene made him chuckle inwardly as it was almost the same as when Ian came to visit. What was that, Mr. Lucian? Anna couldn't help but ask with gleaming eyes. Lucian leaned back on his chair and replied with a faint smile. That's a house fairy. A house fairy? She asked again, to which Lucian simply nodded and refrained from elaborating. Anna hesitated for a second before she reached out for the cup of water. After a few seconds, she finally mustered the courage to ask. So you are a mage, right, Mr. Lucian? What do you think? Lucine smiled in reply. I can't believe it! So the oppressive aura in here is from you? Is that why I can't use circulated my mana? She asked. Lucian maintained his enigmatic smile, causing Anna to take his silence as that of confirmation. Lucian, however, was just as confused as she was. Oppressive aura? What the hell is that? He inwardly mumbled. Changing the subject, Lucian quickly asked, When did you become a mage? It happened on my trip to the northern mountains. I met a wandering mage who said something about me having the potential to grow to a high mage. At first, I thought he was just a random crazy guy, but then he summoned a giant horned wolf in front of my eyes. Anna explained with glimmering eyes, it seemed like the entire scene had a great impact on her. Some sort of summoning spell? Or maybe an illusion? Lucian noted inwardly. He left me with a simple spell and asked me to learn it before he disappeared. I did, but he never came again after that. I ended up prolonging my trip by a few more days, yet the result was the same with no signs of the man. What did he look like? Well-trimmed black beard, tan skin, dark brown eyes, and a little bit above average features? He was probably about your height, Mr. Lucian. Does he sound familiar? Lucian shook his head and answered. I don't think so. I see. Anna answered with a tinge of regret in her voice. Did you catch his name? Shaking her head, Anna replied with a frown. No, he told me that I wasn't ready when I asked. That's weird. Trying to change the subject, Lucian asked. About that spell, you said you learned. 
Do you mind showing me? Uh, of course. No problem. Anna replied excitedly before she paused and added, It's just that with the aura in here, it's hard for me to use my mana, as I said. If possible, please recall it. Ah, uh, just the spell instructions are fine. Lucian quickly replied. He had no idea what aura she was talking about since he felt nothing. Is it the house fairies doing? Or is it something else? He wondered. Oh, of course. Saying that Anna opened her bag and brought out a small normal notebook and handed it to Lucian. He nodded and opened the first and only page inside. Instructions on how to sense the surrounding mana were recorded on it, along with the flow one should follow, before finally, the incantation which was written in normal language. Seeing that, Lucian was a little bit disappointed since the spell was a normal summoning one. Unlike the one Ian had left him, or the ones he had in his book. So, it's a summoning spell. He mumbled out loud to which Anna nodded and replied, Yes, I came here to check if I can find any books with similar drawings, she said while pointing at the bizarre drawing of the flow of mana. Although the entire spell was not very complicated compared to the likes of Yuzum and Tajajite, it was still not something a complete beginner could easily master. Thinking about that, Lucian curiously glanced at Anna who still had a beaming smile on her face as she looked at him excitedly. Lucian shook his head and answered, I'm afraid I don't keep such books in here. Ah, uh, yes, that makes sense, Anna answered with a nod. Silent quickly descended as Lucian lowered his head to study the new spell. He was quite curious about it and wanted to try it, yet stopped himself since Anna was present. He did not want to embarrass himself. So, Mr. Lucian, I'm sorry for asking so many questions, but it's really hard to contain my excitement now that I know magic is real and that the owner of my favorite bookstore is a mage himself. Haha, <laughs> it's all right. Ask away. I'll try to answer your questions to the best of my knowledge, Lucian replied with a chuckle. Great. First of all, is there some sort of secret hidden world for mages? You know, kind of like the movies. Oh, and what about magical creatures? I mean, I suppose my summon can be counted as one, but what about other magical creatures? Oh, and monsters. Do they exist? What else, Dash? Slow down, I'm not going anywhere. Ask one question at a time. Embarrassed, Anna scratched the back of her head and replied, Sorry, I got too excited. It's fine, Lucian answered with a smile. The duo continued with their conversation with Anna asking all sorts of questions. There came a couple of times when she asked Lucian something he had no idea about. Still, he managed to masterfully divert her question away and gave a vague answer. After a couple of hours, Anna had to leave for work leaving Lucian behind with a copy of the summoning spell. He was quite excited to try it, but before he did, Lucian grabbed his phone and called Estria. The phone rang for a couple of seconds before she replied. Oh, if it isn't Mr. Lucian. Finally calling me about that date. She asked in a teasing tone. Lucian awkwardly winced and replied. Ha ha dash. Estria interrupted him before he could continue. I'm just kidding. To what do I owe the pleasure? Is it possible for me to bring a new mage to the next meeting? Oh, is it your friend or perhaps an apprentice? Estria asked without hiding her curiosity. It's a customer that ended up stumbling across who I believe is a rogue mage. He taught her a spell and disappeared. Her. She asked, causing Lucian to feel a sudden chill for some reason. Uh, is that a problem? No, not at all. Please, do bring her in next time you come. Great. Thank you, Estria. Hmm, I already told you the best way to thank me. Of course, and I didn't forget, I'm just trying to find something special. Sure. Chapter 37. The Lord. The day proceeded smoothly after that. Lucian ended up ordering a few books that needed to be restocked from the usual places his grandpa got them. He then used posted a few pictures to the bookstore's social media pages in an attempt at drawing more traffic. A few customers dropped by after Anna left, and by the time it was closing hours, Lucian locked the door and drew the blinds before he grabbed the instructions of the spell left behind by Anna. He was unable to hold back his excitement any longer. Lucian quickly settled in the chair behind the counter and closed his eyes in an attempt to follow the instructions. Although he was able to see the mana particles, 
Lucian was curious if he would be able to sense them. To his surprise, however, he couldn't. Without the visual aid, Lucian found it impossible to draw the mana particles to his body. A frown quickly drew across his face as he opened his eyes. That's weird, he mumbled to himself. Moon was sitting by his side with a strange look on her face as she watched the entire ordeal. Lucian tried it a couple more times, yet the result was always the same. Even when he tried to follow the instructions, nothing happened. He quickly mumbled the incantation for Tajajite and snapped his finger, causing a small flame to appear. I can still use magic normally, he muttered and snapped his fingers again, making the flame disappear before he continued. But why can't I use this one, though? His hand subconsciously moved to Pet Moon, who didn't mind. Lucian then stood up and ran upstairs to bring the magical book using Immer, along with Ian's spell before he made his way back downstairs. Lucian then tried again to draw the mana particles toward him, this time with his eyes open. The mana followed his will, yet when he followed the flow in the instructions to activate the spell, nothing happened. The mana particles circulated inside his body and then seeped out as if nothing happened. Why? Confused, Lucian scratched his head with both hands in annoyance. He then tried again, only to fail once more. Taking a deep breath, Lucian proceeded to cast most of the spells he learned and tried to compare the flow of mana with that of Anna's summoning spell. The flow between the two was fundamentally different. The spells in the magical book seemed to make the mana particles follow a pattern that spread across his entire body before Lucian had to circulate it to his hands or another body part that would act as a medium for him to cast the spell. When it came to the orthodox spells from the rogues and the council, the entire process was focused on drawing mana to their hearts, which effectively strengthened them before they used the incantation and appropriate hand gestures to cast the spell. The main difference was that the spells he was familiar with forced Lucian to gather mana in certain areas of his entire body, while the orthodox spells focused on the heart only. Maybe it's because of this? Lucian wondered. He was about to try Anna's spell one more time to study the changes in mana when the butler fairy suddenly appeared by his side. Lucian raised his brows in surprise and asked subconsciously, Do you want some more cookies? The fairy lowered its head and replied, Please be mindful of your stature, my lord. Do not dabble in the inferior methods of the mortals. Huh? Lucian's eyes widened in shock as the fairy's sweet voice surprised him. Wait, wait, wait. What do you mean inferior methods? And what lord? And mortals? I think you are missing something. The fairy retained its poker face and replied, You are the old lord's successor and last in the family line. So you are the lord. Grandpa? Lucian asked. He already knew that his old pop was not a normal mage, but he never quite understood just how much. The fairy simply nodded and took a step back. Wait, what do you know about Grandpa? And what did mean when you said, mortals? The implications of that is. The butler fairy lowered its head and replied, It is exactly as I said, my lord. You should not lower his stature and use the inferior methods of the lower races. Confused, Lucian answered hesitantly. But I am human as well? The butler fairy slowly raised its head and glanced at Lucian with its sharp gray eyes before it spoke in a slow, sweet tone. Please do not lump yourself in the same category as the mortals, my lord. Lucian fell silent at the butler fairy's reply. He wavered for a few seconds before he asked again. Then what am I? The butler fairy raised its head, its eyes locked with Lucian's, and for a second it looked as if the fairy saw something it shouldn't. It quickly lowered its gaze and answered. I am afraid I don't have the right to answer that, my lord. Huh. What does that mean? Why not? The fairy remained silent with its head lowered. Lucian frowned, his mind still in turmoil as he ordered. You said I'm your lord. Then, in that case, I order you to tell me, what am I? The butler fairy gave him a deep bow and answered. I apologize, but I cannot go against the old lord's order. My grandpa again? He didn't want you to tell me? But why? Lucian lowered his gaze and mumbled. By the time he raised his head, the fairy was already gone. Lucian slumped back on the chair behind the counter, with countless thoughts swirling through his mind. 
It was not an everyday occurrence where a magical butler fairy shakes your whole worldview and tells you that you are not a human being. Moon jumped over to his lap and meowed, causing him to start scratching her back deep in thought. But I feel... human? It can't be, right? Confused, Lucian raised one hand close to his face and studied it. The small knife scar on his palm from when he tried to help his grandpa in the kitchen was still there. Lucian rubbed it with his thumb deep in thought as he tried to recall scenes from his past. He couldn't remember a single incident dent that could prove that he was not human, except for when he used that first spell and saw that terrifying creature in the abyss. A shiver ran down his spine as Lucian quickly shook his head and tried not to think about it. Just why did you not tell me anything, Grandpa? Chapter 38 Uninvited Guest The night darkened as the hours passed. Heavy rain spattered on the window outside the bookstore. The water on the road almost reached the door. The lights inside the bookstore were still on and emitted a warm light in the darkness. Mixed with the wooden shelves and books, it gave off a cozy atmosphere. Lucian, who was seated behind the counter, glanced at the cup of coffee placed in front of him. A pleasant aroma exuded from it. A sigh escaped his lips as he grabbed the cup and pulled a small chair using Immer next to the window before he sat down. His gaze was distant as he watched the night outside. The glass reflected his thin figure and messy dark hair. As the heat from the coffee subsided, he took a sip. The taste was as great as always. The fairy sure knew how to make coffee. The aroma lingered in his nose as he lowered the cup. Another sigh escaped his mouth. It was already past the time he usually went to bed, but Lucian was not in the mood to sleep yet. The fairy refused to show itself no matter how many times he called or ordered it. It only briefly appeared before him to place the cup of coffee on the counter and disappeared as fast as it came. Lucian's mind was still in turmoil as he took another sip. He didn't know how to feel, or what to feel for that matter. He didn't know if there was any truth to what the butler fairy told him either. Not a human. Shaking his head, Lucian leaned back on the shelf behind him and glanced at the ceiling. The sound of crystal raindrops falling was very soothing. He always loved the rain. Some people found such weather to be depressing, but he preferred it over bright sunny days. It was cozy. Closing his eyes, Lucian tightened his grip on the cup of coffee, the heat warming his cold hands. He stayed like that for a few seconds, unmoving when a sudden flash of lightning illuminated the bookstore. He opened his eyes just in time as the thunder rumbled in the sky. The rain intensified outside with no people in sight. Using Immer, Lucian turned off the light, plunging the bookstore into darkness. Another flash of lightning brightened the world, followed by the boom of thunder. Lucian, however, remained unmoving. A part of him felt betrayed. It was like he never knew his grandfather, never knew the real him. With all the secrets he kept from him, just what was real and what was fake. What about his parents? Were they really dead? Then there was the question of why he never told him anything. Why did he wait until he died to leave that book behind? What's the point? What do you want me to do, Grandpa? Lucian mumbled in uncertainty. He took another sip of the warm coffee and rubbed his eyes. The feeling of drowsiness started to catch up with him. Shaking his head, Lucian lazily stood up and lowered the blinds before he made his way upstairs. Moon was already sleeping on the floor next to the bed. Lucian then quickly changed to his pajamas and brushed his teeth before he made his way to the bed. It did not take long after that for him to slip into the land of dreams. The pale butler fairy silently appeared by the side of the bed. It grabbed the empty cup of coffee Lucian placed by his nightstand and gave him a deep bow. Sweet dreams, my lord. It then silently disappeared. On another side of the city, inside an old abandoned house, a strange pale creature was facing two headless monsters. The creature's long, thin fingers caressed its bald head and gently scratched its two large goat horns before it adjusted the old Victorian suit it wore. I believe I told you to just scout the area, it said in a grave tone. Although the creature had no eyes, the headless monsters dared not look at it directly. They lowered themselves, and the first one replied. We couldn't help ourselves. The second monster continued after him. The Lord's aura was calling us. The horned monster took a deep breath and asked, And yet you say you didn't even see the Lord. 
Both of the headless monsters answered at the same time. No, this small guard, you say. How strong is it exactly? The creature asked again as it moved closer to the monsters. Its long fingers caressed their regrown limbs with its sharp nails drawing blood. The monsters did not react and instead remained steady. The creature then licked the blood clean off its nails. We were unable to move. Unable to resist. Strong. Very strong. The monsters responded one after the other, causing the creature to nod. I see. It looks like I'll have to head over there and check by myself. Especially if the Lord is there. The creature mumbled the last part under its breath as it struggled to contain its aura. The next day, Lucian woke up a little bit earlier. His mood was still not the best, so he decided to take a warm shower to clear his mind. After that, he made his way to the kitchen, only to find a lavish breakfast waiting for him. Moon seemed satisfied as it gnawed on a piece of meat by the table. Lucian subconsciously thanked the fairy and ate. After he finished, he changed his clothes into a jogging outfit and threw on a jacket before he left. As soon as he did, the butler fairy appeared by the door. It glanced out of the window at Lucian's departing figure before a sigh escaped its mouth. I hope you are right about this, my lord. Saying that the fairy turned around and glanced at Moon who was sitting on top of the counter. We will be having some uninvited guests soon. Go and keep an eye on the lord. Moon meowed and licked its paw with no intention of going. The fairy shook its head and continued. You know I'm the one making your food, right? Hearing the word food, Moon's eyes lit up as it quickly hopped off the counter and ran out. The fairy snapped its finger causing the door to open, sending Moon off. It then snapped its fingers again closing it. Now, let's see who dares to disrespect the Lord's orders. Chapter 39 The Call Walking through the streets of Holden, Lucian's mind was full of various thoughts. He barely registered where his feet were taking him. He wasn't a big fan of walking or running in the mornings, but he had to do something to clear his mind. Few people walked the streets this early in the morning, only the occasional car passing by. Lucian began to subconsciously hum a happy tune. The floating mana danced about around him in a captivating display of soft lights. Lucian continued until he reached a corner coffee shop. He stopped before it and hesitated for a couple of seconds before he ultimately made his way inside to have some breakfast. Outside of the coffee shop, Moon was sitting on top of a bench across the street. She licked her paws and kept her gaze on Lucian. Back at the bookstore, the bishop monster teleported abruptly outside of the door. It turns out Ned its head around as if it could see before it turned to face the door. A couple of passers-by passed by the monster, but did not seem to notice his presence at all. Once the street cleared out, the door to the bookstore silently opened. A wide smile extended across the bishop monster's face as he made his way inside. The door closed behind him. Unnatural darkness swirled within the bookstore, making it impossible to make out the shapes of anything. As soon as the monster took a step forward, a pale figure flashed by aiming for its neck. The bishop took a step back and lowered its head, using its horns to block the sneak attack. The sound of metal meeting metal resounded throughout the bookstore as both the fairy and the monster took a step back. Why did you come here, Vex? The fairy asked in a frosty tone. Sharp white claws extended from its hands as it faced the monster. So it is you. Is that the way to greet an old friend, Tamalot? Tamalot raised her claws and replied, I'll only ask you once, why did you come? To see the Lord, of course. Vex opened his hands, his mouth curved upwards into a wide smile as his terrifying aura surged. The Lord's aura is all over the place. I can see you trying to manipulate it against me, but it seems like you are forgetting something. Vex's smile dropped as his figure blurred. He made his move aiming for Tamalalt's head with his horns. The fairy used her claws to block the strike, but the momentum of the attack sent her back a few steps. I was born from tallest. The Lord fed me with his aura. Vex spoke in a loud fanatical tone. He is the only one that can suppress me with his aura alone. A sigh escaped from Tamalalt's lips as she shook her head. You were ordered to stay away, yet here you are. You disobeyed a direct order, and for that, I'll have your head. Hmph, you're free to try. The duo turned into a blur, both using their bodies to attack each other, almost as if they were in some sort of agreement. 
Their clash resounded throughout the darkness, but it was not enough to dispel it. The shockwaves from their battle were nothing but tiny ripples in the endless darkness. The fight raged on as drops of blood fell to the ground, dyeing it red. Both figures stepped back and faced each other. The fairy's butler suit was ruined by a long, nasty gash to her side. The monster bishop was no better. It held the side of its face with one hand in an attempt to stop the bleeding. You know that we can't kill each other, Tamalalt. What's the point? Leave, Vex. If you still value your pitiful life, then you'd best leave. The Lord won't be as merciful. Vex Aura surged in reply before he spoke. Dying by the Lord's hands would be an honor. Clicking her tongue, Tamalalt mumbled in annoyance. Crazy bastard. After he finished his breakfast, Lucian decided to make his way to the park. The weather was not as bad as it was yesterday, but it was still cloudy. He pulled his jacket closer to his neck and continued with his stroll when suddenly, a faraway voice called out to him. Lord of Tallest, Lord of Taffet. The voice died out as soon as it began. Lucian paused abruptly and turned around in shock, only to find no one. He was alone on the street. What? He muttered with a frown. Scratching his head, Lucian scanned the mana particles for any sign of disturbance, but found none. The voice that called out to him was gone as well as if it was cut by something or someone. What the hell was that? Lucian mumbled again. His frown deepened. Am I going crazy? Lucian hesitantly resumed his walk with his eyes constantly scanning his surroundings. A part of him treated the voice as some sort of hallucination. He had a lot on his mind after all. Another part, however, knew what he heard. It sounded like someone trying to reach out to him, specifically. Lucian didn't know how he knew that. His eyes continued to dart about as he turned his direction to the bookstore, Lord of Tallest. The voice called out again. This time it was cut off as soon as it began. It was enough, however, to confirm Lucian's suspicions. Someone was calling out to him. His heart hammered against his chest as he continued to glance behind him. He quickly picked up his pace and soon enough was running through the streets. What the hell is going on? Lord of Tallest, Lord of Taffet, Lord of the Ancients. The chant continued before it was cut again. Lucian, however, did not stop. He was sprinting through the streets. Lord of Tallest, Lord of Taffet, Lord of the Ancients. The call continued to echo in his mind, this time sounding as if multiple people were speaking at the same time. It hammered on Lucian's mind, making him stop and clench his head in pain. His knees buckled as he fell to the ground with a thud. Stop it, please. Lord of Tallest, Lord of Taffet, Lord of the Ancients. Stop. I said shut up, damn it. He roared out, causing the voices to disappear. A few passers-by glanced at Lucian with a weird look on their faces and avoided him. With his hands still clutching his head in pain, Lucian struggled to continue to the bookstore. Chapter 40. Confrontation. Lucian did not know how he made it back. The last minutes of his walk was a blur. It was as if someone else took the reins over his body, and he could do nothing but watch. He continued slipping in and out of consciousness until he found himself standing in front of the door. Although the voices in his head had quieted down, the feeling of loss and ache they brought remained. Lucian rummaged through his pockets for his keys when the door opened abruptly. Lucian paused for a second and glanced at the entrance. His mind was still hazy as he stepped inside. Familiar, comfortable darkness embraced him. Lucian quickly felt the pressure alleviation. Still, he did not quite feel like himself yet. It was as if something or someone was intervening with his thought process. The notion of that made him feel sick to his stomach, yet the foreign presence forced him to calm down. His legs did not listen to him as he navigated through the abyssal darkness when two figures appeared before him. One was the familiar butler fairy, and the second was an unknown eerie bald monster, with no eyes and a pair of goat horns that extended to the back of his head. The duo turned their attention toward him in shock. The butler fairy quickly fell to its knees. A tinge of confusion flashed through Lucian's mind as he saw the fairy behave this respectfully. It would usually just disappear after giving him a bow. Dazed, Lucian glanced at the unknown monster who remained on its feet. Am I lord? The monster called out in a fanatic tone. 
A wave of annoyance and anger overtook Lucian's senses. Why is he on his feet? He should kneel. 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 The voices returned. Only this time they were not human. They sounded as if thousands of people roaring at the same time. Lucian's frown returned as he clutched his head with one hand trying to make the voices stop. The monster, oblivious to his struggles, seemed ecstatic as it took a step closer to him. Lucian struggled to keep his emotions at bay, but with the monster coming closer, all of his attempts failed as the foreign presence took control. His hands dropped to his side, and he raised his gaze to meet the monster. A dangerous red hue surrounded his eyes as Lucian's aura surged. The butler fairy lowered her head, even further not daring to meet his gaze. The horned monster finally seemed to sense that something was wrong, but by then it was already too late. Neil. Lucian's voice came off as a deep and human growl. The bishop monster's body froze as a massive pressure downed it to the ground. Its face was planted on the ground with a bang as a whimper escaped his mouth. Lucian still out of it walked closer. Each step he took was akin to a massive mountain hammering against the monster's heart. And my lord. Lucian did not let it continue. He used his right foot to stomp its head further into the ground, forming a dent in the darkness. Did I give you permission to speak? The monster whimpered in pain as a shadowy aura seeped out of Lucian's and surrounded it. A faint dark gray mist escaped the monster's body, turning his pale skin dry. You still dare struggle? Lucian growled, his face twisted into a terrifying scowl. The abyssal darkness that surrounded the entire space began to crack under his immense pressure. This caused the fairy to finally raise her gaze, a horrified expression plastered on her face. My lord, please calm your anger. She spoke in her usual calm and soothing tone. The shocked look, however, betrayed her calm demeanor. Hearing that, Lucian turned his head with a frown, his sharp scarlet eyes locked on the fairy, who quickly lowered her head and continued, The space will collapse if you don't rein your aura, my lord. Please ease your anger. Her voice seemed to work somewhat as the frown on Lucian's face relaxed by a little before he asked, Tamalalt, did I give you permission to speak? The fairy lowered her head even further and spoke. You did not. Please punish me as you see fit, my lord, but kindly reconsider the space can hold on no longer. Hmm. Turning his gaze away from Tamalalt, Lucian glanced at the mummified monster by his feet and asked, What gave you the audacity to come here? The monster whimpered, unable to give off a proper reply. Clicking his tongue, Lucian used Immer to raise him to his eye level. His hand shot out and clasped his neck as he asked again, Speak, you vermin. The dark aura once again launched itself on the monster, making him throw his head back in pain. A G H. Mercy. Mercy, my lord. Mercy? You expect mercy when you come here and disrespect me? Your men need you. Please come back, my lord. If my life is enough to bring you back, then it's a cheap price to pay. Clicking his tongue in annoyance, Lucian squeezed his hands over the monster's neck and replied, Your voice is annoying me. Why are you shouting? I am sorry, and my lord. The dark aura that seeped inside the bishop suddenly surged out and returned to Lucian. He released the monster to the ground and turned to face Tamalalt. Take care of this trash. There's no point in keeping vermin that does not know its place. I don't want to dirty my hands any longer. Saying that Lucian gathered a ball of abyssal darkness above his palm and sent it to the fairy who raised her hands with a reverent look on her face. Lucian did not stay to see what happened. He turned around and walked away as the veil of darkness parted showing the scene of the untouched bookstore. Once he stepped out of it, the abyssal darkness closed behind him as if he had just walked out of a different world. A sigh escaped Lucian's mouth as he made his way to the second floor and fell on the bed headfirst. His mind, however, was still very much wide awake and in upheaval. He didn't know what just happened— who that monster was, hell, he wasn't even in control over his body. The entire situation made his heart threaten to leap out of his chest. He wanted to scream, he wanted to shout, he wanted to curse, but his body was too weak to move. He was barely able to wiggle his fingers. Chapter 41 The Change Waking up in the morning, Lucian's eyes were bloodshot. He did not feel well rested, if anything his body was killing him. 
The memories of what had happened the night before flashed through his mind, causing him to grind his teeth in anger. He clenched and unclenched his fist a couple of times, making sure that he fully regained control over his body. After that, Lucian stood up and made his way to the bathroom. He stood before the mirror, glaring at his reflection with a savage expression and roared. Come out, you F asterisk king bastard. Come out. He cried out as he banged on the sink with his fists. What the F asterisk CK do you want from me? What? Lucian's expression turned savage as he roared at his reflection. The feeling of helplessness he felt yesterday was one he did not want to experience ever again. To be trapped inside his own body was maddening. Forced to watch as a mere spectator. Who the F asterisk CK are you? His cries grew louder, and soon enough Lucian was unable to hold back his rage. His fists that banged on the sink turned to the mirror as he delivered one punch after another, cracking and destroying it, bloodying his hands in the process. What do you want from me? Lucian mumbled before he collapsed to the ground and covered his face with his bloody hands. He was scared. Ever since he took his first step inside this magical world, Lucian was in constant fear. He managed to suppress his emotions most of the time and deluded himself into thinking that everything would work itself out if he simply laid low and went with the flow. But what happened yesterday, the voices that banged on his head, the unknown presence that took over his body, all of that made him feel terrified. It made him feel insignificant as if he was nothing but a pawn in a much larger game. Lucian hated that. The fear of having his own body snatched from him seized his heart. He never wanted to experience it again. For the first time since he started learning magic, Lucian wished he was stronger. He wished he was strong enough to uncover the mysteries that his grandpa left behind. He wished he was stronger so that he wouldn't have been concerned about any families or council. He wished he was stronger to protect himself. Tears fell from his eyes into his hands as Lucian felt the hopelessness of his situation. Outside of the bathroom, Moon wanted to rush inside and comfort him, but was blocked by Tamalalt. Leave him. The Lord needs to understand what he is getting himself involved with. Moon bared her teeth at the ferry before she rushed toward the bathroom. Before she could reach the door, however, a wave of darkness swallowed both her and Tamalalt. Back inside, Lucian slowly forced himself up and removed his clothes. He tried to avoid the glass shards of the broken mirror and stepped inside the shower. The wave of cold water made him shiver as it took him a few seconds to adjust to it. He first cleaned his hands and washed away the tiny invisible shards of glass away before he stood there motionless with his eyes closed. By the time he closed the water and left the shower, the look on Lucian's face was no longer the same. Fix this, he ordered, motioning to the broken mirror. He knew that the fairy was listening, she always was after all. As you command, my lord. And as expected her reply came as soon as he spoke. Lucian didn't bother to reply and instead made his way back to his room. He quickly changed his clothes and used Immer to bring out the magical book his grandpa left him along with the spell that Ian had given him. Taking a deep breath, Lucian sat down by the window and opened the book to resume his search for the spell. Minutes turned into hours as coffee cups began to pile up on the desk. Lucian did not bother to open the bookstore for the day. No, he was determined to first find what he was searching for. He was too complacent before. His false reputation deluded him into thinking that he was safe, but not anymore. Noon quickly passed. A concerned moon jumped to his lap in an attempt to divert his attention. Lucian, with his cold gaze, however, continued flipping through the pages with one hand, the other he used to scratch Moon's back. He would occasionally stop when he came across an interesting spell and jot down the page number and spell details on his notebook before continuing with his search. By the time the clock pointed to 3 p.m., Tamalalt appeared by his side with a bow and spoke. My lord, please take some rest and eat first. Lucian waved her off and replied. Just make me something, please. Understood. Saying that the fairy disappeared along with the empty cups of coffee on the desk, leaving a frustrated Lucian behind. The book was too big, not to mention the unknown language used in it. He was still not proficient in deciphering the contents just yet. 
This slowed down his search significantly. His quest, however, was not in vain. The number of useful spells he came across was nothing to scoff at. It was safe to say that his harvest was fruitful. Still, Lucian was curious about Ian's spell the most. Something about it seemed to call out to him. A sigh escaped his mouth as he pushed the magical book and his notebook away. He lazily stretched his limbs and was about to stand up when the loud growl of his stomach made him pause. He had been too absorbed in his research that he forgot to eat anything. It was then that Tamalald appeared next to him with a tray of homemade meals. The fairy gently placed it on the desk before him and bowed. Enjoy, my lord, saying that the fairy stepped back and disappeared into the darkness. Not wanting to waste any time, Lucian used Immer to make the magical book and his notebook float before him as he wolfed down the food all the while keeping up with his search at the same time. Moon, who had jumped down from his lap, made her way to his bed and glanced at him with a disappointed expression on her face before she turned to glare at Tamalalt, who was standing in the corner of the room. It's necessary. Don't look at me like that. Chapter 42 New Spell and New Place Next, it's not here. A bloodshot Lucian mumbled to himself as he closed the old magical book. He leaned back in his chair and covered his face with his hands. A long sigh escaped his lips. After taking a deep breath, Lucian grabbed his phone from the counter and glanced at the time. 3 a.m. It's already this late. He released another exhausted sigh. His entire day was spent scouring through the ancient spell book in an attempt at locating Ian's spell. All of his work, however, turned out to be for naught. Lucian managed to find several interesting spells, some of which even looked similar to the one Ian showed him, but in the end, they were not the same. This confused him since he was sure the language was the same, and even the patterns were the same. Perhaps the spell itself was ripped from the book? That was the first thought that crossed his mind. One look at the ancient yellow paper, however, was enough to rebuke such thoughts. The pages of the old book were not of the same material, and although the language was the same, the writing had some slight differences. Lucian did not notice the difference at first, but the longer he read the book, the more familiar he grew with it. This made him think of another explanation. Perhaps his book was not the only one that contained such miraculous spells. That made more sense, after all, an ancient, powerful language. How could he be the only one to monopolize it? A yawn escaped from Lucian's mouth as he contemplated his findings. Tamalalt silently appeared by his side and gave him a deep bow before she spoke. My lord, perhaps it is time for you to get some rest? Lucian glanced at the butler fairy and shook his head. Just bring me another cup of coffee, please. As you wish, my lord. The fairy did not argue as silently disappeared. A few seconds later, she reappeared with a fragrant cup of coffee with a small dose of milk. Lucian mumbled a thank you as he opened the ancient book once more. A new idea flashed through his mind. As he was probing for Ian's spell, he came across a particularly interesting one. The spell's function was to open a temporary door to another realm. Lucian was first confused since, as far as he knew, that was not something mages should be able to do. After all, the council was dedicated to keeping an eye on the portals that opens across the world in case they were dangerous. The instructions for the spell were a bit more complicated than usual. He was even required to make a weird offering. Forcing himself to stand up, Lucian glanced at his phone. It was already 4 a.m. A yawn escaped his mouth as he made his way to the bathroom to get ready for bed. Once he was back, he changed into his pajamas and lay on his bed. He used Immer to pull his notebook and the ancient magic book towards him. There was a spell he wanted to try tonight. Target, Lucian mumbled the name of the spell. It allowed him to dive into the dreams of other people. He needed it since it was related to the sacrifice he required. Tamalalt, bring me two candles, please. The butler fairy did not dally. She instantly appeared and placed one candle on his right nightstand and another on his left before she gently lit them on. Have sweet dreams, my lord. Lucian nodded and replied. Thank you, good night. Saying that he glanced at the spell in his hands and memorized the flow of mana and incantation before he gently placed the book using Immer back on the desk by the window. After he made sure he was ready, 
Lucian closed his eyes and started to will the mana inside his body to follow the flow instructed in the book. A feeling of drowsiness began to overwhelm him, yet he forced himself to stay awake as he continued guiding the mana. After a couple of minutes when Lucian was no longer able to handle the sleepiness, he finally muttered the incantation and instantly fell asleep. His breathing turned deep as a relaxed expression hung on his face. The butler fairy appeared by his side with a satisfied expression on her face. She glanced at Moon, who was laying by the bed, and spoke. You see, he's already able to do this. It won't be long before the Lord understands everything. Moon, however, ignored her and left the room. Darkness. That was the sight that greeted Lucian when he opened his eyes. He knew that he was dreaming, but his mind was surprisingly clear. Did it work? He muttered to himself. It was then that the sky above lit up with countless brightly colored stars. It illuminated the land below, allowing Lucian to see his surroundings. He was standing on a vast dark sea as if it was solid ground. No signs of any other creature were seen in this strange world. I made it. A wide grin extended across his face as Lucian pumped his fist triumphantly. The spell was supposed to transport him to the land of dreams, which was the domain of the primordial dragons. Or so the book explained. According to what he understood, the land of dreams was connected to the land of the living and the land of the dead. When certain people had dreams of their loved ones that passed away, it was all because of this place. It connected both worlds and, in a sense, both influenced each other. Lucian decided to try this spell for two reasons. The first was to see if he could locate his grandpa's spirit. He still had so many questions to ask him, so many things to tell and share with him, and he missed him. The second was the offering he required for the plane traveling spell. He could only get it from here, the land of dreams. Closing his eyes, Lucian visualized a pair of massive black crow wings on his back. When he opened his eyes again, a strange but familiar feeling made him grin. He glanced at his back to see the pair of dark wings. Lucian attempted to control them, something that came surprisingly easy to him. Perhaps since it was a dream. After a few attempts, Lucian was up in the air and flying through the dream world. The sensation of the wind howling in his ears and the freedom he got from the experience were hard to explain. And although it was not the real world, for Lucian, the experience was as real as it could get. 